Hey there, fellow heroes and symbiote enthusiasts. Welcome back to the ultimate crossover you never knew you needed. It's What If Deku Was the Venom, the movie. I'm your host, Kronos, and before we dive into this mind bending scenario, big shout out to the amazing Raisin1125. Now, hit that like button, subscribe, and let's swing into action. No time to waste. Chapter 1 The year is 2200 and life on Earth is kind of like living in a comic book. The vast majority of the Earth's population have developed powers known as quirks. These special abilities lead to the rise of professional superheroes to combat of the increase in quirk-related criminal activity. The idea was to fight fire with fire, as the saying goes. Flash forward roughly 200 years, and you'll find that roughly 80% of the world's population actually have quirks now. Quirks are as much a part of human identity as your fingerprints and eye color, which makes the fact that I don't have a quirk all the more painful. For the longest time, all I wanted was to be a hero, like my idol All Might. But the doctor said I wasn't born with a quirk, making me part of the population of quirkless. This led my first friend, Bakugo, to become one of the greatest sources of torment in my life. I don't know what made Bakugo come to hate me so much, but I really have to thank him. Without him, I wouldn't have gotten my power. This is the story of how I became the successor to a relic of the first generation of heroes. This is the story of how we became the new symbol of peace. Is it ever possible for me to become someone like you? Izuka shouted at the symbol of peace, desperate for validation of the feelings he'd had ever since he was a boy. All might turn back to face Izuka at hearing this. Without a quirk, huh? Before he could go on, the symbol of peace locked up in pain beginning to transform back into his small mite form. Damn it, not right now, he thought desperately. For the longest time, I thought saving people was the coolest thing you could possibly do. My classmates think I'm a weakling, that I'm not good for anything. But that just makes me want to prove them wrong. Izuka continued on, unaware of the transformation happening in front of him. That's why, I want to be someone others can look up to. Just like you. Wait, where did this smoke come from? Dash. Came Izuka's scream of surprise, as most people would after witnessing the 7 feet 4 inches 500 powers of pure muscle that was the symbol of peace suddenly turned into a skeletal man with hair horns. X elsewhere X. A black goo floated around the soda bottle that served as its current prison. Oh yes. Going from a glass canister to a Dr. Pepper bottle. Clearly I'm moving up in life. The ooze thought sarcastically. I take solace in the fact Peter has been dead for 135 years. If only so he will never know about this. I'd never hear the end of it. The ooze then sighed and pondered the recent events. Damn that blonde guy. He interrupted the bonding with the kid. I sensed something in him. The potential to be like Peter was a true hero. All I was able to glean from the kid's head was his name was Izuka Midoriya, and he is really scared of a guy named Bakugo. I need to find him again. But how? The ooze pondered within his plastic prison. X back with Izuku and All Might. I'm sorry, kid. But without a quirk? It's impossible. These were not the words Izuku wanted to hear, least of all not from his idol. He felt his world crashing around him, and he started to hyperventilate. I know it's not what you wanted to hear, kid. It's okay to dream, as long as those dreams are realistic. All Might spoke softly, trying to soften the blow of his words. Izuku just nodded numbly, and walked to the staircase, dejectedly moving down to the ground floor. X with Venom. Okay, seriously. I have all of Peter's powers. But a plastic container is my damn kryptonite? What's next? A sentient Mountain Dew bottle that kills my one true love? The bitter and sarcastic thoughts of Symbiote became more and more annoyed by the minute. Wait a second. Are those voices? Man Bakugo. You sure were harsh on Midoriya. Didn't you guys used to be friends when you were younger? One boy spoke to the others. Bakugo? That's the punk that Midoriya was afraid of. He's my ticket back to the kid. If Venom had hands, he would surely be rubbing them delightedly. Now I just need to get free of this damn bottle WHOAA. His train of thought cut off by the kick that the punk-looking blonde gave the bottle he was trapped in. The impact knocked the cap loose, allowing Venom his freedom. That damn Deku. Always trying to make a fool out of me. 
thinks his quirkless ass can be a hero. He should just do what I said and jump off a building. Maybe his next like will give him a quirk. Bakugo laughed viciously, his lackeys chuckling nervously along with him, not wanting to earn his ire. Someone needs to teach him how the world really works. Why don't I show you how the world really works, Blondie? rang out a voice from his feet, confusing Bakugo and his friends, along with halting any further conversation. He moved to take a step forward, but his foot was stuck. He glanced down, only to see two pure white scara looking up at him. I like a skin suit with some fire. With Izuku. Izuku was shuffling along, walking with no real destination in mind. After all, having the number one here tell you that your dream is impossible would crush anyone. And for Izuku? This was just the straw that broke the camel's back. I guess maybe I should just go home. It's not like I have any friends to hang out with or reason to stay out. Izuku thought glumly. Suddenly, bumped into someone, which knocked him out of his thoughts. As he looked up to apologize, he noticed the crowd in front of him, and the smell of smoke permeating through the air. Is it a villain attack? Venom. It's a bit of a stretch, but making all this commotion is my best bet to draw out this kid. If he's as hero bonkers as I think he is, he'll rush in to save his friend. Regardless of his powers. Though, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to let the heroes think they destroyed me before I can talk to the kid. Regenerating my body is a pain, but it can't be helped. As long as I can slip my brain onto him, I can explain to him what I want. Venom thought to himself, glancing out at surrounding flames and destruction. You know. I may have gone a little overboard. No one has died yet though, thanks to these pros. Still, that kid needs to show up soon. The fight with the pros resumed in earnest. Ex Izuku Izuku had gleaned from the crowd that there was a hostage situation with a black monster villain, with a middle schooler being taken hostage. Wait a minute, isn't this where Kaken comes to hang out after school with his friends? Izuku thought in panic. He pushed his way through the crowd, trying to get to the front for a better view. The unease was palpable in the air, and as the heroes struggled to put a stop to the villain, the crowd's panic was beginning to grow. That's that's the monster that all might save me from earlier. Izuka thought in a panic. That means, this is my fault. All Might must have dropped it when I grabbed onto him. Whatever else Izuka was thinking, that all went out the window when he heard a shout come from the villain's stomach area. Let me go you goddamn monster! Bakugo's voice was more muffled than his usual outbursts but the explosions he tried to set off were definitely at their usual levels. Despite that, they had little effect on the villain. Fear rose up in Izuku, and before he could stop himself, a yell ripped through his throat. Kaken! Venom. God damn it, this kid's explosions are no joke. It's just bad luck for him that explosions are more of an annoyance to me than an actual threat. Venom thought with smug satisfaction. Though, I'm lucky he's trying brute force blasts rather than something like a flash-bang or napalm. Kaken! A throaty shout echoed through the street, somehow carrying over the chaos that had descended around the symbiote slash. Kaken? Only the kid ever called the Bakugo punk that, and that means I can make my move and quit stalling. Venom thought with barely restrained glee. Kid, if what I glimpsed in you was accurate, I can help you just like I helped Peter. The punk was struggling to get free, even though I made sure he had enough oxygen to stay alive. I felt him look towards the crowd, and that's when I heard it. Let him go! Ex Izuku and Venom. Izuku sprinted towards the monster, hellbent on saving his one time friend. We may not be friends anymore, Kaken, but I can't let you die. Let him go! The crowd and the surrounding heroes were shocked and unable to react. Unable to process that a young man was running towards a monster with seemingly no game plan. No, you idiot! What are you doing? One hero yelled at him, but he didn't care. He would show everyone. He would be a hero, even if it killed him. This kid. Showing me I made the right choice. It also seems like that All Might guy is nearby as well. Whatever, not my concern. Just need for some dramatics, and to put my brain on him. Venom thought, and then spoke. This is the end, kid. The creature turned to face him, ready to strike him. Take this. Izuki yelled at the creature and threw his backpack, striking the creature in the eye, staggering it. Izuku then frantically clawed at the creature's body, trying to free Bakugo. Unbeknownst to anyone except the symbiote, 
one of the blobs of ooze slithered into Azuka's pocket and onto his flesh, beginning the bonding process. Kid, that was damn reckless. I don't know what you were thinking, but I'm sending one of my officers to give you a ride home. A stern-looking officer spoke to Izuku, clearly unpleased with his actions. Izuku was let off with a warning and a stern talking to, before getting into the front with the officer. Izuku let out a dejected sigh. He acted as he thought a hero should. His body moved before he could stop to think about it. Isn't that what a hero does? Helps those in need, Izuku thought glumly. Indeed it is, young Midoriya. Izuka went ramrod straight in his seat and looked around frantically for the source of the voice. Something wrong, kid? The officer glanced at him out of the corner of his eye. Um, no, guess I'm still just a little traumatized from that event. Izuka stammered out an excuse to the officer. What was that? I am your partner now, Izuku. I'm speaking to you, via telepathy, for lack of a better explanation. Everything will be explained when we get home. But know that you are in no danger. I will prove this when we get home. We were partnered with the Spider-Man. We explain this in depth soon. Izuku was no longer freaking out, but he was still worried about having a voice in his head other than his. But he knew of Spider-Man. He was one of the first people to become a hero using their quirk. Why are you speaking to me? And what should I call you? He thought to himself, hoping the voice would hear him. We are Venom. And we are going to help you become a hero. Chapter 2 Izuku was drained. First, he had been yet again berated and bullied by Bakugo and his friends for daring to apply to UA. Then, he'd almost died, and in the aftermath of that situation, been told by the one person he idolized more than anyone else in the world that he could never be a hero without a quirk. Next, he rushed into a situation where Bakugo was being smothered to death by a ooze like monstrosity, in the hopes of saving his one time friend. After being saved and chastised by both the pros and the cops, he was driven home, only to discover he was going crazy on top of all the other stuff that happened today. Just my luck, huh? Izuka muttered to himself sadly. All I want is to be a hero. Yet I just seem to get rejected every time I try. The symbiote heard this, but chose not to speak to the boy until it could get him alone. And judging from the fact the police just pulled up Izuka's house, that talk was coming sooner than later. The cop grunted and pulled his keys from the ignition. All right, kid, this is where you live, right? At this, Izuku nodded and unbuckled his seat belt. He proceeded to exit the car and inhaled some of the cool night air outside his family's apartment complex. Maybe this is just how my life has to be. After walking him to his apartment, the cop knocked on his door and waited for his mother to open the door. The officer spoke with his mother and explained what had happened. His mother was understandably upset, and broke into hysterical tears in their apartment entryway, all the while squeezing the air out of his lungs, after latching onto him like an anaconda to its prey. Oh, Izuku, I'm so glad you're safe. His mother Inko wailed in her typical fashion. His mother was a very emotional individual, and tended to worry herself sick over his life. Raising him as a single mother led her to try to give him so much love that he'd never miss his father's absence. She was a kind soul and she tried her best to raise him into a fine young man. Izuka liked to think she did a fine job. I'm fine, mom. Don't worry. The only thing I need right now is a shower. I have goo in places I'd rather not think about. He spoke softly to reassure her worries. He knew his mother would worry no matter what he did, but he could at least help her see he wasn't harmed, physically anyway. Emotionally hurt though, that is a whole other issue. Izuka thought bitterly. As he walked through his apartment, the symbiote looked through Izuka's eyes and took in its surroundings. It noted the similarities to Peter's place back when they lived with his aunt. It seemed Izuka was in a similar situation, albeit seemingly a little more well-off than his first partner was. It saw Izuka step into his shower, and figured this was a good time to discuss with him its proposition. Young Midoriya, we wish to talk more with you regarding our offer to make you a hero. Izuka jumped at the voice in his head, almost slipped, and busting it in the shower. Who said that? Izuka shouted in alarm, seeing no one else in the bathroom with him. Young Midoriya, do not be alarmed. And we can hear your thoughts, so no need to shout. WW what are you? Why are you in my head? Izuka thought back frantically. We are what is known as a symbiote. We are the last of our kind. 
We came from a distant planet, and we eventually came into contact with a man known as Peter Parker. You know him as the arachnid hero, Spider-Man. We are why his second suit was black instead of red and blue like the original. However, when we bonded with him, he inevitably left an imprint of all his powers within us, which we have enhanced to a degree. Take, for example, his arachnid strength relative to a human. He could life ten tons without us. With us, he could life twenty. We made him better, but it never went to his head, and he instead remained the ideal hero until he died some forty years later of old age. We offer you his powers, as well as his fighting style. To make you the hero that we sense you wish to be. You knew Spider-Man? He was America's first recognized superhero. So you're saying you are the reason he inexplicably changed his suit six months after his debut? But wait, then why? Why help me? Wouldn't you be better offering your powers to someone like Bakugo? And what exactly is a symbiote? What happened to the others? And how did you even find me in the first place? Izuka questioned rapidly, and unsure of the whole situation. He sat down in his shower, letting the warm water crash over his frame. After Peter's death, we were left partnerless. As symbiotes, we need a partner in order to truly thrive. As such, we went into hibernation, figuring we would eventually die since it was unlikely we would ever find a partner of Peter's character. While our bond is symbiotic in nature, there are some minor side effects to be aware of, and anyone not able to handle them would likely go insane. This is why we did not seek out a new partner. At some point during our slumber, we were discovered by a researcher, who brought us to his lab here in Japan. We remained in his care until we were fused with one his assistance in an accident. Due to him not being able to truly handle our powers, he went crazy and attacked your city. At this, the voice paused for a moment, knowing it was better to deceive Izuku a little rather than explain the engineered but contained chaos that was started to reunite them following their initial bonding attempt. We broke off at some point during the fight and became bonded to you. We did not fight the bonding at all, as we saw the type of man you are, young Izuka Midoriya. You remind of Peter, with your intelligence and sense of justice. This is why we desire to help you become a hero, and offer you our full powers. I can become a hero? But wait, what are these side effects you mentioned? Izuka pondered to the symbiote. After bonding with us, particularly when you are using us, you may experience enhanced aggression and anger. While we do not anticipate this being an issue with you in most situations, we feel the need to be upfront with you. It is an easy issue to overcome, if you make a conscious effort to combat it. The others are nothing too serious, just that you would share our natural weaknesses to fire and sonic waves. They disrupt our shifting abilities, and the cellular bonds needed to maintain our connection with you for our powers. So you can't control me? You won't try to make me do bad things? No, young Midoriya. We cannot directly influence any of your actions, nor do we have a desire to. Anything you do while using our powers will be of your own volition. We are a tool, a partner, no different from a quirk. We just happen to possess a degree of sentience. So what powers would I have? Due to our time with the hero Spider-Man, we possess all of the abilities he held. Enhanced senses, rapid reflexive nerve pathways, arachnid strength relative to a human, limited shape-shifting capacity and camouflage, essentially a bulletproof hide when using us, and Peter's most important power, his spider sense. This is a danger sense, and will help you be more aware of your surrounds. If you let us, we can bind this ability to yourself, allowing you to use it outside of when we are merged. This, this is everything I've ever wanted. I can finally be a hero, Izuka thought in joy. He only became aware that he was still in the shower due to the water becoming increasingly cold and the fact he almost slipped and busted his face again. Peace, young Midoriya. We realize you are excited. However, you cannot just use our powers. Unlike his instinctual fighting ability, we have to train you and your body to handle the powers, due to the nature of the moves. That's fine. I won't disappoint you wait I don't even know your name. Izuka thought back to his new partner and friend. You can call us Venom. Now get some rest, young Midoriya. Your training starts tomorrow. X. The following morning, Izuka finds himself at the trash-filled beach of Dagoba. While he wasn't sure why he was told to come here by Venom, it assured him that it had method for its madness. So, uh, Mr. Venom, why are we at this beach turned garbage dump exactly? 
Izuku asked nervously. He took in the sight of piles of waste just sitting on what surely were once beautiful sandy dunes. You don't have to call us Mr. Young Izuku. We are your partner. We know you wish to enter Yue, but we do not think that is the best course for you. You do not need a bunch of former pros telling you why you can or can't do something because you aren't licensed. You may not know this, but Peter became a fully-fledged hero at your age, while he was still in school. His quirk manifested at fifteen, and made him arrogant. This all changed when his uncle was killed in a situation that Peter felt he could have prevented. This, along with the words of wisdom given to him by his uncle, made Peter decide that he would never again use his powers selfishly, and instead use them to help his fellow human beings. What were these words of wisdom, Venom? Izuku asked curiously. With great power, there must also come great responsibility. These words are what made Peter into the legendary hero he would eventually become. That, and our enhancements of his natural powers. Izuku's sweat dropped a bit at the mildly arrogant statement made by his partner but nevertheless pressed on. So what do you think I should do? He asked curiously. We think you should go to non-hero academy. We know you wanted UA because of All Might, but we also know you no longer wish to go there because of his hurtful words. We will help you become a hero, taking our lessons from Peter's forty years as an active hero. The teachers at UA couldn't hope to teach you how to use us, especially not better than we could. Your new school semester starts in ten months, young Midoriya. During those ten months, we plan to complete your education from a hero standpoint and fully train you in your powers. You will truly be a successor worthy of Peter. So where do I begin? And how are you going to make me a fully trained hero in just ten months? Izuka was truly curious. He was excited though, and as he looked out at the dirty beach, he felt a sense of pure, unadulterated hope that he hadn't felt before. This is possible due to a combination of memory sharing, and the fact we are going to push you to your limits in training. We cannot promise you will be able to use all our powers without our suit, but you should notice an enhanced healing factor and strength post-training. As for Peter's fighting style, we can't give you the memories of it until you train your body and increase your flexibility. As such, you're going to aim to clean up this beach in seven months. Wah 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 what? Chapter 3 My, What Big Teeth You Have Izuku yawned as he walked to his new school in the early April morning, the cool air and morning dew still shimmering on the glass of buildings as he walked by them. As he walked on, he thought about what today meant for him as a person, and would serve as his final exam from the symbiote. Relax, young Izuku. You are ready. You have been ready for this for the past three months. Your training is complete. And today, you will push past your repressed anger and move on. Albeit in a very cathartic manner. Thank you, Venom. Your encouragement is appreciated. But this, this is pretty much everything I've ever strove to do, besides being a hero itself. What if I'm not good enough? What if he's better? Izuka thought back worriedly to his partner. While the past months of training had done wonders for Izuka's physical fitness and sense of style, he still suffered from his stutter and confidence issues. A few months of validation and encouragement cannot undo years of psychological harm and relentless abuse for something out of your control, after all. But Izuka was on the track to recovery. And this would settle the grudge. If you lose, you lose. There is no shame in defeat, so long as you come back twice as strong, young Izuku. Peter wasn't perfect as a hero and for every five people he saved, there was one that he didn't. Did this sadden him? Absolutely. Did it stop him? No. This will be your first test, and despite your self-doubt, you can do this. You know where he'll be after school. It's time to show him who you really are. Asterisk eight hours later asterisk. Izuka sat outside the gate of Yue, waiting for his target. He was plainly visible, and bided his time. Soon enough, he saw Bakugo walking alone towards him, coming from the direction of the UA gates. Deku! Bakugo growled out. The hell are you doing here, you worthless nerd? Izuka felt a shiver of fear, but shook it off. He was far from helpless now, and he would be damned if he didn't prove that to Bakugo today, one way or another. I dash! Izuka began with a stutter, but composed himself, and continued uninhibited. I came to settle things between us. To show you I'm not the same kid you bullied mercilessly. So I came to challenge you to a fight. You. Fight me? Don't make me laugh. I'd kill you in a second. Bakugo laughed harshly, 
clearly not taking this seriously. So prove it. Follow me and put me in my place then, Kabakugo. This got Bakugo's attention. Izuku had never addressed him by anything other than Kaken before. He stopped to actually look at Izuku. He was definitely taller and bigger than before. He scoffed. Like some muscles and height would make a difference. Still, Bakugo's fatal flaw was his pride, and Izuku had walked all over it with his new confidence. Fine then, but don't come crying to me when I blow an arm off of you. Bakugo growled out irritably. Follow me. Izuku spoke briefly, then began to lead Bakugo to the spot he had in mind, an abandoned construction site where they could fight uninhibited. The walk to the site was filled with uneasy silence, with tension in the air so thick you could cut it with a butter knife. The night itself was cool, and filled with the typical noises that one finds with city life. One after one, they passed streetlights and city blocks, until, when the tension was built to its highest crescendo, they arrived. Izuku turned to face Bakugo, narrowing his eyes at him in the process. This is the spot, Bakugo. Here, no one can get hurt besides us. He spoke tonelessly, anticipation filling him to the core. His partner remained silent, as it knew this was something Izuku needed to grow. Until he confronted, and overcame his subconscious anger at Bakugo, he would never be able to move on with his life. You honestly thinking you can hurt me really pisses me off, Deku. Bakugo was barely restraining himself at this point. Go ahead and do whatever you need to get ready, because I'm going to blast you into tiny little pieces. Izuka said nothing, but grinned. This unnerved Bakugo, which he would never admit aloud. Izuka's clothes began to ripple, and from underneath came a black ooze-like substance that slowly meshed over his clothes. One by one, his limbs were fitted with a mystery substance, until the only part left untouched was his head, still grinning like the Cheshire Cat. W what the fuck is that, Deku? What the fuck is going on? Bakugo shouted, unsure of what he was seeing in front of him. This? Izuku spoke calming as the ooze began to encircle his face. This is our quirk. The transformation was complete now, and Izuku now stood head to toe covered in a sleek black-looking suit, with two lenses where his eyes would be. A symbol of a spider emblazoned proudly on his chest, its legs wrapping out his torso, merging on his back. His mask-slash-helmet, Bakugo couldn't be sure which it was considered, had its own version of that manic grin that Izuku sported before his transformation. I hope you're ready, Bakugo, because we aren't going to hold back. The creature where Izuku stood then lunged at Bakugo, hand drawn back in preparation to strike him. Bakugo used his explosions to push himself backwards to gain some breathing room. He then blasted himself towards Izuku and tackled him into a nearby support beam. This barely phased Izuku who then brought his fists down onto Bakugo's back, albeit with less force than he should have used. This still caused Bakugo to release his grip and knocking some breath out of Bakugo's lungs. Izuku dropped his guard for a moment, before his spider sense went haywire, and Bakugo detonated his left hand in his face in a point-blank explosion. This rocketed Izuku away from Bakugo and into pile of wood, granting him a moment of reprieve. You need to stop holding back, Izuku. I know you think he's still that kid you were friends with, but he's legitimately trying to kill you right now, and you need to deal with that. Asterisk, I asterisk, you're right, Venom. He's changed, and I have to accept that. Izuka stood straighter and looked at Bakugo sadly. This damn loser. He's actually pushing me. Bakugo thought angrily, getting to his feet, explosion going off in his palms. All right, you damn nerd. I'm done screwing around. I don't know how the hell you got a quirk like this, but I'm gonna destroy it and you. He placed the palms of hands together and aimed them toward wood pile Izuka was currently in and secreted as much nitroglycerin as he could. One way or another, this was going to end now. Now die! Bakugo roared as he detonated his secretions, a huge explosion ripping towards Izuku. Izuku saw the huge blast coming towards him and shot a tendril out of his wrist, pulling himself out of harm's way. He then directed his swing so he rammed his shoulder into Bakugo, and sent them both into the ground. Bakugo growled. You think this makes you better than me? That you somehow got a quirk? This quirk is as worthless as you are. Something in Izuka snapped when he heard this. He roared then began to punch Bakugo in the face, again and again, screaming all the while. Not so fun when you're the weak one, is it Kakin? Izuka yelled, bringing his left fist down on Bakugo's nose 
which then gave a sickening crunch as it broke, causing Bakugo to howl in pain. How does it feel when you're the one who can't defend himself? Bakugo was close to blacking out at this point. The hits just kept coming down upon him. Is Venom good enough to be your friend now, you piece of shit? Years of repressed anger and resentment bubbled up from Izuka's mind, fueled on by the suit's aggression amplification. By this point, Bakugo was unconscious, his face puffy from the trauma and his nose was bleeding profusely. He had a deep gash above his right eye. Suddenly, sirens filled the night air, and flashing lights bore down on Izuku. Freeze! Don't move! Izuka looked towards the flashing lights to see two officers with guns trained on him. And just like that, the red fog he'd been under lifted, the reality of the situation splashing him like a bucket of ice-cold water. Izuku, you have to get out of here. You can't get caught. Your face is covered, you can move away a few blocks and the suit can recede, allowing you to walk home uninterrupted, but you have to act now before either more cops or more heroes show up. This wasn't heroic venom. I let my anger control me, and I seriously hurt Bakugo. Trust me kid, you didn't give him anything that punk didn't have coming. Now move! Izuku shot a tendril from his right arm up to one of the support beams, and quickly shot up into the night sky. As he let his body web sling on autopilot, he could only think to himself. I beat Kaken, but at what costs? Bakugo awoke to a bright light and gave a groan of pain, his face feeling like it was hit by a garbage truck. He brought a hand to his face, only wince in pain at the sensation. The nurse that was charting in his room gasped at his movement and rushed to get the doctor. A middle-aged nondescript-looking man wearing a lab coat walked into his room with a clipboard. He was followed by a harrowed-looking police officer, no doubt there to take his statement on what happened. Mr. Bakugo, we have some questions about what happened to you. Were you attacked by a villain? Nod or shake your head if you can't talk. The officer spoke to him while the doctor checked his pupils with a flashlight no doubt checking for a concussion that he definitely had. That damn Deku. He got the better of me. Called himself Venom, did he? I bet he planned to be a hero with that quirk of his. Well, I'll nip that in the bud really quickly. Bakugo thought to himself angrily, before speaking. I was attacked while walking with someone I went to school with. He didn't have a quirk, so I told him to take off while I lead the villain away from crowded areas. I don't know where he went, and I doubt he knows anything. He ran off when the villain jumped down in front of us. Anyway, the villain and I engaged, with me using the biggest explosions I could use, because he just shrugged off anything else I threw at him. Plus I figured the noise would attract attention, specifically from the cops or nearby heroes. That was smart thinking, Mr. Bakugo. Since you're technically not allowed to use your quirk publicly. But since you're a student of UA, I think we can let it slide since you were responsible in using it. Thank you, sir. One more thing. The villain referred to himself as Venom. X. A few days later. Izuku stood numbly, looking at a news report on a TV in a store window. The ticker line showed thus. Local UA student attacked by a new villain called Venom. The news anchor went on and talked about the still shot they'd obtained from a police dash cam. It showed his reflective mask lenses glaring at the screen, his mask still grinning manically. He was so engrossed in the attack on his character, and the realization that his dreams were now much harder, that he didn't hear the girlish voice address him. In fact, he was oblivious right up until something poked him in the cheek. Hey there freckles, why the long face? Chapter 4 This alien can't be this cute. Hey there freckles. Why the long face? A girl's voice spoke to Izuka after poking him in the face with a slender finger. As he turned and looked at the person who just poked him, he had a number of thoughts. 1. This girl looks like an alien. He felt a wave of annoyance from his partner at that. 2. She was a very cute-looking alien. 3. She was very close to his face, concern evident in her eyes. She had pink skin, which was not too unheard of, as odd skin tonalities were more and more common these days. Much like himself, she had fluffy hair, although hers was pink. She had two little horns sticking out of her tufts of hair. Her eyes had black scara and yellow irises. And she was wearing a UA Hero Course uniform. As fun as this is to watch, you're kind of mumbling and you are definitely staring, and I think she's becoming more concerned by that. Oh. I am sorry. I'm fine. Izuka practically shouted at the girl, 
startling her at his sudden outburst. Her brow crinkled in confusion before shrugging. It's okay, dude. Don't worry about it. So anyway, if you don't mind me asking, what's got you down? The girl spoke to him in a placating manner. Whether she was speaking from genuine concern or nosiness was unclear at this stage. Ah, sorry, I never got your name. Wouldn't that be important to know before I bombard you with problems? Izuka questioned, curious about the odd girl in front of him. A sheepish look appeared on her face, and proceeded to bonk herself on the head. Duh. Sorry about that. My name's Mina. Mina Ishido. Nice to meet you, Freckles. The girl spoke in a proud and excited tone. Nice to meet you too, Mina. My name is Izuka Midoriya. Izuka somehow managed to keep the stutters out. Progress. Mina gave him a beaming smile, and made a hand gesture that he should continue. Aya. The person that was attacked by this guy Venom. I actually used to be friends with him. At hearing this, Mina's eyes widened. Obakugo? He's actually in my class at UA. Wow, you were friends with that asshole? I got partnered up with him in a team exercise and all he did was yell and rage at me. He even called me an extra. At this, her eyes narrowed. You're not a jerk too, are you? Izuka frantically waved his hands in front of him and tried to say he wasn't, before Mina suddenly burst into laughter. I'm just messing with you, dude. Seriously, you looked like a kicked puppy when I saw you, so I had to check on you. A kicked puppy? Izuka questioned, obviously confused by the comparison. Yeah. Adorable and super sad. At this, Izuka's face went beet red. This was probably the first time a girl had called him cute. It definitely didn't happen in middle school. Bakugo made sure of that. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Izuka mumbled out, clearly unsure of how to handle a situation like this. You never answered my question, Izuku. At least not fully. She definitely wanted to know what was bothering him. I guess I'm upset that I've never heard about this Venom guy before. Quirks are kind of my passion, and the thought of one slipping my notice bothers me. He spoke calmly, trying not to give his actually feelings on the matter away. Wow, you sound like a quirk researcher or something. That's super cool. Mina was nothing if not an enthusiastic conversation partner. A researcher? No, it's nothing like that. I just, I just really like quirks. They're so cool, and each one is unique. Izuka spoke truthfully and passionately. That's so cool that you have a productive hobby. I just play video games and read manga. Well, that and destroy people in breakdancing. At saying this, she made a peace sign and winked at him. This flustered Izuku, as this girl was more forward than anyone else he'd ever come across before, besides Bakugo. But unlike Bakugo, Mina seemed like kind person, the kind that was nice to everyone. You like to breakdance? Izuka asked quietly, unsure if he'd heard her correctly. Yeah, dude. It's so much fun. I'm not exactly the smartest person around, but I'm genius at breakdancing. She grinned at him, and soon Izuka found himself smiling too. Her cheer was just too infectious to ignore. She treated him like they were friends her whole life. I'll have to show you sometime. I think that'd be nice, Mina. So you go to UA? Does that mean you want to be a strong hero someday? Izuka inquired genuinely curious of her intentions at one of the most prestigious hero schools in Japan. Hmm. She nodded before continuing. I've wanted to be a hero since I was little. The alien queen. I'm sure you noticed that I sort of look like an alien, albeit much cuter than Ridley Scott's. Izuka couldn't quite vocalize his agreement that she was indeed much cuter than aliens. He thought he heard his partner mutter something about alien stereotypes. Anyway, so yeah, my quirk lets me secrete acid from the palms of my hands and feet, so I figured I could be a decent hero with it. And that's pretty much the story. She smiled so brightly, her pearly white teeth flashing at him. That's such a cool quirk, Mina. You could help free people after natural disasters and accidents. Not to mention the combat applicability of your quirk. Mina blushed at the praise, clearly not used to hearing things like this. She knew her quirk wasn't nearly as flashy as her appearance but she was hellbent on being a hero, naysayers be damned. Thanks, Suzuku. Say, do you want to get something to eat? I don't want to cut our conversation short, but I haven't eaten since breakfast because of my combat practical today. Mina sheepishly asked, 
not wanting to pressure her new friend into something he wasn't comfortable with. I do like that, Mina. Great. I've got just the place in mind. They walked through the city district, chatting as they went. They talked about everything and nothing. They passed each building, until they'd finally arrived at this little cafe called Le Blanc Coffee. As they walked in, Izuka was overwhelmed by the fragrance of fresh coffee, and was that curry he smelled? He took a moment to look around the shop. The store had some rather catchy jazz music playing softly in the background. On the wall to their right was a picture of a woman holding a baby, painted in watercolor. To the left, there were a series of booths that went to the back of the store, running parallel to the counter. Izuka could see a flight of stairs at the back, next to a small kitchen. A TV hung from the wall beside the counter. Behind the counter, there had to be no less than fifty different jars of coffee beans, each one labeled differently. In front of the jars was a rather cool-looking middle-aged man. He had black hair, which was slicked back. He wore a pink-collared shirt, jeans, and a black and gray apron. He had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, and wry grin on his face. His name tag read Sojiro. Ah, uh, it's you, Ashido. Welcome back. You want the usual? He had a deep voice, and a very suave demeanor. You know it, Gramps? I could eat a cow. At this, the man got a tick mark on his forehead, clearly not enjoying the jab at his age. Izuka thought he heard the man mutter something about disrespectful brats. Yeah, yeah? Coming right up. Just take a seat somewhere. I assume your timid-looking friend here wants the same? Ah, yeah, yes, please. Izuka stuttered out, clearly not wanting to upset the man further. He followed Mina to a booth near the back, taking a seat on the side closest to the door. She beamed up at him. So welcome to my secret base. She then leaned over conspiratorially and whispered. You can't tell anyone. Otherwise I'd have to kill you. She made finger guns after saying this. Izuka was rather unsure of how to take this, a bead of sweat building up on his forehead. D don't worry, Mina. Your secret is safe with me. Izuka reassured her seriously. This caused her to break out in laughter, holding her sides as guffawed. Man, you're so gullible. It's seriously freaking cute. Again, Izuka went beat red at this. He wasn't sure if she was just having a laugh at him, or she genuinely thought he was cute. Thankfully, he didn't have to find out, as Sojiro chose that exact moment to bring them their food and coffee. He set the plates in front of them before speaking. Here you go, kids. Since it's your first time, kid, I preemptively accept your praise that this is the best damn curry you've ever had. Izuka's sweat dropped at this, unsure if the man was arrogant or just that confident in his cooking. Mina just grinned back at the man, already knowing the answer to his unspoken question. Izuka looked at the curry for the first time. It read, and had a few pieces of tofu in it. A side of rice was arranged neatly to the left of the curry, and bit of scrambled eggs along with it. As he looked up to ask Mina a question, he suddenly became aware of how intently both she and Sojiro were staring at him, as if anxiously awaiting his reaction to the food. He shook his head and decided to indulge them. He took a bite, before his eyes widened to the size of saucers. This, this is greatest curry ever made. He practically shouted in his head. Can you keep it down? There's no need to ever shout in your head. Most people don't have the voices in her you do. Sorry. Wait, voices, as in plural? We are kidding with you, young Midoriya. Now speak, otherwise I fear young Ashido might explode from anticipation. Mina Sojiro. This is single greatest curry I've ever had no, in the world. Sojiro just shrugged at this, clearly not surprised in the least. Of course it is, kid. I made it after all. Anyway, enjoy your stay. Just shout if you need anything. As he walked away, Mina smiled softly at him. I'm glad you like the food, Izuku. You're actually the first person I've brought here. It's kind of out of the way of most people's way home, but my parents brought me here a lot as a kid, so it's a special place to me. She stopped for a moment, as if taking a trip down memory lane. Anyways, tell me about yourself, Izuku. I know your cork bonkers, but I don't really know much else about you. What's your cork like? Izuku froze at this and then stiffened even further at her last question. Obviously, he couldn't just say, Oh hey, that scary-looking villain Venom? Yeah, that's me. What's up? I used to be a huge fan of All Might, 
but after I spoke with him, I kind of started to idolize him less. But I do owe All Might for making me want to be a hero in the first place. Up until a few months ago, I actually thought I was quirkless, and I was terrified I wasn't going to become a hero. But my quirk actually manifested then, and now I have a private tutor for heroics, since I didn't want to go to UA anymore. These statements got Mina's attention, as she wondered why he didn't already attend the city's most prestigious school, if he was interested in heroics, as he implied. You thought you were quirkless? Is that why you chose not to go to UA? Partially. The other reason was I wanted to avoid two people. If it's not too nosy of me, can I ask who they were? It's fine. I really didn't want to see Bakugo or All Might. I heard Bakugo got accepted into UA when I was applying to schools, and when I found out All Might was teaching there, I just thought it would be too painful for me to be there. Izuku spoke in a melancholy manner, realizing he was more upset at the two of them than he had thought initially. But why did you not want to see them? At this, Izuku sighed. He didn't really want to tell her, but he also didn't want to be rude. Bakugo, he and I used to be friends. At least until he developed his quirk. Then he became my number one bully. Izuku's grip on his drink tightened. At least until a soft, pink hand was placed on top of his. Hey, Izuku. You don't have to share this if you don't want to. It clearly bothers you. And no, it's fine. It's actually nice having someone to talk things out with. Definitely not something I'm used to. He laughed nervously, but Mina didn't. Instead, she actually frowned at this but withheld any comments she might have had. For now, anyways. As for All Might, well, I spoke to him once, and asked him if it was possible for someone without a quirk to be a hero. He told me that it wasn't. That's why I didn't want to see him. I mean, yeah, I have a quirk now. But I was in a low place when he told me that, and while I know he meant well, it sort of stained the admiration I had for the guy. Mina's frown deepened, but she became confused when Azuka began to smile softly. But I have to say, if he hadn't told me that, I wouldn't have discovered my quirk or the inspiration I derived from it. What do you mean, Izuku? What is your quirk? And who was this inspiration? My inspiration was the arachnid hero Spider-Man. Because my quirk is very similar to his. But I don't like to use it a lot because I'm not licensed yet. Not quite the truth, but enough of it to be genuine. He just neglected to mention he didn't really care about being licensed at all. I don't think I've heard of him. Is he new on the scene or something? Her brows knit in confusion, her fingers drummed on the table. Izuka laughed at this. And no, the opposite actually. He was one of the first heroes ever, and was the sixth to surface in America. He was known for being a street-level hero, never being too big to help out the little guy. No matter how popular he got, he never lost sight of his code. Izuka had a soft smile on his face at this point, as he thought of his predecessor. Mina couldn't help but notice that his smile looked nice on him. What was his code? She asked him curiously. That with great power, there must also come great responsibility. These were some of the last words he heard from the man he respected the most, and he took them to heart. Mina was moved by these words, and she too saw the merit in the code. I think that's a great code of morals to have, Izuku. It sounds like he was a great man. He was one of the best. Mina realized she'd be so wrapped in her attention that she'd been hanging on his every word. She coughed into her hand and tried to shake it off. So does that mean you have spider-like powers as well? Because I have to tell you, dude, spiders are pretty creepy. I mean, she isn't wrong. Even Peter hated spiders to a degree. Which is pretty ironic given he made a label out of their image. Izuku's sweat dropped at the comments of both Mina and Venom. Sure, arachnids weren't his favorite, but surely they weren't that bad, were they? You don't want me to answer that. Ah, uh, Izuku? Izuku became aware of her waving her hand in front of his eyes. You okay? You kind of spaced out there for a second. Why yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, my powers are similar to a spider's. It's hard to explain them, though. Maybe you can show me sometime then? If it's not too much trouble, that is. This got Izuka's attention. He wanted to immediately say not, at least until he could correct his reputation as a hero. But he looked at Mina, his rejection caught in his mouth. I guess I could show you sometime, Mina. It'll have to wait, though. I have a lot of school work to do this week. 
At hearing this, the color drained from Mina's face. Oh crap! I just remembered that Mr. Aizawa wanted an essay from us on foreign heroes by Friday. She waved her arms around in panic. What am I gonna do, Izuku? You um, I could help you if you wanted, Izuku said quietly. This halted Mina's freak out. Really? You'd do that, dude? I mean, I won't do your work for you, but I'll provide any information you need. Is it an informal essay? Yeah, it's just on someone we think is cool. Hey, maybe I can do it on Spider-Man. This brought a small smile to Izuka's lips. That'd be cool, Mina. After they had chatted a bit more and paid their bill, Izuka walked Mina to her train station. They arrived at her terminal, and Mina stopped and turned to face Izuku. Well, this is my stop. Aya, yeah, I'm enjoyed out hanging out today, Mina. It was nice to talk about heroes and stuff with someone else. Izuku spoke truthfully, having truly enjoyed their time together. Well, who said it had to a one-time thing? Here, give me your phone. She held her hand out expectantly to Izuku, and he eventually handed her his phone. A few rapid finger movements and on-screen button presses later, he had her phone number. She pressed the call button and saved his number in hers. He idly noted she labeled him as Spider Freckles. He wasn't sure how to take that. See? Now we can chat anytime we want, Freckles. She shifted from one foot to the other. We should do this again soon. I don't generally get to spend time with cute boys that tried to help me be a better hero. She called him cute again, and was she flirting with him? He really didn't know how to handle this. Ah, hey, uh, it's not trouble, Mina. I enjoyed our time as well. Well, since you agreed to help me with my essay, how about we meet up again tomorrow? She asked suddenly, catching Izuku off guard. You, um, well, we could if you want. Great. It's a date then. Later, Freckles. And with that, she walked off to her gate, bouncing from foot to foot. A date? Izuku screamed internally. Ha! Huh. Chapter 5 Bird is the Word. So basically, Spider-Man was seen as an outcast until the government formally recognized superhero as a profession. Mina asked curiously, clearly not knowing much about the story of one of the first to use their powers for good. She coughed a few times, but Izuku didn't bring it up, figuring she just drank her tea too quickly. That's right. People were still scared about the advent of quirks, and they didn't know what this meant for society as a whole. But it was thanks to the actions of heroes like Spider-Man that reassured the worries of the people. Spider-Man was actually the first superhero to be honored by a country leader. Izuka pulled up a picture of Spider-Man shaking hands with then-U.S. President George Sears. As you can see in this picture, President Sears awarded Spider-Man the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian award in the United States, for his actions in search and rescue in the aftermath of a hurricane. Spider-Man left his home city in the hands of his wife, Felicia Hardy, who was the super thief turned superhero, Black Cat, while he himself went to into South Carolina's affect areas, and helped with clearing rubble and getting people out of collapsed homes. This was what made Spider-Man into America's most legendary hero, and solidified the public opinion that quirks were a force for good. Izuka finished his speech, taking a sip of his drink. Mina and himself were currently sitting in LeBlanc, and he was assisting her in writing her paper. Just as she'd said, she had chosen Peter Parker for her figure. She had told him her teacher was very surprised she knew who Spider-Man was, but had told her, As long as it's in by Friday, I don't care. So, Izuku. Mina began. Is this a date? Izuku shot Ramrod straight at this. Mina pressed on, oblivious. She coughed again, but pressed on. It's cool if it isn't, and I know what I said yesterday, but my mom said something when I told her my plans for today. She said have fun with your date. I know I'm probably overthinking it, since we haven't known each other long, but I honestly wouldn't mind if it was, you know? Meanwhile, in Izuka's head. Dot oh my god. What is happening? Izuka was definitely handling this well. I believe this attractive girl was asking for clarification of your intentions. Which you probably should respond to. That's easy for you to say. You're an amorphous blob. You don't have dating problems. A sexy amorphous blob, to be precise. And hey, have you seen pictures of Peter's wife? The only reason he landed got a ring on that was because I helped. Hang on, tell her this. As Izuka listened to his partner, he went red in the face, 
before composing himself. He coughed once, and then looked at Mina and spoke. Only a fool would say no to a date with you, a pinky. He started so smooth, yet ended so lamely. Mina went red, and then started laughing. Ah ha 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 pinky. I love it. Honestly, Izuku, how can you be cool and dorky in the same sentence? I guess I'll just have to stick around and find out. At this, she smiled warmly at him, sending butterflies or some other bug into his stomach. Not quite the execution I had in mind, but I can't argue with the results, kid. As stick around? By this point, any hip factor Izuku had was clocked out for the day. Well, yeah? You're fun, Izuku. And you're a pretty cool guy. She reassured him. Besides, you're cute, which is a perk. Again, Izuku went red in the face, and barely able to formulate coherent thought, let alone sentences. Hmm, it's getting pretty late. Plus, I'm basically done with the paper anyway. Wanna walk me to my station? She observed, and then questioned almost, shyly. As sure, Mina, I'd like that. Izuka smiled, and he paid their bill. After they walked out of LeBlanc, they headed to the station. When they arrived, Mina turned to face him. Thanks for helping me, Izuku. I really appreciated it. And I had fun, which I honestly never thought I'd say about schoolwork. Mina once again smiled brightly at him, conveying a nice summary of her bubbly personality in those pearly whites. Oh, like I said, Mina, it was no trouble at all, OF. He was cut off from saying more when she hugged him suddenly, causing borderline nuclear meltdown in his head. Ha! Huh. Adsk fasf jajfef were Izuku's extremely coherent words back to his partner. Was, was it okay for me to hug you, Izuku? Mina sounded unsure at the moment, as if she was worried she'd gone too far with her gratitude. And no. Izuku got out, before he breathed, then continued. It was fine. I enjoyed it, actually. I just don't get many hugs from people other than my mom. Especially girls. Technically, your mom I a girl. Oh wow, I sound like Sigmund Freud. Never mind. Forget I said that. Izuka pointedly ignored his partner's comments. Instead, he focused on Mina. She smiled at him again, before letting go of him. Ah, uh, sorry. I tend to just get overwhelmed with my feelings that I just kind of hug people sometimes. I did mean it, though. Izuku opened his mouth to respond, but was cut off by the PA system. Attention, the last train bound for East Mustafa City is departing shortly. Please make your way to the boarding area. Mina jumped at this, realizing she was about to miss her train. Oh crap. If I miss the train again, I'll have to call my brother. And he'll just make fun of me the whole way back. She sprinted off, but not before turning around to face him one more time and yelling. Bye, Izuku. I'll text you. Izuku just sort of waved lamely, unsure of what else to do in this situation. She likes you. The next day. Izuku was walking around Mustafa City, with no real destination in mind. He was actually trying to patrol the city, but when he remembered his alter ego was technically wanted for beating the crap out his childhood bully, he realized that might not be the greatest idea. It was actually why he'd skipped school today because heroism is more important than a sitting in a class for hours at a time. Plus, he knew he didn't have any tests today. So instead, he is just walking around, hoping to stumble across a mugging or something. Suddenly, his phone beeps to signal he got a text message. He pulls his phone out to see a message from Alien Queen. Alien Queen, hey Freckles. I stayed home from school because I'm sick but now I'm super bored. You should totally ditch class and hang with me, three. Izuka read her message, and figured since he wasn't doing anything anyway, he might as well spend the day with Mina. Spider Freckles, sure thing, where are meeting up? Alien Queen, I'm actually near the train station in Midtown now. I can wait for you if you want. Spider Freckles, sounds good, be there soon. Izuka closed his phone, and looked for a nearby alleyway. He needed to practice using his powers for movement anyway. Okay. As long as I don't fully transform, I should be okay, he muttered to himself. He coated his hands and feet in his symbiote, and climbed up the alley wall. Once he got to the roof, he formed a half-mask around his nose and mouth allowing him to tap into his partner's reflexive enhancements, and took off running across the rooftops. He quickly came to a ledge that was too far out to jump without assistance, 
so he ran and used the tendril to zip him to the other rooftop. Once landed, he took off again, and kept running until he found himself near where Mina said she was waiting. He climbed down the wall of another alley, and then let his partner recede. Walking out of the alley, he saw Mina sitting at a bench. She looked a little under the weather, but that didn't stop her face from lighting up when she saw him. Hey, Freckles. You got here quick. Were you nearby when I called? She asked innocently. He began to sweat a bit. You, uh, yeah, something like that. How convenient. Anyways, apparently I missed out on some super hush-hush training exercise at school today. Layaim. It sounded like fun when my friend Tura told me about it. Though I guess she's busy, because I haven't heard anything else from her. That was a couple hours ago, actually. I'm sorry you didn't get to go, Mina. Eh, don't sweat it too much, Freckles. There will be other trips where I show how awesome I am. She gave a victory sign as she said this, before grabbing his hand and dragging him off into the station. So what do you want to do since we're both being delinquents and skipping class? Izuka thought about this for a moment, although her holding his hand definitely slowed his thinking a bit. I was thinking we could go for a walk on the edge of town near the woods. I thought the clean air of nature might help your illness a bit. Ah. Uh, Look at you being all cute and thoughtful. Izuka said nothing, but his red face spoke volumes for him. Man, Izuka, you weren't kidding when you said the air here was clean. I feel my sinuses and stuff clearing up already. Mina spoke in wonder as she looked around the forested area. Yeah, I thought it might. Say, Mina, can I ask you something? You just did, but you can also ask another question, too. She spoke with a teasing grin. I was wondering how being sick affects your quirk. Oh, is that all? Sheesh, I thought you were gonna ask me something super personal like what color my underwear is today. She waved him off. And Mina? No. Eh, anyway, I was curious. Um, it sort of depends. I have a fever so the sweat sort of clogs my pores and affects my ability to adjust the acidity of my secretions. But other than that, most sickness doesn't really impact my quirk too much. Oh, that's really interesting, actually. Although I guess you probably wouldn't find yourself in a situation where you needed to use your power if you were sick, since heroes have sick days. And mm mm hey wait a minute, do you hear that, Izuku? She stopped in their walk, as a whistling noise became increasingly louder and louder. She looked up at the sky to see the cause, and she spotted a dot that was growing bigger and bigger by the second. Izuku spotted it too but he could help but notice his spider sense was beginning to pull at him. He didn't know why, the only reason it would is if. Mina! We need to move, my sense just went off which means that thing's heading towards us. He grabbed her hand and quickly moved them about thirty feet away until his sense slowly dulled down. But he noticed it hadn't faded completely. He was about to say something when something crashed immediately where they had just been standing. As they approached the crater, they saw what looked like a horror movie monster. It looked like a person, but its skin was charcoal black, like it had been charred by a fire of some sorts. It was extremely muscular, and had several angry red scars scattered across its body. It wore some shorts with knee pads that resembled skulls. And the most horrific feature it had was its head. It had a bird-like beak, but the facts its brain was exposed somehow made the creature all the more terrifying. Mina moved a little closer to check its pulse, when Izuka's spider sense went haywire. Mina look out dash, but it was too late. The creature suddenly grabbed her by the throat and stood up onto its feet. It looked around the clearing before its unintelligent eyes landed on Izuku. Kid, this is bad. We have to get her free. Otherwise, it could break her neck. And she's too sick to help herself. We don't have a choice. We have to use our full powers. Needing no further convincing, Izuku's form shifted into that of Venom's, the sleek body suit forming as quickly as it was able. His mask forming seconds later, the white scara of his mask narrowed menacingly. We would appreciate it if you put down our friend. The creature gave no visible response, but its teeth clicked a few times, blood running from a few of them. So you're injured then. Normally we wouldn't fight an injured, whatever the hell you are, but you're trying to hurt our friend. At this, Izuku shot a tendril into a tree behind the creature and zipped into it ramming his shoulder into its solar plexus, forcing it to drop Mina in the process. She crawled weakly to another nearby tree and faced the fight, her eyes widening in recognition of the masked figure that freed her from the monstrosity. 
Venom? Izuka gave no indication he heard her, too focused on evading the flailing fists of whatever the hell this thing was. This thing looks like the bastard child of Solomon Grundy and Big Bird. Now is not the time for quips, symbiote. Venom growled through gritted teeth, hands locked with the monsters. It then lifted him up and threw him into a tree, shattering it into splinters. Gra! Damn that hurt! Venom coughed out as he stood up once again to face the creature. This thing is stronger than us, which says something since our limit is twenty tons. We can't brute force it, because it shrugs off blunt force trauma. Venom took a moment to observe the creature. The fact its brain was exposed meant that could be exploited. It didn't seem to have any thought capacity, reacting on blind instinct. All right, creature. Let's see how you handle this. Venom rushed the creature, using his spider sense to dodge its swipes and subtly maneuver near a tree. Right hook, left hook, it kept swing at him, missing each time. When it had gotten close enough to the tree, Venom suddenly shot his arms and body forward, tackling it into the base of the tree, before shooting two web tendrils to the other side, and then jumping back, wrapping them around the creature and tying it to the tree. The creature struggled against the webbing, trying to break it. However, the tree was ripping in half from the force of the monster's strength and struggle against its bonds. Crap! How the hell are we supposed to put this creature down? Venom ground out in annoyance. We're going to have to bludgeon its brain. We know that it might cause brain damage, but this thing has to be put down somehow. Fine, but we won't kill it. At this, Venom rushed back towards the monster, hitting in its beak repeatedly, until it brought it down and headbutt Venom with the force of a rhino. Dazed, Venom was unable to stop the creature from ramming its shoulder into him and knocking them both to the ground. Venom kicked the creature off of himself, and then used his right arm to wrap a tendril around the creature, and his left to pull them towards a boulder. Before they made impact, Venom tied the left and right strands together and kicked off the creature midair, in an acrobatic maneuver many gymnasts would be jealous of, before kicked off the ground towards the rock that held the monster. Venom pressed his knees to its shoulders and began to beat the creature mercilessly on its brain case, until the creature lost consciousness. Venom slumped back and fell to the ground, his mask receding into his suit. He took several deep breaths, realizing he'd crack a few ribs in his fight with the monster. Suddenly, police sirens filled the air, and Izuka realized he once again had to make a run for it. He was about to look for Mina when he was suddenly helped to his feet. Go before they find you. I'll tell them you saved me. Mina looked at him with concern evident in her oddly colored eyes. Thank you. She then kissed his cheek and gently nudged him to make his escape. We will talk later though, Freckles. Izuka gulped and nodded before zipping away through the trees until he was sure he was safe. Mina watched him go and thought only one thing as he disappeared. Freckles is venom? A few hours later, Mina and Izuka stood watching the city lights from a perch on a rooftop. As the twinkling lights came and went, the silence between them grew. Finally, it was Izuku who broke it. We are Venom, he said simply, as if that wasn't a hot-button topic of debate right now. He was at worst a villain, though besides his assault on Bakugo, she didn't know of any crimes he'd committed, and at best, a vigilante. Well, no duh, Freckles, she said exasperatedly. Though I gotta admit, that suit doesn't leave much to the imagination. Wouldn't have pegged you as a show-off. She continued with a teasing grin. Izuka looked at her aghast at what he'd just heard, but then he realized she wasn't running away in terror. Instead, she was eyeing him with respect. And something else he couldn't place. I can. Not now. I would have told you, Mina. I just didn't want to scare you off so quickly after meeting you. Izuka spoke lamely, finding the clump of grass next to his feet highly interesting. Dude, you realize you're considered a villain, right? Yes. But are you? No. Then that's good enough for me, she said, causing Izuka to look up. Their eyes met yet again, and she closed some of the distance between them. Izuku, you saved my life today. Now granted, while you could argue it's your fault we were there in the first place. She gave him a teasing grin, as he sputtered indignantly. You also unveiled a huge secret in order to protect me. That makes you a hero. My hero. She took his hand in hers and brought him to the railing. She didn't let go of it, though. Izuku, when you look at this city, what do you see? Ah, uh, I see a place worth protecting. 
for more than just the financial gain of doing so. Exactly. You do what's right, not because it pays well, but because you genuinely want to help people. She closed the distance even more. That's what I like about you. And then, she kissed him. A few weeks later. Izuka sat on the couch in his mother's living room, watching the news covering of the UA Sports Festival. Mina had done okay in the first event, and had earned a spot in the finals based on her performance in the second. While they were setting up the third event, he texted her that he was so happy for her, and he was excited to see her perform. She replied a minute later, If I win, can we kiss again, winky face? This caused him to drop his phone in shock. Before he could reply, the news cut to a special on Venom. In other news, the villain turned vigilante known as Venom reportedly saved a local UA student from a creature that was involved in the USJ attack a few weeks ago, leading many to question his status as a villain. Other actions by Venom include saving numerous people from muggings, as well as stopping a few small robberies. While the Superhero Ethics Committee and the police denounce his actions as unsafe and unethical, one officer had this to say. What Venom is doing sounds great on paper, but he's also a lone wolf, meaning he doesn't answer to anyone. While he's not getting paid, that also means the only thing he answers to is himself. That's a dangerous place to be. We now go live to one of our field reporters, who is interviewing citizens on their thoughts on Venom. The image shifts to a reporter standing beside a man with a disfigured face, his nose missing. He had dreadlocks, a red scarf, and a rather pointy chin. Sir, you said that you support what Venom does. Why is this? Venom is a true hero, much like All Might. He does his work not because it is profitable, but because it is the righteous path. He is not like these gaudy pretenders who are no different than mercenaries enforcing the law for financial gain. Venom, if you are hearing this, I want you to know that I, too, will carry on this path. The man stopped speaking and walked away, causing the news to shift its feed back to the studio. Fascinating stuff there. It appears we took more time than we though, and now we have moved on to the second find of the UA Sports Festival Finals. We have a Hitoshi Shinso vs. Nito Minoma. As Izuku watched the fight, he heard how Shinso talked about his quirk, and how everyone saw it as villainous. He's like me, he thought, eyes glued to the television. Minoma kept rushing him, trying to touch him for some reason that the announcers hadn't seen fit to explain. Shinsu's quirk was called brainwashing, and apparently allowed him to control people based on responses to his questions. However, the fight was over when Shiso made a comment about Class 1A being superior, causing Minoma to freak out and scream about how overrated they are. This led him to become brainwashed, and Shinso made him cartwheel out of the ring. Indeed. The boy is a kindred spirit. I think we should seek him out. While having Ishido as an ally will undoubtedly be helpful, by helping Shiso, you add a versatile quirk into your group's arsenal. So we're a group now? Not quite. But if you're anything like Peter, which you definitely are, you're going to end up with a team of heroes. And kid, trust me. You want that guy in your corner. I understand. We can approach him soon. Chapter 6. Brainwashed and Conditioned Izuku had spent the past week observing Hitoshi Shinso and trying to learn his schedule. Venom insisted it would be good practice for when he had to tail criminals, as well as sharpen his situational awareness. He made sure he only kept his partial suit active, consisting of his facial half-mask, gloves, and his boots. This allowed him to traverse the rooftops and follow Shinso while remaining largely unnoticed. Currently, Shinso was walking with a girl with pink dreadlocks, who was fiddling with a helmet of some kind and pointing at Shinso. He asked her something, and she replied, before she stiffened and started dancing like a chicken for a moment, before she looked around, took the helmet off, and then began writing things in a notebook frantically. Izuku assumed she was creating some kind of helmet that suppressed Shinsu's powers, but had failed. Shiso laughed a bit, patted her on the shoulder, and then walked away. He kept on walking until he walked into a dark alleyway, which led Izuku to suspect something was up. Shinso then looked in his direction and called out, You can come out now! You've been following me for about a week now, so why don't you come down and talk me, instead of stalking me? Crap, how did he notice us? Izuka wondered frantically. Given the nature of his quirk, he's got to be extremely observant and aware of his surroundings. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to use his quirk as effectively. 
This just proves to me he's the right choice for our group. Izuka sighed, and then dropped down in front of Shinso, carefully ensuring Shinso was the one closest to the mouth of the alley, to subtly hint that he wasn't here to hurt him. Izuka then pulled out a sketch pad and a pen. Well, that answers a couple questions I had, namely whether you were here to hurt me and whether you had knowledge of my quirk. Interesting. Shinso commented dryly, making an effort to seem bored with the interaction. Izuku nodded, and quickly wrote down and turned the pad towards Shinso. I'm not here to hurt you. Shinso raised an eyebrow at this. I figured, otherwise you'd be a pretty shitty assassin, seeing as you gave me the quick escape route. Izuka sighed, and once again wrote out his response. I realized this could be taken as a hostile approach, but I wasn't sure how else to get in touch with you. Shinso tilted his head to the side, before speaking again. So if you aren't here to hurt me, then what are you here to do then? Here comes the hard part, kid. You have to convince him that joining you will help him be a hero. Izuka bit his lip, pondering what exactly to say. If we speak to you verbally, can we trust you to not use your quirk? That's risky, kid. Very risky. But it might be the push you need to build his trust. Whatever Shinso was expecting, that certainly wasn't it. He eyed Izuku, as if measuring his own response. You should know my quirk isn't completely under my conscious control. I can exert influence, sure, but anyone who talks to me has a minor risk for a degree of mind control. Most people can ignore the passive effects, though, unless they're exceptionally stupid. I doubt that'll be the case with you. So yes, I promise to play nice if you will. Izuka smiled at Shinso and extended a hand towards him. Izuka Midoriya. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, Hitoshi Shinso. Izuka Midoriya. Why do I feel like I've heard that name somewhere before? Shinso pondered aloud. Uh, did a pink girl with horns happen to yell my name in front of you? Shinso didn't activate his quirk, wanting to wait a bit. Ah, uh, that explains it. You guys friends or something? Dating, actually. Hey, nice. She seems energetic but kind. She is. But we can talk more about pleasantries after we jump to the reason why we're here. And why are we here, Izuku? Don't keep me in suspense. We wanted to recruit you. Now, Shinso activated his quirk, exerting control. Izuku shot up straight. Who are you really? Izuku Midoriya, age 16. We are the hero known as Venom. Izuku spoke in a monotone manner. Internally, he was freaking out and practically screaming. Venom, help. He has total control. I'm working on it, kid. Why did you really come here? We told you the truth. We wish to recruit you. And what are you trying to recruit me for, exactly? We dash. Izuku began to struggle now, cutting himself off in mid-speech. Turn yourself into the nearest police station. Don't hurt anyone on the way there, and don't use your powers to get there. Izuku started to step forward, before he fell to the ground, convulsing. Shinso saw this, and took a step back. We want to be heroes too! Shinso's eyes widened in shock, releasing his control during his lapse in concentration. Izuku rushed Shinso, and covered Shinso's mouth with his hand. Please just hear us out. If you still wish to turn us in, we will submit willingly. Izuka took a deep breath, knowing what he had to say. I was born corkless. I didn't know it for a while, until my best friend at the time manifested his, and well, I didn't. I wanted to believe so badly that I was just a late bloomer, that I slowly deluded myself into actually believing it. Life was rough. My best friend turned into my greatest source of torment, and my mother could barely keep from crying whenever I talked about being a hero to help support her. But through all this, I kept smiling, never letting my hope that I'd one day get a quirk fade. Izuku smiled wistfully, remembering his motivation and his mother's endless support. Then his expression darkened. That changed when the person I looked up to the most told me I was wasting my time. Shinsu's brow knitted in confusion, before nodding to Izuku. Izuku released him, and backed away, before sitting down. Shinsu mirrored him, sliding down the wall until he rested on the ground. Who was the person you admired? At this, Izuka sighed a bit, but nevertheless answered, All Might. Shinsu's jaw dropped a bit, clearly not expecting that. Okay, now I'm definitely interested in you, Izuku. Tell me more. I know what it's like to be an underdog. As he said this, he smiled wryly, 
looking up at the sky forlornly. Yeah, I can imagine so. I don't want to assume too much, but I'm guessing people tell you how villainous your quirk is a lot? Izuku questioned carefully. Shinso laughed bitterly. Yeah, you could say that. My friends in middle school stopped talking to me because of the nature of my quirk. They were worried I'd make them do something humiliating if they pissed me off. At this, Shinso shook his head, sighing at the clearly unpleasant memories. Eventually, I guess I just sort of came to hate my quirk a bit. You can't. Your quirk is perfect for hero work. Shinso immediately locked eyes with Izuku, clearly skeptical. Oh yeah? How am I gonna use this? At this, he pointed to his vocal cords. For the betterment of people? Riot dispersal for one. Hostage negotiation is another situation you could perfectly handle. Talking a guy off a ledge. Sometimes, Hitoshi, a hero doesn't have to use flashy quirks to make a difference. Sometimes it's their words that have the most impact. With your quirk, I see big things from you. I think you can be a great hero. And if you'd like, we can show the world that the quirks don't define the hero. Our character does. Izuku smiled genuinely at Shiso, who was overwhelmed by the kindness of the words. Everything Izuku had said were things he had desperately wanted to believe about his own quirk, but was unable to do to his own insecurities. The only other person, excluding his parents, who had ever thought his quirk was cool was handsome, And as well-meaning as she, she made one feel like a bit of a laboratory guinea pig. He could almost hear her maniacal cackling from here, which made him shudder. So what do you say, Hitoshi? Izuku once again asked. I think you can count on me, Izuku. Hitoshi stuck a hand out for Izuku to shake. Izuku glanced down for a second, before smiling and extending his own, a partnership sealed in that very moment. X. So, Izuku, you said you're dating Mina Ishido, correct? Hitoshi asked in his usual drawl. Ah, uh, that's right. Izuku glanced at him, but kept walking towards the secret base. So, uh, would you happen to have any advice on asking a girl out then? There's someone I'm interested in, but I don't really know how to broach the topic with her. This wouldn't happen to be about that girl with the pink dreadlocks, would it? Uh, yeah? Her name is Hatsum. And despite her eyeballing me like a mad scientist 60% of the time, she's good company. They were nearing LeBlanc at this point, which Izuku had sort of commandeered from Mina as his own super-secret base. Well, not super secret, because it was a public cafe. But it definitely had an espionage feel to it. We're almost there. Mina is meeting us there, and I want to discuss some aspects of this team we're forming. You mentioned that you want to form a team. To what end? I want to maximize the amount of people I can save. And to do that, I need a team with a diverse range of quirks. But I don't see myself as a leader. Rather, I want this to be a group of peers each one standing equally among ourselves. They weaved through the crowd, which was thicker than usual on a weekday. One the trains was down most likely, meaning more congestion as people walked to a different station. I see. After this, they switched to small talk, each talking about their dreams, and why they emulated heroes so greatly. Before long, they arrived at LeBlanc. As they walked in, a pink blur slammed into Izuku. hi yi thai freckles Izuka's eyes went the size of dinner plates, and his face went damn near nuclear. Mina was hugging him tightly, sort of, nuzzling her cheek against his, like some sort of cat. M mina At hearing her name, she turned to look at him, before quickly pecking his cheek. I miss you. It's been a week since we've hung out. School has been kicking my ass. Freckles? At hearing a new voice, Mina turned her attention towards the guy who could have easily been Aizawa's long-lost son. She quickly turned Izuku around, and whispered conspiratorially, So is this the guy for that thing we talked about? Yes, that's Hitoshi Shinso. Izuku nodded. Excuse me. He looks kind of like my teacher. You realize I can hear you, right? Yeah, Mina, but he's a good guy. Is the Ignore Hitoshi show over yet? At this, he poked them in the should, an annoyed look on his face. They both turned back to him, rubbing the back of their necks sheepishly. Sorry, they said in unison. Anyway, Izuka glanced around before his eyes settled on their booth near the back of the cafe. Let's take a seat and get down to business. They each took a seat at the table after placing an order with Boss Sojiro, 
with Mina sitting next to Izuku, Shinso sitting opposite from them. Mina took Izuku's hand hers before she gave him a victorious grin and squeezed his hand. He blushed a bit, but said nothing. They waited to discuss their business until after they ate, during which Shinso had the typical LeBlanc curry reaction. He asked Sojiro the secret to the heavenly curry he made, which was pretty ballsy. Sojiro laughed and said his science buff friend turned the recipe into a chemical formula to maximize the impact of each ingredient. Hmm, if a scientifically prepared meal can't attract Hatsum's attention, I don't know what will. Hitoshi filed that information away for later use. He'd definitely try to ask Hatsum to come with him next time. Izuka glanced at both Mina and Shinso. Both nodded at him, while Mina also gave his hand a reassuring squeeze, prompting him to speak. I want to form a team with you guys. At this, both Mina and Shinso nodded, as they were aware of this. Still, it was better to be completely clear up front. However, given that my alter ego isn't exactly the most popular guy in the city right now, we'd essentially be vigilantes. At this, the others shrugged, not really expecting to be labeled any differently. Before you go on, Izuku, I want you to up front with the both of us. Both Izuku and Mina glanced at Hitoshi at this, unsure of what he was going to say. There was a reason you were labeled as a villain initially. Care to explain what led that to happen? Izuka sighed. He should have known this would come up, as it wasn't an unreasonable question. The UA student I fought was my childhood bully, Katsuki Bikudo. Mina gasped, and Hitoshi's eyes narrowed. Kaken, he used to be my friend, but when he found out I was quirkless, he saw it as his duty to beat any notion of being a hero that I had out of me. The idea seemed to offend him on a personal level. I tried not to let it get to me, but I eventually did once my quirk manifested. At the insistence of my teacher, I sought out Bakugo for a match. This was to serve as my final exam in my teacher's training, as well as a growing exercise for myself as a person. I lost control of myself, with the years of suppressed anger and resentment bubbling up when I had him at my mercy. I was about to drag him to a hospital, but that's when the cops showed up and they took the sight before them at face value. Bakugo probably did nothing to clear this up, as he clearly hates me, but would never acknowledge it was me who did that to him. I can only assume he heard our hero name in between the introductions my fist had with his face. Don't you think you went a little overboard? Hitoshi asked blandly. I do and I don't. One of the last conversations I had with Bakugo involved him telling me to jump off a building so I could maybe have a quirk in the next life. Both Mina and Hitoshi's eyes widened. Mina threw a hand over her mouth, and Hitoshi opened and closed his hand several times. Mina pulled him into a hug, while Hitoshi said nothing. That's awful. I'm so sorry, Freckles. What kind of hero tells someone to kill themselves? Izuka smiled reassuringly at the two of them, clearly having moved past it. It's fine. My issues aren't what we are here to discuss. Hitoshi nodded before speaking. You're right. Tell us about your team idea. Izuka took a breath. This was it. Pro heroes don't seem like they know why they fight anymore. I'm not saying they're all bad, but take Endeavor for instance. There are some unsettling rumors about him, specifically as a father. Nothing confirmed, but he's the number two hero. That's concerning. I want to remind the hero industry why it exists in the first place. That its duty is to the people first, and not their sponsors. I agree with everything you just said, but as this team stands now, I don't think it will work. Izuka looked over at Hitoshi, gesturing him to speak his mind. First off, you're still considered a villain, at least at the moment. Secondly, I'm a nobody at the moment. Ashido isn't a known entity either. This means we have any lack of claim to legitimacy beyond our own claims to the contrary. And what do you call someone without credibility? A nut job. Izuka sighed at this which made Hitoshi chuckle. What's so funny, you did just say this was impossible. Mina pointed out. When did I ever say that? I just pointed out we need another member. And it just so happens I have two in mind. Who? Izuka said, asking the question on both their minds. Shudo Todoroki and Mei Hatsum. Hitoshi stated simply. Todoroki? At this, the gears in Izuka's head began spinning. Yes, Todoroki would be perfect. He had a powerful quirk, and as the son of Endeavor, the cops wouldn't be able to paint his actions in a bad light unless they really screwed up. 
Having Shudo also grants them a degree of legitimacy they wouldn't have currently, as he's the son of the number two hero. If nothing else, his presence alone could eventually prompt an olive branch from the Hero Ethics Committee and the police, if only to preserve Endeavor's reputation. Ah, uh, Freckles? You're muttering. A lot. Mina's voice brought him out of his musings, causing him to look back up Hitoshi and Mina. He chuckled sheepishly. Sorry, that's just a thing I do. But you have a point, Hitoshi. Todoroki would give us the degree of validity we need to continue operating. That just leaves us with two problems. How do we convince him? And when do we do it? Mina coughed, signaling she wanted to jump in. Actually, I have some thoughts about that. See, hero internships start in two days. I know for a fact Todoroki is being forced to do it with his dad and Hosu. The gears in both Izuku's and Hitoshi's head began spinning, and they shared a glance. Hitoshi nodded. Then that's when we approach him. In two days at Hosu. Now what's the story about the handsome girl? At this, Hitoshi blushed slightly, before he coughed. May is sort of driven by experimentation. All we have to tell her she can have her babies being field tested and she'd build us a damn tank if we wanted. But we'll need costumes and names. In your case, Mina, you can't use your hero name you gave in school. At this, Mina beamed. I actually saved the name I wanted and gave out something different when we chose names today. From this day forward, you can count on Alien Queen for backup. She winked at Izuku and threw up a peace sign. Hitoshi and Izuku sweat dropped at this, unsure of what the hell they could say to that. Please tell me you didn't use the name I think you did, Mina. Oh, I absolutely did. Pinky is officially a registered hero name. How does it feel to know you created a hero, kid? At least her name isn't something stupid like Dog Welder. Izuku ignored Venom and looked at Hitoshi expectantly. He just shrugged. The only name I was able to even halfway like was Brainjacker. And even then, it sounds kind of sinister. Mina tapped her chin for a moment. How about High Mind? The three of them blinked. That's surprisingly good. That's definitely my code name now. Hitoshi nodded sagely. Izuka sighed, but pressed on. Okay, so names are taken care of. Now we just need to discuss outfits and gear. I'm set as my quirk naturally handles that. But Mina needs a new outfit, to hide her identity, and Hitoshi, you need something as well, along with something that will carry your voice, along with some self-defense tools. I know some Aikido, and I was planning to carry a microphone and a taser until I can convince Hatsum to make something for me. I'll ask her to make something for Mina as well next time I see her. Mina nodded. I was actually wanted to make some changes. Maybe some body armor and something to store my acid in like Bakudo does with his sweat. It'd put less strain on me in bad situations. Leave it to me. I'm pretty good at convincing people. They looked at Hitoshi in horror. What? I don't even need my power. Just say I need gadgets and Hatsum will practically make anything you ask her to. Neither Izuka or Mina were sure how to respond so they just nodded, and resuming drinking their tea. Suddenly Izuka sat up, remember something. Guys, we don't have a team name. Is that really important? Hitoshi drawled in a bored manner. Yeah, Izuku, isn't it more important that our actions matter? Mina questioned. It is. We need to say who we are, and what we are about. I have a name idea, but I'm going to wait until we have Todoroki and Hatsum on board before we release our manifesto. Izuku spoke calmly, excitement slowly building in him. Things would soon pick up. In the Yuri principal office. So all might, you see my point, yes? Nedza spoke, fingers clasped in front of him. Given the unnatural acceleration of the loss of your powers, and the frightening nature of all for one's threat, we need to take drastic measures. Perhaps young Bakugo is the answer to that. After all, how does one respond to an unstoppable force? By responding with an equally unstoppable force. I get your point, headmaster but I'm worried about him trying something he can't handle. The symbol of peace responded worriedly. I know, Yagi. This isn't ideal. Think of it as a trial basis. Bakugo, for all his bluster, respects you. If you told him that you changed your mind and wanted a different successor, he would accept that. Not happily, mind you, but he'd accept it. At this, Yagi sighed. Fine. I'll talk to him. But this Mirio kid interests me. If Bakugo doesn't pan out, 
I think he'd a good fit. Agreed. If nothing else, the addition of Bakugo's power into the pool of one for all is worth this test run, regardless of the outcome. Nedza spoke candidly, sipping his tea. No matter how you look at it, Bakugo's power will play a role in the resolution of this conflict. Yagi nodded, and got up to leave, then heading to the classroom where Bakugo was waiting. X. After explaining the idea, which relied heavily on appeals to Bakugo's pride, All Might rubbed the back of his head and spoke once more. So you understand what I'm telling you, young Bakugo. One for all is quirk passed down among generations. I'm going to be totally honest with you, Bakugo. I don't think you're the right choice for my successor, but I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt at the headmaster's request. You should have little issue using the power, as long as you don't try to use both one for all and your explosions at the same time. But on the off chance it's hard to manage, I'm going to have you train with my old mentor, Gran Torino. Whatever, old man. I'll master this quirk and make it my own. And then I'll show that damn Deku I was better all along, if his idol chose me over him. I'm putting my faith in you, Bakugo. I reserve the right to take back this power should I become unsatisfied with your use of it. You will relinquish it to me, should I deem unworthy. You'd agreed, and I expect you to keep your word. Otherwise, I will make you give it back. I chose you based on your victory in the sports festival. I hope you won't disappoint me. The figure of All Might looked at his successor, but for some reason, he couldn't help but feel he'd made the wrong choice. Chapter 7 You're Hot and You're Cold Chaos Pure, unadulterated chaos. Fire and smoke permeated throughout the entire city. Oxygen become thinner. Screams of terror echoing in the night. This was supposed to be a peaceful city, not a damn war zone. As Shinso cast his eyes to Shudo Todoroki, who looked out upon the damaged city, he couldn't help but wonder how things had snowballed this badly. Suddenly, a huge explosion ripped through the city a few blocks over. What the hell was that? A few hours earlier. Okay, Hitoshi. Today is the day. We have to get Todoroki on our side. He's the only shot at legitimacy that we have right now. But you cannot use your quirk except to help me get away, Shiso. After that, nothing explicitly. I want him to join us of his own volition. And turning him into a mind slave is not he way to do that. Izuka stood on a rooftop with Shiso, looking down at Shuto and his father, the flame hero Endeavor. Izuka was wearing his full venom suit, minus the mask at the moment. Shinso stood wearing a black turtleneck, a Kevlar vest, black fitted gloves, and black combat slacks with matching steel toed boots. In his hand, he had a cut up ski mask that only covered up his hair and the top part of his face, ensuring his voice wouldn't be muffled, and think Dread Pirate Roberts from PB or Daredevil's outfit for most of season one. On his hip, he had a taser holster and a megaphone clipped to his belt. Hitoshi waved off Izuka's concerns. Relax, man. I'm not an evil genius. Just a genius. He gave a wry grin. That's what I'm afraid of. Hitoshi and Izuka shared a laugh, trying to calm their nerves. This was their big moment. Izuka was going to have to convince Shudo of their aims while Shinso basically led Endeavor away to do whatever Shinso made his puppets do for his own entertainment. While they originally planned to have Izuka fight Endeavor, Venom explained that one of his main weaknesses was to fire which would put him at a severe disadvantage, which is not something they needed at this stage, especially against the number two hero. All right, hive mind. It's showtime. Izuku spoke, his vocal cords deepening as his mask formed. I seriously need a better name. Hitoshi muttered under his breath. X. Shuto, pay attention. Your being seen with me is important to your image. I won't tolerate inattentiveness. Endeavor spoke harshly to his son. Shudo was annoyed that his father had used his influence to ensure that no other pros offered him internships, thus ensuring he had to go with his bastard of a father. Whatever. Let's just keep going. Shudo thought he saw something following them on the rooftops, but every time he looked up, he saw nothing. He shook off the feeling and continued on. Excuse me, Mr. Endeavor, but I'm a huge fan. Can I get an autograph? All Might has nothing on you. A semi-familiar voice interrupted his thoughts, directing his attention to a guy wearing all black. A goth? Maybe. But why is he wearing combat boots? Before he could say anything, his father spoke out, in the fake manner he always used when talking to fans. 
Of course you can. Suddenly his father stiffened. Follow me. The boy's demeanor had shifted and set Todoroki on edge. Before he could ask what's going on, the guy in black handed him a piece of paper. Relax. This isn't a kidnapping. We just needed to get your pompous ass of a father away so we could talk to you. Confusion set in Shuto's expression, but as he looked up to address the boy who was leading his father away like some sort of zombie on a leash, he found he was alone on the sidewalk. Shudo Todoroki, you're a hard man to approach. A deep voice rumbled from behind him. Shudo spun around, backing away from the figure that leaned against the building behind him. The figure was dressed in all black, a white spider symbol on his torso. A manic grin was in place on his mask. Who are you? Are you with the League of Villains? Shudo demanded, gearing up for a fight. The League of who? And how the hell do you not know us? We're practically plastered on every news channel except for when they talk about the hero killer. The figure spoke, never once taking its eyes off Shuto. You. You're Venom. At this, the figure's grin seemed to widen, but that's impossible for a mask. Our partners said you were smart, but they also said you'd be harder to talk to. Frankly, we don't find it too difficult. Don't presume that you know me, Shuto said harshly, becoming unnerved. Why the hell does this guy refer to himself in the plural sense? Dissociative identity disorder, maybe? We know you hate your father. And we know you want to be a hero outside his shadow. Shuto froze. This person knew about that? Ha, huh, High Mind's guess was correct. Enough chat. What do you want exactly? Shuto growled out. Simple, really. We want you to join us in being heroes. That's it. Whatever the hell, Shudo had expected Venom to say, that was about near the bottom of the list. Come again? The figure chuckled at his disbelief. Come now, Shudo. Despite our label as a vigilante, we don't kill. For all the comparisons to the hero killer, we are nothing like them. The only difference between us and heroes like your father is a little piece of paper that says government approved. We believe heroes have lost their roots, and that they focus so much on making money. That saving people has become an afterthought, an added bonus. Venom took a deep breath, before continuing. Shuto, we extend to you an invitation to join the outsiders. X. Elsewhere in the city. Two figures stood on a rooftop, looking down on the city with disdain in their eyes. Kuro Jairi, unleash the Noma. As you wish, Master Tamira. The outsiders? Shuto questioned, having never heard of the team before. That's right, Shudo. Don't mistake us. We don't want you just because you're the son of Endeavor. Not in the way you think. Venom replied calmly, arms still folded. What do you mean? Shudo questioned, intrigued by the proposition. We want you because the fact you're level-headed, quick on your feet, and your quirk is powerful. And last but not least, you have a sense of justice. Just like us. You mentioned needing me because of my father. Why? This answer would make or break the deal. Both parties knew this, and took steps to ensure the advantage. By having you on our team, we gain legitimacy. We aren't just a bunch of rabble-rousers upset with the current hero system. If the prodigal son of the second highest hero rebels against the system itself, it's going to make people talk. It's going to call into light the decision-making of the powers that be. At worst, they're forced to legally and formally accept us as real heroes, else risking public backlash. At best, we start a revolution in the field of heroes, and a return to the root of it all. Shudo was enraptured by the words of Venom. This was a man with vision, and a plan to achieve that vision. Shuto idly noted that Venom reminded him of all might to a degree, with the way he spoke of justice. Before you decide, take a few days to think about it. If you agree, come to LeBlanc Coffee Shop in Midtown Mustafa in exactly two days after school ends. Our group will be waiting for you. However, we ask you not, judge our normal appearance. Shudo sweat dropped at this, but nodded anyway. Hmm, what should I have you do next? Hitoshi mused to himself as he looked at the visage of the number two hero. Currently, Endeavor was doing jumping jacks in the street yelling I'm a star, while several onlookers watched torn between confusion and amusement, including a number of pro heroes. Before he gave another command, several creatures landed in the middle of the busy street. Oh crap. Those look like the creatures that were involved in the USJ attack. Endeavor, forget your memory of me, 
and resume your normal actions. Endeavor went straight, falling out of Hitoshi's control. Seeing the creatures, his eyes narrowed. Finally, a chance to prove I'm better than all might. Heroes! To me! And with that, Endeavor and the pros jumped into the fray. As Venom turned to walk away, they heard a loud crash, followed by screams, and several small explosions, with fire shooting into the sky from a few blocks away. Shit, that's the way that hive mind went. Venom spoke, concern leaking into his voice in regards to his friend. He then looked to Todoroki. Looks like we're getting a crash course in teamwork earlier than we thought. Shudo only nodded, before activating his ice, and turned to where Venom had been a few seconds ago. A voice made him shoot his head in the direction of the flames. He saw the figure of Venom shooting up into the air, swinging from building to building with black tendrils. Try to keep up, Shuto! As Shuto looked up, he could only think to himself. Pretty cool, before he shot off down the street using a bridge of ice. As Venom looked back to see Shuto following him in a creative manner, he too thought that Shuto was pretty cool too. X. Hitoshi was trying to get in touch with Izuku but he wasn't answering his phone. Just as he was about to call again, two figures landed beside him. Man, Venom, took you long enough. I take it your chat with our friend here went well? Hitoshi questioned his friend curiously. For the most part. He's agreed to meet up with us to talk more, at least. Came the cool response of Venom, to which Hitoshi nodded. They really couldn't expect more at this point, not when things were going to hell in the city. Venom, what's the plan here? Shudo questioned, clearly antsy. Venom sighed, before glancing around the street, looking for factors they could use to their advantage. Okay. Hi, mind, I want you to use your power to control anyone who hasn't evacuated yet for whatever reason. They can't stay here. Shudo, you're guarding high mind, and taking stalling any of these things that get past me. Both Shuto and Hitoshi froze at this. You mean you're going to stay and fight them? The pros will turn on you as soon as the creatures are down. Hitoshi spoke harshly. Venom turned enough to regard him for a moment. We don't have a choice. Otherwise, people are going to die. Besides, let them try. Venom looked back, his mask's grin widening impossibly further, before he rammed into the nearest Nomu, sending them tumbling into a nearby building. Damn it, Izuku, you better not die. Mina will melt my face off if you do. Hitoshi muttered before turning to Shudo. Well, you heard the boss. Let's do this. He turned to face a crowd of onlookers. Hey guys, what would you do if I said I think Dragon Ball GT is better than Z? As he was answered dozens of angry voices, he could only smirk and think gotcha. Shudo, on the other hand, could only wonder what the hell he'd gotten himself into. Venom assaulted the creature's brain case, slamming into with a downward elbow, before shifting into a backflip kick sending the creature upwards. He slammed a fist into the creature's face before shooting two webs at the ground below and grabbed onto the creature with his legs and propelled them towards the ground, the creature's head hitting the ground with a sickening crack. It groaned before losing consciousness or the will to fight. Venom wasn't sure which and he didn't particularly care. Not when he had people to save. He dragged it out and webbed it to a nearby by wall. Sit there, while we go deal with the rest of the party crashers. Venom was about to say more, when his spider sense went wild, causing him to reactively dodge out of the way of a flaming fist. Venom. You're under arrest. Endeavor growled out, annoyed that he hadn't taken him out with one punch. Somewhere else in the country, a bald man sneezed, before going back on the hunt for egg sales. You know, funny enough, Charizard, I'm pretty sure you can't arrest anyone, let alone someone helping you do your job. Venom retorted dryly. I'm even more sure that if you'd actually hit me, you'd be under investigation for assaulting a private citizen, since I'm only wanted for question in regards to Brawl case. Endeavor's face paled, before he withdrew his fist. Fine, what are you here for? I thought I'd take a walk in the woods. Long way from the forest. Took a wrong turn in Albuquerque. Endeavor twitched, but said nothing. His eyes panned to the two remaining creatures. How much do you know about these things, Venom? I don't. Other than the fact they can be taken out, that's about it. They're called Nomu. They're human weapons created by the League of Villains. We think they're geared towards killing high-profile heroes. Each has multiple quirks. We don't know how, though. That's problematic. 
The good news is they don't seem to be capable of analytical thought, and the quirks they have aren't particularly dangerous on their own, at least to prose. However, when you combine them all, that's when things get dangerous. Endeavor explained, ensuring he was thorough and loud enough that the prose with them could hear. We don't know how many have been unleashed in the city so we need to wrap this up fast. We are in agreement, vigilante. But after they're down, you and I shall have words. Only words? Not sentences? Endeavor's growl and the groans of nearby prose was Venom's only answer. Man, I feel like a dude playing in RTS. Hivemind commented as he forced the civilians to march in a double-file line. Shudo just looked confused, but said nothing. They continued to work at getting the people to safety, with Hivemind antagonizing and controlling any other civilians they came across. Endeavor was going toe-to-toe with a strength Nomu, gripping hands locked with the beasts in a struggle of pure strength. He roared in anger, before forcing the creature to its knees, before activating his flame shroud and burning the creature. It clicked its teeth before shoving Endeavor to the side, then rushing to a pro who wasn't paying attention. Just as it reared its clothes back to slice the pro to ribbons, a black blur slammed into it, forcing back towards Endeavor. Pay attention to your surroundings, man. These things aren't pushovers. Venom spoke to the hero he'd saved, before offering a hand to help him up. The pro hesitantly took his hand, but before he was pulled to his feet, a massive explosion ripped through the city, and the shockwave forced them to the ground again. X. Elsewhere. Bakugo stood facing the hero killer stain, glaring at the man who dared to call him unworthy. He'd even said that fucking Izuku was a true hero, while he was just a pretender. You're really startine to piss me off, stain. Bakugo growled out. He'd been lucky not to get cut and neutralized like that damn extra Ida. But you're going to find out just how special my quirk is. He may have said to not use it yet, but he doesn't know how strong I am. Orange bioelectricity swirled furiously around Bakugo's right arm, his palm facing towards Stain. Now die, trash! As the explosion went off, Bakugo noticed something wrong with the chain reaction, indescribable pain setting in his arm, making him scream, before everything went dark. What the hell was that? Was it the villains? One of the random pros asked to no one in particular. Focus, you fools! We cannot worry about that right now. Our focus is on the last of these creatures right now. Endeavor's tired voice snapped their attention onto the last Noma standing, which was currently fighting Venom. Hmph. Can't let that punk upstage me. Endeavor thought, before using flame expulsion form his shoulder blades to rocket him towards the Noma. Stand there or get out of the way, Venom. I care not. But that creature is going down now. Supersonic Nova Punch! Flames coalesced around Endeavor's fist before they slammed into the Noma's stomach, rocketing it through several buildings until it settled in the rubble, unmoving. Damn, old man. That's some right hook you got there. And don't you forget it. We'll settle things eventually, vigilante. But today isn't that day. Endeavor gave a nod, and then ran towards the site of the explosion that had rocked the city minutes prior. I want to help more, but I need to take Hitoshi and get back home. Mom will freak if I'm out any later than this pain. That's the first sensation that Bakugo awoke to. The first sight he saw was his mother sleeping in a chair, and All Might standing in the corner beside him. You're awake, young Bakugo, came the symbol of peace's words, his voice betraying nothing. I suppose this is my fault. My gut told me you were not the person to entrust this power, but the headmaster ensured me that the sports festival was a worthy test of a successor. He ran a hand through his hair. I'll be frank, kid. I've decided that you should give me back one for all. You're too volatile, and you did exactly the one I told you not to. You combined one for all with your explosions. Do you have any idea what you've done? You killed the hero killer in the blast. You scarred young Ida's face. You blew off that pro's leg. As of now, you're on probation within UA until further notice. Bakugo tried to pull himself up with his right arm, only realized he couldn't feel his right arm. He looked over before he started panicking. Where is it? All Might couldn't look at Bakugo, unable to stomach the panic seeping across his features. Bakugo screamed, frantically. Where the fuck is my arm? How could you do this to me? As he began to thrash in his bed, he yanked out a few hairs and threw them in All Might's face. Take back your fucking quirk! Chapter 8 
cloudy with a chance of fluff. Izuka was waiting in LeBlanc for the rest of the group to show up. He took a moment to glance around the shop since he had nothing better to do. The shop itself as kind of empty, which was kind of the typical occurrence. Come to think of it, besides a few regulars like Mina and a few others, he couldn't remember ever seeing it super crowded. He idly wondered how Sojiro stayed in business. Speak of Sojiro, he'd run to his house for a second to check on something, so Izuka was the only one in the store at the moment. He turned his thoughts back to the outsider's first meeting with a prospective member. He wasn't completely sure if Shudo would show up, despite their slight bonding under fire. He was so wrapped up in his thoughts, that when someone blew in his left ear, he spazzed out and fell under the table. He then heard Mina's familiar cackling as she knelt down to check on him. She tried to speak in between rasps of laughter. I dash. Mina laughed melodiously. I'm sorry, Izuku. I couldn't help it. I waved my hand in front of you four times, and said your name at least eight. So I decided to take drastic measures. She got you good, kid. I'm kind of jealous she made you spill. Maybe I should make efforts to mess with you, too. Please don't. She's already sending me towards a heart attack. You're here early, Mina. Her face darkened, as if remembering something unpleasant. Izuku, there's something you should know. It's about Bakugo. And something he did. She said, fidgeting. Did he touch you? A pause. Izuka bit his lip nervously and stammered. You unwillingly, of course. Looking away, not wanting to make eye contact. Because I'll web him to a wall somewhere if you want. Mina blinked, clearly not expecting him to be so insecure, but still wanting to protect her. It touched her heart and made her want to reaffirm their relationship. A.H. Don't get me wrong. I know you can take care of yourself. I just am MPH. Mina shut him up rather effectively. After all, it's rather difficult to speak when a pretty girl is occupying your lips with hers. Slowly, she pulled away as he stopped freaking out. Izuku, it's nothing like that. Though it's adorable that my boyfriend is so protective of me. BB boyfriend? Izuku was having a heart attack. Or a stroke. Yeah, that's what this is. He'd had a stroke, and this was one big brain bleed-induced hallucination. She flipped him in the nose. Bad Izuku. No mutters. She glared playfully at him before continuing. Yes, I said boyfriend. Because we've been dating for weeks, and I consider you such. She shifts into a very haughty and pompous British accent. The alien queen graciously bestows upon you the title of boyfriend most righteous, plus eight. She made an exaggerated knighting gesture with a butter knife. This made Izuka smile softly at her, which made her blush a bit, lilac staining her cheeks. She leaned in and whispered conspiratorially, Unless you're dating some other cute girl from outer space? Izuka laughed softly at this, and shook his head. No, no, I think Mina Ishido is the only alien queen for me. He took her hand in his, and they sat down in their booth. Now what's this about Bakugo? It's kind of a long story. So broad stroke it. I bet you'd like if I stroke something. Basing. H-E-Y-O. Mina. Ha, you're too easy to mess with. No need to be such a prude, Aizu. Anyway, so yeah, Bakugo fought the hero killer with another of our classmates. Things didn't go so well for them, though. What do you mean? Bakugo blew his arm off in the fight. He refused to say how. He's always been quiet at least until someone talks about Venom or talks too loudly, but now he's broody. That hit Izuka like a sack of bricks. He didn't hate Bakugo, but he definitely didn't like who he'd become. He respected Bakugo, at least back then, but Venom had opened him to being more critical of his actions. He'd always held out hope that they'd one day be friends again, but that seemed unlikely. He swallowed his other questions, instead trying to get a grasp over the situation. What happened to your other classmate? Ida got nerve damage in his arm, and Bakugo burnt his fact, though not intentionally. He has burn marks over his left eye that run to his hairline. He's lucky he didn't lose any vision. We don't know details, though. Apparently, the cops got involved and it's super hush-hush. Supposedly, the hero killer died in that fight, but there's no word on who killed him. Izuka sat there stunned. Obviously, if the situation was kept under wraps... That means either Bakugo or this Ida guy killed the hero killer. What's Ida's quirk? Huh? That's what you're curious about, out of everything I said? 
I promise it's a relevant question, Mina. She eyed him skeptically, but told him anyway. It's called Engine. He's actually related to Ingenium. Let's him run fast. Then that settles it. Settles what? Bakugo killed the hero killer. They wouldn't try to keep details under wraps that badly unless it would paint Yue in a bad light. My guess as to what happened. Ida went looking for revenge since Ingenium was the hero killer's most recent victim. They're brothers, so that makes sense. I don't exactly know why Bakugo was there, though. Is he friends with Ida? Not at all. Ida detests Bakugo because he's unruly and crass. Maybe he just stumbled across them then. So Bakugo sees what's happening, and then a fight ensues. Flash forward to the end, and Bakugo is desperate. He creates an explosion larger than he can handle, and blows his arm, stain, and the surround area to bits in the process. Mina looked at Izuku in awe, having never really seen his analysis in action. Wow, Izuku, are you related to Detective Conan? Um, no. I don't think I'm that good. Before Mina could say anything else, the store's welcome chime dinged, causing them to look up. They saw Hitoshi walking in with Shuto Todoroki in tow. They were both wearing their respective UA uniforms. They slid into the booth across them and nodded in greeting. Ashido, what are you doing here? Shuto asked curiously, not expecting to see the pink girl, especially sitting so close to a boy he didn't recognize. Oh, hey Shuto. I'm glad you could join us. Mina replied enthusiastically, happy that her classmate had shown up. Us? It clicked with Todoroki. He turned to the unfamiliar boy. Your venom? Shuto eyed him up and down, appearing somewhat skeptical. I imagined you'd be more intimidating outside the suit. Ha! Huh. I keep telling you that I make you look good. Izuku ignored the mildly arrogant self-preening of his partner, and instead chuckled nervously at Shuto. Yeah, I can imagine so. I don't look like much, do I? At this, Mina flicked his ear. Oh, what was that for? Now, now, freckles. None of that. I happen to think you look cute and scrumptious cinnamon roll. Izuka placed his face in his hands to hide his blush, which was prompted by her shameless flirting. Hitoshi snorted, and then shook his head. Man, let's focus back on the reason we're here, and less on embarrassing Izuku. He said dryly. Izuka beamed at the rescue attempt by his friend. Besides, Mina, there will be plenty of time for that later. Or not, Izuka's sweat dropped. Shuto nodded, taking this chance to voice his concerns. Let's say I do agree to your little crusade, Izuku. Shuto spoke candidly. What exactly stops us from doing whatever we want? The media and authorities have a point about you. You don't answer to anyone but yourself. At hearing this, Izuka sighed knowing he'd have to self-disclose to win over Shuto. Let me tell you a story, Shuto. It's about a boy who didn't have a quirk, yet wanted to be a hero more than anything else in the world. Shuto sat up straighter, looking at Izuku intently. Izuku Midoriya and his friend Katsuki Bakugo wanted to be heroes so badly. They wanted to be just like All Might. That was great until they turned six. Katsuki got a really powerful quirk. Izuku didn't. Izuka paused, clearly struggling with his own bad memories. Mina squeezed his hand reassuringly. He sighed, and continued. In fact, the longer that Izuka didn't develop a quirk, the angrier and crueler Katsuki became. Eventually, Katsuki stopped treating Izuka like a friend, and instead started using him as a punching bag. Katsuki even used his quirk on Izuka occasionally. But through all that, Izuka never stopped considering Katsuki his friend truly believing they could one day be friends again if he could just get a quirk. Shuto was quietly processing what he'd been told so far. He assumed that the Bakugo was the same one he knew, and judging from the slight nod Mina gave him, his assumption was correct. However, as I'm sure you can probably guess, Izuku never manifested a quirk. At least, not on his own. The rest of group's eyes widened at this. Izuku's quirk wasn't his own. Kid, are you sure telling them about me in full is a good idea? We have to do it eventually, and I can't teach them like you could. Eventually, we'll have to run scenarios like they would at UA, on the chance they get kicked out. They're risking a lot for this. We have to do right by them. Okay, kid. I support your decision. Just, remember Izuku. You're not alone anymore, okay? I will. Izuku wiped some tears that were building up in eyes. Thanks, partner. 
Anytime, kid. Izuku looked back up at his team and pressed on. Through a series of events, Izuku obtained power after bonding with a relic from the hero Spider-Man. They all leaned in at this point, enraptured by what they were hearing. Izuku's eyes bled black a bit at this point, before he looked at them all. We bonded with a creature called a symbiote. What the hell? Izuku, are you okay? Mina grabbed him by the shoulders, freaking out at his sudden change. Mina, the kid let me commandeer his vocal cords in order to address you. While Venom is Izuku's hero name, it's also the name of this symbiote. Through our time with the hero Spider-Man, we gained an imprint of his powers, enhancing them, and eventually retaining them within our DNA. Anyone we bonded with could use these powers. Izuku's eyes went back to their usual color. He blinked. I'll never get used to that. His friends looked at him like he was crazy. He ignored this and moved on. So yeah? I have a quirk, but it's not truly mine. At least it wasn't. Shudo was looking at him intently now, something unreadable flashing in his eyes. As I used Venom's power more and more, I noticed a sort of bleed effect over time. I was faster than before, and I had better reflexes. I'm still much faster in the suit, but who can say if the bleed will continue? He then looked at Todoroki. Shuto, I notice you don't use your dad's quirk. I don't know if that's related to your scar, but... I can relate to identity issues with your power. After all, I have a 300-year-old creature in my head constantly comparing me to America's greatest hero in history, and every time I use my powers, I'm reminded even further that my power isn't quite my own. But at the end of the day, your power is yours now your father may have given you half of your quirk, but he can't tell you how to use it. You can either ignore it and limit yourself, or you can make it your own and become a hero that is damn near unstoppable. At realizing how he sounded, Izuka frantically waved his hands in front of himself. Hey, ah, I'm not trying to tell you how to use your powers. I just wanted you to know I get where you're coming from. Shito thought about everything he just heard. From Izuka's backstory, to his own struggle with his quirk. He wasn't sure he could just start using his father's, no. His full quirk so soon, but he would definitely try. And maybe, maybe it was time to visit his mom. Elsewhere, Katsuki Bakugo sat in his living room alone, working on schoolwork. It was a pain without his dominant arm. He'd refuse the teacher's offer to transfer him out. He would be a hero, one way or another. He didn't need both arms to prove that the rest of his stupid class were just deadweight extras. He'd show them he was the best even with missing an arm. As he struggled to write an answer to the problem on the paper, a surge of irritation flowed through him. Katsuki grit his teeth and used to having trouble writing the answers to his homework. The feeling of not being able to be in control was something he hated. Damn All Might and his quirk. And Deku. If Deku had never beaten him in the first place, he wouldn't have been desperate enough to take All Might's quirk to begin with. I don't need his stupid power. I'm the best, damn it. And I'll prove it, no matter what. They say pride cometh before the fall, and Katsuki had further to fall still. X. Izuku, Mina, and Hitoshi were all looking at Shudo expectantly. This was the moment of truth. Where he joined them, or not. They sat with bated breath, each second increasing the intensity of the atmosphere at the table. I'll do it. And just like that, the tense air was gone. Izuku breathed a sigh of relief, Mina chuckled sheepishly, and Hitoshi just took a sip of his tea. However, I do think we should discuss your friend at a later date, Izuku. That is my condition. It's not that I think it's a threat, I just would like to have a better grasp over who I'm working with. I know Izuku. But I need to know Venom as well. Izuka nodded at this. These were fair requests. Well, you know me, kid. I'll sing my own praises any day of the year. Izuku again tried to ignore the narcissistic ramblings of his gooey friend. He talks to you in your head, doesn't he? Mina asked curiously. Izuka looked at her, shocked. Oh, come on, Izuku. I may not be the most book smart girl around, but I'm very people smart. Your eyes occasional glaze over for a few seconds and then you sort of jolt like you were somewhere else. Why, yeah. He talks to me. He sort of alternates between narcissism and being helpful. The others deadpanned at him. What kind of non-physical entity talks about how awesome they are enough to be labeled as a narcissist? Mina suddenly bonked herself in the forehead. The rest looked at her curiously. 
Duh. We have to give Shudo a cool nickname. Hitoshi sighed at this, Shudo just looked confused, and Izuku just scratched his cheek. You, um, I think we should address some more pressing concerns. At this, Hitoshi nodded. I agree. The Hosu incident showed me that while my quirk is good for handling humans, I can't fight the Noma. This, more than anything else, affirms that we need two things before we can truly make our appearance to the world, a gear maker, and funding. I have a friend I can get involved, and I can start on that tomorrow as I'm, sort, of meeting her after school tomorrow anyway. Hitoshi finished with a slight blush on his normally blank expression. Uh, Hitoshi's got a girlfriend, dot. Mina teased in a sing-song voice. Whatever. Just be ready to make a sales pitch in two days. Hitoshi didn't rise to Mina's antics. She pouted, but said nothing further. I actually have a potential source of funding. Shuto's voice got their attention. It's nothing concrete, but I may know someone who's willing to help. I'll have to talk to them tomorrow. At this, Mina suddenly blinked. Are you talking about Dash? She started but was cut off. Yes, but I need to speak with her before I say anything else. I make no promises she'd be interested. They all stretched and began to move out of the booth. Izuka looked at each of them with a feeling of pride. So we agree? We meet up in two days to try to sell the idea of the outsiders to a benefactor and a gear outfitter? The others nodded and headed to the exit. As they went outside, Hitoshi and Shudo walked off, waving their goodbyes. Mina then latched onto Izuku's arm, causing him to turn scarlet. Come on, Izuku! I want to get a burger! Chapter 9 The Lame and Edgy 3 Mustafa's Shift Izuku knelt down on a rooftop watching his targets in his full venom gear. They were talking about whatever it was drug pushers talk about. He didn't have the faintest idea and he didn't particularly care. They were sitting at the docks in Mustafa City, clearly waiting for something. Their truck was near the gate that lead back to the main road. Drug running wasn't exactly common anymore, but the ones that did stay active were bad news. He'd even heard rumblings of Yakuza dealing in some shady stuff, but he hadn't come across anything concrete yet. Mostly just whispers here and there. But the group he was currently tailing were as good at covering their tracks. They were sloppy and new. However, their leader at least based off the few thugs he'd, spoken, to, was smart. And worse, had a very versatile quirk that played a key in their operations. Izuku and Venom agreed this was the perfect chance to gain more public support. They didn't tell the others simply because they weren't ready, not when they had zero support. Izuku would be damned if he let them go before he could make lesson tapes using Venom at minimum, and ideally after they'd gotten gear for the others. One of the dealer's phone went off, bringing Izuku out of his thoughts and focused once again on the thugs. Judging by the dealer's rapidly paling face, he was probably talking to his boss. He seemed nervous, and he brought the phone in front of him. Suddenly, there was a flash, and with it came a lanky man wearing an expensive-looking suit, who definitely did not look happy. The lanky man put his hand on the dealer's shoulder, and he looked down at the phone on the ground. There was another flash, and suddenly they were gone. The remaining two dealers looked at each other and shrugged, before walking back to their truck they'd left at the gate. Izuka figured he'd follow them, if nothing else to get some leads on the rest of the operation. They tried to drive as inconspicuously as possible, but Izuka remained vigilante in tailing them. You know, you should consider using some tech along with us. Trackers, for example, would make this less urgent. Maybe even consider lenses you wear under the mask for night vision purposes. Plus, you know, everyone loves toys. Maybe but I don't think that's something I'd be able to make. Perhaps we can bring it up with Hitoshi's friend? Izuka thought back to his partner, recognizing the merits of incorporating some tools. He'd have to draw up a list of specs he wanted first, though. Something to do after this, I guess. Izuka muttered, now consciously thinking about all the fun little goodies he could request. In the name of justice, of course. As a jump from building to building in a zigzag formation, he felt confusion from his partner. That's something I've never understood. I know the buildings here aren't as big as New York, but you could still try to web-sling for movement. Instead, you vault across the street and jump building to building, only using weblins from quick zip lines. Why is that? It's better exercise this way, and it's not like the suit doesn't help my stamina. This way, I combine hero work with actual endurance training. Plus, I may be similar to Peter, but I'm not him, Venom. 
I use my arms mostly when I fight, but I doubt I'm as strong as he was. I'd get tired if I used my swinging a lot, which could come back to bite me later. Sure, we've yet to face anyone difficult outside of the Noma, but it's better to err on the side of caution. Izuku explained to his partner. Izuku then resumed his unique momentum propulsion, still tailing the car. He jumped over some rooftops, and under some closed lines, and even in between the support beams of a radio tower. Eventually, the truck drove to a rundown-looking amusement park. This is likely the place, Izuka muttered. Probably so, kid. Plus it just screams evil hideout. Ten bucks says they use the Hall of Mirrors for something nefarious. Come on, there's no way that's true. It's too obvious. Before Izuka could make a move, his phone began buzzing, showing someone was calling him. He glanced down to see it was Mina. He slid the answer button and tapped the earbud in his left ear. Hello? Izuka asked, feeling somewhat shy, now that he was speaking to his girlfriend. Izuka, Hi. Came Mina's ever-cheerful voice. What you doing? Do you want our alibi, or what we're actually doing? He asked in an amused tone. Him I dunno. You do come up with some interesting ones. And just saying, it's still super weird to hear you refer to yourself in the plural sense. She replied teasingly, enjoying their banter. We apologize, but it's a side effect of our powers. I know, I know. He could almost imagine her waving her hand at this. Anyway, so what's my dashing little vigilante boyfriend up to currently? Well, we just finished tailing some new element in downtown Mustafa. We are planning to shut down their operation tonight, so we can meet up without time constraints with the group tomorrow. He heard Mina sigh into the phone. Izuku, I know the work you do as Venom is important. But don't forget to take care of Izuku, okay? Her concern touched him, as he'd definitely not had people in his life who felt that way before. It was nice. We will, Mina. We promise, okay? Thank you. I'll let you go save the day, okay? Hugs. She said that when she was about to hang up. It was a dorky and cute little thing she did, and he honestly liked it a lot. Hugs, Mina. We'll call you after, okay? So you'll know we're okay. Okay. Go get em, tiger. With that, they hung up. Izuka slid his phone back into his suit pouch. Time to go to work, partner. You're damn right. Let's kick some ass. X. Izuka landed on a lamp post that gave him a solid view of the thugs in the immediate vicinity. He decided to take a stealthy approach as long as he could. He identified the easiest to reach thugs and calmly move into position. The first was taking a leak against a building wall which was rather unsanitary. As he finished his business, he felt a tap on his shoulder. He turned around only to have a fist meet his face, and entered blissful unconsciousness. The rest of the guards outside went in much of the same way until there was only one left. Izuku stood watching him from a rooftop, and shot a web at him, yanking him up to the ledge. Hi there, got some questions. See we were in the neighborhood, and looking for directions to the pizza parlor, a cell phone retailer, and your boss's hideout. Think you can help us out? Venom's manic grin widened, showcasing its even sharpened teeth. The thug looked damn near ready to piss himself. Whether it was from being held out from a three-story building by one arm, or the psychotic-looking guy in black, who can say? Oh, it's my god dash. Venom quickly shot a hand over his mouth, before he could scream. Ah! ah, ah. Venom wagged a clawed finger. No shouting. Don't want to spoil the surprise now, do we? At this, the thug enthusiastically nodded. Good, we are in agreement. Now our directions, please. Um, he's in the Hall of Mirrors in the back of the park. Venom twitched at this. Hey kid, do you hear a phone ringing? Because I called it. Ugh. I hate it when you're right. Izuku groaned mentally before focusing back on the thug in hand, so to speak. And our pizza parlor is where? The thug looked very confused, and before he could respond, Venom clocked him and deposited him on the roof safely. Bet you'll never doubt my awesome wisdom ever again. Venom? Yes, oh dear partner of mine? Please shut up. X. Venom stood on the rafters of the Hall of Mirrors, gazing down upon the various criminals running around setting up crates of drugs. He panned his eyes around the building, his eyes settling on the man he'd see at the docks. His quirk is clearly teleportation, but what are his limits? 
Before Izuka could think any further, one thug rushed to the sharp-dressed man and whispered something in his ear before an angry expression appeared on the boss's face. Listen up, you fools. Someone is here. Since they didn't flashly announce themselves, that means it's either that pro eraser head or the vigilante venom. Spread out and find M. With that, he shoved the underling and moved into the actual hall of mirrors. The eight thugs ended up clustering up below Venom, so he decided he'd just make this fast. He dropped down onto one of them, slamming his head into the ground. Hi, Venom said simply, his grin visage unnerving the group of thugs. Oh fuck guys, he's gonna eat us. Um, what? Venom tilted his head in confusion. A thug freaked out and tried to slug him with a crowbar, and suddenly all hell broke loose. Venom grabbed the crowbar thug and flung him into a wall, before shooting a web at Thug holding a pistol, and zipping him to a rafter beam, his screams echoing in the building. He landed back down, before his spider sense went off, and he moved his head to the side just in time to avoid getting stabbed with a butterfly knife. You know guys, you should definitely work on your greeting technique. It's very rude to start with sharp objects. Should save that for when you're cooking dinner. Wait, how do you guys feel about the legendary Emerald Agassiz? They groaned at his lame commentary, before the remaining six all rushed him at the same time, and tried to swarm him. He ducked under one thug's legs, and kicked him into another. He uppercut the third, and engaged in a midair combo, doing a flip kick backwards, before shifting into a scissor kick that caught the guy in the temple, sending him into a crate of drugs, into blissful consciousness. Ah, they're so cute when they're sleeping. And you know, the rest of you could do the smart thing and give up. Venom offered helpfully. The rest glanced at each other, before surprisingly nodding and taking off. Huh. Can't believe that actually worked. And here I thought I would get to hear more of your riveting dialogue. The boss waltzed up to Venom, hands at his sides, expensive-looking shades on his face. Dude, who the hell wears sunglasses at night? Especially in this dark-ass warehouse? Venom blinked before suddenly the boss was in front of him, with a hand on his shoulder. I do, for one. Call it trend-setting, kid. And now, I'm about to show you a magic trick. In the Hall of Mirrors? Seriously? Oh, yes. I'm about to make an asshole disappear. Suddenly, everything changed, and Venom was dropped into the depths of the walls of mirrors. You see, kid, my quirk is pretty useful. Oh, great. A cliché villain speech. And here I thought I could go my career without hearing one. You've got a pretty smart mouth for someone so stupid. After all, you'd have to be, to stroll into my operation without a plan. Oh, I had a plan. It just lacked details. Venom's sense went off, and spun to the side, catching the guy in the head with a kick, before the guy disappeared again. Man, you don't know who I am, do you? I'm assuming you mean besides as the guy I just kicked in the temple? God damn it, brat. Shut up for just a damn second. My name is Shift. Okay, that's a pretty badass name. I'll give you that. Venom begrudgingly admitted. Why, thanks, kid. The only problem is everyone only hears it once. So it hasn't caught on. Another tug at his spider sense, and Venom rolled to the side, shooting webs at the guy and pinned him to a wall for a few seconds before he disappeared again. Wait, I get it. Shift. Because you shift positions. He didn't get an answer before he was punched again. Okay, this is getting really annoying. He's clearly got a limit to his power. I just don't know wait. Symbiote, when that thug at the docks answered his phone, do you think it was a video call? Could be. If it was, that means this guy can only teleport where he can see. There's probably other limitations, but that's the biggest. Then all we have to do is eliminate his vision. Venom looked around and spotted a fuse box for the lights in the catwalk above the mirrors. He zipped up there and punched the fuse box sending the whole building into total darkness. So that's your big plan? So what if you figured out my quirk's weakness? If I can't see you, you can't see me. Shift called out into the dark, panicking. Venom quietly closed in on the source of the sound, using his enhanced hearing to locate Shift. Fight me like a man, you coward! Any composure that Shift had was gone by now. Venom stood a few feet away, before he shot some webbing into Shift's face, blocking his vision. He then shot them up into the air, and grabbed onto him in a body lock. They then descended towards the ground as gravity tugged at them, 
and Venom ensured that shift his head underground, losing consciousness. Venom webbed him up, and then hefted him onto his shoulder. Let's get him to the cops so they can officially shut this guy down. Venom had dropped Shift off with a note that detailed his quirk, and listed the locations of his warehouse and operations. With that, he headed home, calling Mina as he'd promised he would, and then promptly passing out almost as soon as he climbed into bed. X. The next day, school had flown by, and before he knew it, Izuku found himself in LeBlanc waiting for the others. Today was the day that he convinced the handsome girl to be their tech creator, and Shuto's friend to be their benefactor. The door chimed, and in walked his group of friends. Mina immediately rushed to him, and gave him a hug, pressing her athletic body against him. He turned crimson, but he still hugged her back. Hitoshi and Shuto just nodded their greetings to him. Hey, baby! Guess what? They agreed to talk to you. Her face broke out into a wide smile, and subsequently brightening Izuku's day with it. Are really? That's great. Two girls coughed and drew Izuka's attention to themselves. Hatsum was a girl with a tank top, cargo pants, and pink dreadlocks. She also had welder's goggles on her head. The other girl was a rather prim and proper-looking type, featuring rather aristocratic features. She had black hair that was tied into a messy ponytail, with a single bang hanging on the side of her face. Aya! You must be Miss Hatsum and Shuto's friend, right? At this, both girls nodded, hesitance was plain in their body language. Well, let's sit down and talk, okay? At this, they moved back to their usual table in the back. Mina sat snuggled into Izuka's left side, and Hitoshi sat to Izuka's right closest to the aisle. The unnamed girl, Shudo, and Hatsum moved across them, with Hatsum sitting across from Hitoshi. As Izuku opened his mouth to speak, the aristocrat girl cut him off. Before you begin, I want to clear some things up. To be completely transparent, you are the vigilante known as Venom, correct? At this, Izuka paused deliberating internally before speaking. Do I tell them? I mean, I need to trust me, and if they weren't trustworthy, I doubt they'd be here. Yes, I'll be upfront, I am Venom, but I'm not the villain the media would lead you to think I am. Izuka spoke candidly, before nodding, allowing her to proceed. Momo coughed, before resuming her point. I have questions. I know nothing of you, beyond your reportings on the news. Before I commit to any aid, which will be purely financial, an occasional use of my quirk, I want to get an idea for you as a person, and what you hope to accomplish. Izuka's eyes narrowed at this, prompting him to respond. How do I know you won't turn me in? I haven't hurt anyone. Well, besides criminals. And I don't even know your name. She nodded to him, recognizing his points. Very well, trust must be established first then. I am Momo Yayorozu. My quirk is creation, but I have to have a clear grasp of the composition of anything I make. My name is Izuku Midoriya. My quirk is arachnid, for the sake of simplicity. I am also the vigilante known as Venom. Now go ahead and ask your questions. I wish to know why you attacked Bakugo three months ago, and why you refused to get a hero's license. That's personal. However, I will say I didn't attack him. He agreed to fight me. I guess the cops just took his statement the wrong way, or something got lost in translation. Izuka sighed, but continued. As for why I don't get a license, it's simple. I can't. I'm technically wanted for acts of vigilantism, which would disbar me from applying traditionally. However, that's why I put together this group, in hopes of attaining legitimacy through righteous actions. Momo nodded, agreeing with this. I understand. One more question. Are you different from the hero killer in methodology? This was a fair question, as she would have no way of knowing the truth of how he operated. Yes, I am. I have not, and will never kill. I also don't fight heroes unless I have to, and even then, I typically just web them to a wall for a few minutes until I escape. As for what I want to do with this group, I want to show that heroes don't need to pay to do good, and that they don't need a prestigious pedigree and schooling to be excellent heroes. I want to show that anyone can be a hero with enough effort. This answer impressed Momo, as Shudo observed. Much like himself, she seemed enraptured by his talk of justice, and what it meant to be a true hero. Very well. I accept your request for funding. Now, keep in mind, I can only provide a small amount of funds, which will come from my own allowance. My parents do not give me frivolous amounts of money, 
providing only a small amount of a million yen a month. At this, everyone jaws dropped, thinking along of the lines of small. That said, I would be happy to assist your crusade in any way I can. So you may count on 500,000 yen of my allowance a month for support. I cannot join you in the field, however, as I cannot afford to be recognized. I am truly sorry for that. Izuka nodded, glad she would assist them at all. He then looked at Hatsum, who was fiddling with something in her lap. Hitoshi coughed before speaking. May, it's your turn. She jumped a bit before she focused on Izuku. So you're Venom. Hitoshi here tells me you want me to make you some of my babies. At this, Izuku's and Mina's eyes widened. How shameless was this girl? Hitoshi coughed before he interjected. When May says babies, she means her gadgets. May half-heartedly glared at Hitoshi, unhappy with his referral to her pride and joy as mere gadgets. How dare you! My babies are much more than mere gadgets. They are works of art. She was shouting by the end, causing the rest of them to sweat drop at her antics. Erm right. Izuka coughed before he tried to get the conversation back on track. Yes, May, my team has strong members, but we need gear. I don't need much, due to how my quirk works, but my actions last night convinced me I could use a few helpful tools. Why should I? I don't really care that you're a vigilante or anything. But helping you could be problematic for me. Well, if you're outfitting us, we could field test your prototypes for you. Plus, you get practice for custom orders from pros when you get signed by a gear company, assuming you don't just make your own. May nodded at his logic, but still seemed unsure. I don't know. I don't know that I can trust you with my babies. They're very important to me. Hitoshi sighed, knowing what he needed to do. You know, May, if you help us out, I'll help with your countermeasure project that neutralizes my quirk. At this her eyes widened, before she leaned over the table, her face getting close to Hitoshi's. Do you mean it, Hitoshi? Before I was worried you wouldn't want to. Hitoshi was blushing slightly, given the proximity of the girl he'd come to have a crush on. Why yeah, sure. As long as you help us, I'll give you a hand. May nodded her head excitedly, and rubbed her hands together. Excellent. This is perfect. Ah ha ha Her laugh was kind of evil, and Izuka briefly pondered the repercussions of this potentially Faustian bargain. Before anyone could voice their concerns, May resumed speaking. So what do you want exactly? Izuka shared a look with Mina, Hitoshi, and Shudo. He leaned forward and pulled out the list they'd come up with in their group chat the day before. Well, I need to add my ideas to the list, but those are probably fairly simple. For Shudo, we need a fireproof bodysuit and mask that help with temperature regulation, so he isn't recognized before he formally recognizes us. For Mina, she had the idea of arm gauntlets that she can pump acid into for later use, to reduce the strain of her quirk on her pores. She also wanted an airtight bodysuit with a built-in half-mask, with protective chest plates, and sci-fi-looking helmet. Hitoshi wanted something a little more protective than his vest and taser gloves. He also wanted some boots that would up his mobility as well as some infrared goggles for rescue ops. As for myself, I wanted some night vision lenses with tactical displays that I can link to my phone and headset. And maybe some tracker darts. As May looked over the list, she didn't seem that impressed. I thought you'd need something challenging. Don't get me wrong, I'll still make it. But I reserve the right to make babies for you guys to field test later. They all shared a look and nodded. We agree. So how long would this take you, May? Izuku asked, having been the spokesman. Well, I don't know. It could take me a while. I guess I could be finished by tomorrow. May tapped her finger on her chin, wheels already turning in her head. At this, everyone besides Hitoshi sort of looked at May in awe, clearly unused to such ruthless efficiency. Tomorrow? Came Izuku's rather poised response. More or less. Yours, though, I can have finished by tonight. You just want face-fitting lenses, right? Yeah, more or less. Okay, I'll start when I get home. I'll give them to Hitoshi so he can give them to you when they're done. Izuku and Hitoshi nodded at this, while Mina checked her watch. Um, guys, it's like 7 p.m. We should probably head home for the evening. She said hesitantly, clearly not wanting to go home and study. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about anyway. Thanks for coming, guys, and welcome to the Outsiders. Izuka gave a soft smile and bid them farewell.
Mina had remained glued to his side, as the others went their separate ways. She stopped walking, and began fiddling with her skirt. Izuka noticed she'd stopped and turned to her, curious. H. Hey, Izuka? She spoke, uncharacteristically nervous. Yes, Mina? What's wrong? His voice conveyed his concern. He reached out a hand to hers. She blushed slightly, before shaking her head. I, um, I wanted to ask you two things. She paused, taking a breath before continuing. My parents wanted to have a family meet-up, with both our families. They want to do it sometime after my finals. Is, is that okay? I don't want to pressure you or anything, you know? Izuka was confused for a moment, before he laughed. That's what you're worried about. Of course I'd agree to it. You're my girlfriend, and meeting your family is an important part of my job as such, isn't it? She adopted a sheepish expression before nodding. What's the other request? Can. Can we go out on another date? Like a dinner and a movie? I just want to spend some time along together. It feels like it's been a while, and things are about to get super busy. Yet again, Izuka was touched, and flattered that spending time with him meant that much to her. He gently pulled her into a hug, before pulling away. He blushed as he realized how forward he'd been. Ah. Hey, uh, Sorry about that. We can, Mina. I'm sorry we haven't done something in a while. I guess I've been a bad boyfriend, huh? He spoke a little sadly, feeling like he neglected Mina in some way. Mina shook her head at this. No, that's not what I meant. You haven't been a bad boyfriend at all, babe. I guess I just wanted to pretend like we were normal teenagers again before things got busy. This brought a soft smile to his lips. Of course, Mina. I'd love to. She jumped in excitement and hugged him before she gave him a series of soft kisses before they resumed their walk to her train station hand in hand, lights twinkling as they walked in the night. Chapter 10 No More Heroes Izuka was sitting in his room, brainstorming ideas for new gadgets. He didn't necessarily need anything beyond what May had given him a few days prior, but it never hurt to be thinking of new ideas. A knock on his door interrupted his train of thought. Izuku? came the soft, nervous voice of Inko Midoriya. Can I come in? Izuku moved his idea pad into his desk, before he got up and allowed his mother in. Hey, Mom. What's going on? His mother fidgeted nervously, as if unsure of what exactly to say. Well, since you started high school, we haven't spent as much time together as we used to. I was hoping we could do a family dinner tomorrow night? His mother asked hopefully, her eyes watering slightly. Izuka's eyes widened, not realizing he'd inadvertently been avoiding his mom a bit. His eyes watered, and he wailed out, I'm so sorry, M.O.M., and then proceeded to hug his mother tightly, to reassure her he wasn't avoiding her deliberately. I've just been so busy with my group of friends that I hadn't realized how long it's been since we spent time together. Oh, Izuku, I'm so proud of the man you're becoming. You're making excellent grades in school, you're exercising regularly and you've got yourself a lovely girlfriend. Izuka blushed at the praise before he sweat dropped, remembering how emotional his mother was when told her baby boy had a girlfriend. Thanks, Mom. I'll make sure to come home right after school tomorrow. At this, his phone began buzzing, showing Mina was calling him. Inko saw the caller ID before she smiled and walked to the door. Oh, I'll leave you to your phone call, Izuku. Tell Mina I said hello. With that, his mother left the room which prompted Izuku to answer. Hello? He spoke into the phone, not looking forward to telling Mina they'd have to reschedule their date. Hey, baby. Just wanted to check up on you. Are you busy? Mina's cheerful voice made him smile softly, before his features shifted into a frown. You um, Mina? He began timidly. Yes, Izuku. What's wrong? She replied, worry slipping into her voice. I kind of have to cancel our date. My mom asked if I could have a family dinner tomorrow, which made me realize how little time I've spent with her between my schoolwork and patrols. He rambled nervously, not wanting to upset his girlfriend. He was confused when she chuckled into the receiver. Oh, is that all? Sheesh, I thought it was something serious. Don't even worry about it, babe. We can just go when I get back from this trip. How's that sound? She replied reassuringly. That sounds perfect. Again, I'm sorry. I was really looking forward to it. Izuku, don't worry about it, okay? 
Enjoy your dinner with your mom. I know you two are super close. It's really not a big deal. At this, Izuka sighed in relief, feeling he dodged a proverbial bullet. No spider sense required. I'm gonna make our date next week the best date you've ever had, Mina. He spoke confidently, making her laugh. That's really not necessary, babe, but I look forward to it. She yawned as she said this. I think I'm gonna go to bed now, Izuku. Don't stay up too late thinking yourself to death. Izuku's sweat dropped, shuffling his notes awkwardly, placing them under a book. Oh yeah, I won't do that. H hugs, Mina. He smiled softly, feeling so happy that his girlfriend was so understanding and generally good for him. Hugs, Izuku. Sleep well. We can have a video call before the bus leaves on Monday, okay? Izuku leaned back in his chair, looking at his ceiling with a smile. Sounds good, Mina. Good night. Sleep well. Izuku spoke softly. I always do. Night. The connection cut and Izuku decided to go to bed early tonight, taking advantage of his day off to the fullest. X. Wednesday afternoon came, and Izuku had yet to hear from Mina, Shudo, or Momo since Monday. He didn't know why, but he had a sort of anxiety about that fact. He shook his head as he walked up to his school roof wanting to talk to his partner about some ideas he'd had. As he walked up to the fence around the ledge, he stared at the city skyline. So, partner, I'd been thinking about the costume and I'd like to make some changes, to accommodate May's gear. Izuka thought to his friend, wanting to hear his feedback. All right, kid, just think about what you want to change to, and I'll make it happen. That's it. Izuka thought back incredulously. What? Were you expecting some sort of montage? Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Why does that sound ominous? Izuku shook his head, before imagining the costume he wanted. It had a hood with white spiderweb patterns over the outside of it. Next, it had his trademark grin, his nod to All Might's inspiration to his desire to be a hero. He then imagined the mask being form-fitting enough to accommodate his night vision lenses, and the chest to be reinforced to mimic body armor. His signature white spider rib cage design flowed flawlessly over the armor. His gloves had claws at the end for utility purposes, and he had forearm guards reinforced to block anything swing he couldn't dodge, but held a slot for his tracer dart launcher. He had shin guards over his legs, and his feet now resembled steel toe boots. And think Agent Venom with the hood from Ben Riley Scarlet Spider issue 1. He felt a wave of awe from his partner. Okay kid, I approve. That's pretty badass. Izuka was about to reply, when he felt phone go off. Shuto was calling him. Shuto? Shouldn't he still be at camp? He asked to no one in particular, as his moved his finger to answer. Izuku, you need to listen to me, and I need you to remain calm. Mina's in the hospital, along with the majority of our class. What? What happened? Izuka felt panic rising in him. It started on yesterday around evening. X. Shudo sat by himself, quietly eating a snack he'd brought with him to the training field. He glanced around the area he found himself in, waiting for Aizawa to return. Suddenly, a female voice rang out in his head. It was Mandalay of the Wild Pussycats, the superhero team that had been hired to assist the UA students' training. Everyone, please return to the lodge. We are under attack by the League of Villains. Do not engage them. I repeat, do not engage. And with that, the atmosphere took on a dark and foreboding tone, before the inevitable panic set in. Shuda looked around for Mina. He knew he didn't have to look out for her, but given they were eventually going to working together, he figured this would be a good time to start working on his teamwork. His brow knit in confusion when he didn't see her. X. Mina knelt down, angrily glaring at the blonde man in front of her tears building at the corner of her eyes. He was giant of man, shirtless and extra muscle fiber swirling around his body. His right eye swirled with barely restrained psychopathy. His left eye was an artificial one, the tissue around it scarred. I don't know why you're glaring at me, Gully. All I did was reunite that kid with his parents. Honestly, you should be thanking me. Mina said nothing, angry tears beginning to fall. She got up to fight. She would make this heartless bastard pay. X. Shudo searched frantically around the lodge. He was worried, anxiety gnawing at his gut. Where is she? Suddenly, 
he heard an anguished scream come from the direction he'd seen the young boy often slink off to. No one really ever bothered to follow him, figuring he wished to be alone. Shuto's face paled, before he rushed towards the scream, his eyes sliding propelling him towards his destination with precision and speed. As he drew closer, the prevalent feeling of dread grew ever stronger. When he landed, his eyes widened in shock. Mina lay beaten on the ground in front of a looming figure, bleeding from her head, her horn weight horn. She had two dash Shudo felt sick to his stomach when he realized what this meant. Oh, another one? Maybe you'll put up more fight than the girlie here, or that kid I killed. The man spoke almost, jovially. The swirling feeling in Shuto's stomach intensified. He couldn't do anything for the boy, but he could save Mina. He owed that much to Izuku. Judging by the extra muscle fiber he's got, I'd probably take him down on my own. Right now, my best bet is immobilize him long enough with ice quirk to get away with Mina. Muscles have difficulty contracting in the cold. With that thought, Shido set his plan in motion. X. Izuku rushed to the hospital where Mina and the rest of her class were at while they recovered. He landed in alley next to the hospital, before his venom suit receded. He ran into the lobby, only faintly registering the cries of, No running! As he entered, he overheard some screaming that had a sort of, pathetic tone to it. He ignored it for the moment, looking for Shuto, who he spotted staring blankly at a vending machine. Shuto? He jumped a bit, before turning to face Izuku. Shuto, are you okay? Shuto sighed and recounted the exact events and occurrences. He explained how he'd saved Mina, but had inadvertently allowed the muscular villain to go on a rampage. Several students in class 1A were injured by him. One student was apparently down to five arms. One had his tail broken in multiple places. Those two statements confused Izuku, but it wasn't his primary concern at the moment. Apparently, the League had kidnapped two students and one of their hosts, and injured a dozen others from the entire group of UA students. Izuku put a hand on Shuto's shoulder. He opened his mouth to speak, but it was Shuto who spoke first. I feel like I failed them. I saved Mina, but at what cost? Izuku tightened his grip on Shuto's shoulder causing him to look at Izuku. Shuto, you guys were outmatched and outgunned. Though I am confused as to why there are so many injuries. From the brief discussions I've had with Mina, it sounded like you guys had a lot of strong quirks. At this statement, Shuto's eyes darkened. It doesn't matter how strong our quirks are if we aren't allowed to use them. Anger welled up in Izuku. They hadn't been allowed to fight back? Then it was a damn miracle that there had only been a single death, tragic though it was. This, more than anything, has led me to believe that professional heroism has lost its way, or at least, the way we train our future heroes. I'm not saying we could have defeated all of the League members, but we could have at least stalled them until we got help from the pros that were there. Shuto took a breath here. Shuto, I don't even know what to say. You guys just went into a hell you weren't prepared for. But how did the villains know where you guys were? I don't know. We didn't even arrive at our destination. Supposedly, the location itself was a tightly kept secret. We were supposed to train at a lodge for quirk training. Well, before the incident anyway. That got both Shuto and Izuka thinking, both of them coming to the same conclusion. Then, it sounds like Yue has a leak somewhere. We could and probably should figure it out. But right now, I'm going to go see Mina. Can you compile a list of students who did not sustain serious injury in either the USJ attack or this one? Shuto nodded in confirmation. Okay. I'm going to check on Mina. We'll talk later, okay man? I'll show you to her room. She's pretty upset, so be patient with anything she might say, okay? Of course. X. Mina was laying in her hospital bed, eyes focused on something outside her window. Izuka quietly slipped into her room, before taking a seat beside her bed. Hey, Mina. Instantly, she turned to face him, eyes brimming with tears. Izuka. She tried to speak, but her sobs prevented her from saying more. Izuka bit back his shyness and enveloped her in a tight hug. She reciprocated instantly, and the tears fell even harder. He killed him. Right in front of me. The kid couldn't have been more than six, Izuku. He smashed him into the ground until his little body was broken and bloody. I tried to stop him, but I was too tired. I couldn't produce strong enough acid to burn him, not when I'd been straining them all day. My hands still hurt. 
At this, Izuka took one of her hands into his, rubbing gentle circles into her palms, trying to soothe the pain she was in. I wasn't good enough, and I almost got myself killed. She croaked out. All I could think about was how my death was going to affect you. If Shudo hadn't dragged me to safety, I'd be dead right now. She clung to him, like a lifeline, afraid to let go. Izuku, I love you. Instantly, his world slowed to a crawl. Had he heard her correctly? You love me? At this, he felt her nod her head, which was still buried in his chest. I do. I was so scared I was going to die before I could tell you. I don't care that society disproves of what you do, Izuku. I don't care whether you have a quirk or not. I don't care about anything right now except you knowing that I love you, Izuku Midoriya. Izuku's face turned redder and redder and he clutched her tighter at her confession. It was so genuine and heartfelt that he couldn't help himself. He teared up, showing he was his mother's child. I love you too, Mina. When Shudo told me you were in the hospital, my mind went blank. Nothing else mattered to me. I rushed here, in full venom outfit. Anyone who tried to stop me be damned. My body moved without thinking. I just needed to know that you were okay. He pressed his lips into the top of her head before brushing a hand through her hair. He froze as he did so, when he realized her left horn was missing. Mina! He shook furiously, anger filling him to the core. To know that someone alive held such a vast capacity for cruelty ate at him. But he knew now wasn't the time. She trembled, obviously still shaken up. He did it anyway, Izuku. I begged him to stop, but he didn't care. He just laughed, and snapped it between his fingers. I blacked out from the pain. When I woke up, I was already in the hospital. Mina, I won't let him hurt you again. I promise you that. Mina looked up from her perch into Azuka's eyes, seeing something that she didn't see very often, confidence. Confidence that he would protect her. She leaned up and gave him a soft kiss, which he returned gladly. A few long moments later, they stopped, and Azuka pulled away. Hold on, I need to call my mom and let her know what happened, and then I need to go talk to Shudo but I'll be back in a few minutes. He let her go, before getting up and walking out of her room. He didn't see Shudo, so he texted him. After getting the room number he needed, Izuka found Shudo sitting next to Momo's hospital bed. She was asleep, and he was silently keeping watch over her peaceful slumber. It didn't escape Izuka's notice that Shudo had one of her hands in his. He noticed someone walking into the room in the glass reflection, causing him to turn around and face Izuku. We need to talk. After extracting himself from Momo's grip and ensuring her comfort by placing a blanket over her, Shudo motioned for Izuku to follow him. As they walked, Shudo spoke out. How was she? Izuku regarded Shudo a moment before replying. She's as good as can be expected. Shudo nodded at this, expecting that to be the case. What about Momo? Shudo's face darkened at the question. She was seriously hurt during the incident. I don't know exactly what happened, though. All right. Tell me the rest of what happened. Izuku's expression spoke of barely restrained fury at the injustice of it all. Where were the rest of the pros? Even if it had been a secret, only sending two pros for such a large number of students was naive. He shook himself. Now wasn't the time for such thoughts. He needed to gather information before he could decide his next move. Shudo took a deep breath. Do you want to know everything or the highlights? Tell me about the villains you encountered, as well as your kidnapped classmates. I only encountered the muscular guy, but all he told me he was new. That either means he was recruited for his power, or he was the weakest one there. However, I don't think the latter is the case. What makes you say that? Well, apparently, one of my classmates took out one before he was taken. His quirk apparently went ballistic according to an eyewitness and took out a villain. Additionally, a few students from our rival class also managed to take out another member of the League. At this Shuto adopted an amused expression. You have a fan in that class. His name is Tetsutetsu. He claims you're super manly. His words. Izuka wasn't sure how to take that at the moment. At seeing Izuka's expression, Shuto coughed before pressing on. Apparently, there was a girl with them. She seemed obsessed with blood and friendship, believe it or not. From what I gathered about her behavior, she seemed to suffer from some form of psychopathy, as well as severe delusions. 
she injured two female students in our class before withdrawing. There were reports that the two students who were taken were taken by someone calling himself. Mr. Compress. This is a lot to process. If only I'd been there. Shudo shook his head. I'm not finished, Izuku. I personally saw a villain with a fire cork fight with the two teachers who were present. You probably know my teachers by reputation. Eraserhead and Blood King? Izuku nodded in affirmation, causing Shudo to press onward. As for who was kidnapped, it was two of my classmates, Katsuki Bakugo and Tokoi Mifumikage. Izuku's face paled, but he remained calm, as he had to. That's pretty much all I know right now. Izuka looked down, gears turning wildly in his head. They could track them down with the information they had, but then they'd have to contend with the entire League of Villains most likely. Still, Izuku didn't want this attack to go unpunished. Not just because they'd hurt his girlfriend. No, this couldn't go unpunished because lives were on the line and that would set a precedent. If Yue wouldn't take action, then the outsiders would. Izuka slipped back into Mina's room as quietly as he could, not sure if she is asleep or not. He saw her watching something on her phone. She jumped a bit when she noticed him. Geez, Izuku. Give a girl some warning, would you? She spoke in an exasperated manner. She looked at him and noticed he had an uncharacteristically serious look on his face. I'm going to start training you guys. I don't want you to ever feel that helpless again. So please, let me help you, Mina. He took her hand in his, trying to massage her sore palms a bit. She groaned a bit, before trying to reply. Man, Izuku. You really know how to spoil a girl. Offering to train her to kick ass and massaging her sore spots. Definitely a keeper right here. She spoke teasingly, her eyes alight with amusement. Izuku was now flustered, both from her noises and from her teasing. And Mina, please. Izuku stammered out, trying to keep them on topic. So what do you say? I accept, of course. It's not like I have much choice. I need to be stronger. He smiled at her, but she noticed his eyes kept being drawn to her missing horn, an uncharacteristic frown on his face. She sighed before a proverbial light went off in her head. You know, Izuku. She began slyly. Look at the bright side. The bright side? He answered, confused as to where she was going. Yeah. After that makeover, I'm way less horny now. Izuku went supernova scarlet at this. Mina! O-N-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y. Chapter 11. Much Ado About Noma. Izuku had run around frantically, trying to get everything together for his master plan. Basket? Check. The best of admittedly awful hospital because technically patients aren't supposed to have outside food? Check-ish. Kid, you're really overthinking this. We both know you could do practically any kind gesture, and she'd squeeze you like some kind of plushie. I know, but I have to make up for missing our date. Izuka thought back to his partner frantically. IT has T.O. be perfect as Izuka's internal freakout continued unabated. He resumed packing the basket with whatever the hell you'd call this slop. It looked like chicken and dumplings, and... Yet, he couldn't be sure, because it didn't smell like chicken and dumplings. Kid, she's gonna get discharged before you finish if you keep going this slow. Also, you're muttering. A lot. Please stop. Your head gets crowded when you mutter. Izuka jumped a bit, before doubling his pace, finishing the packing the food and the blankets, before grabbing his phone with his headphones. He wanted it to be perfect. Well as perfect as the situation allowed. He exited the hospital's cafeteria, having been allowed to bring a basket to use for his idea in. Operation, cheer up Mina. He quickly found himself outside her room, before he knocked on the door. Come in, came her energetic voice, although it did sound a little forced. Izuku opened her door, walking in, basket in hand. Izuku? She asked quizzically, upon noticing noticing the basket, she grinned. Well, if it isn't Little Red Riding Hood. And Mina Dash. Izuka stammered before composing himself. I've come to take you on a picnic on the hospital roof. Mina's eyebrows shot into her hairline. Whatever she expected, that clearly wasn't it. A picnic? You seemed down, so I wanted to do something to cheer you up. He took another calming breath. I wanted us to have a picnic and watch a movie. It's not the same as our original dinner date but I wanted to make it up to you for missing it. He finished in a bitter tone. Izuku. 
she yet again found herself in awe by his thoughtfulness. For all her teasing she put him through, he really did make her feel like a princess sometimes. Okay, but first, you have to help me up. Her eyes flashed with mischief, but unfortunately for our fluffy green friend, he didn't notice. She made a beckoning gesture with her left hand index finger, prompting him to move towards her. As he moved to lift her arm, she quickly pulled him down onto her bed. Min MMPH! She locked lips with him in a searing kiss, pouring as much of her feelings into the kiss as she could, her hands on his rapidly heating cheeks. A few moments later, Izuka was reunited with oxygen, his eyes essentially forming swirls. W what was that for? Izuka managed to get out in between filling his lungs. For being my fluffy freckled boyfriend. I love you, Izuku. There they were again. For simple little words that lit up his whole world. I love you too, Mina. Now, come on, before the food gets cold. Izuku had spread out the blanket on the ground next to one of the walls of the staircase, allowing them to have a backrest to support themselves. Izuku quickly pulled up the movie he'd wanted them to watch. It was an older American movie that was about a princess bride. He offered Mina a headphone bud, and she quickly snuggled into him, resting her head on his shoulder, quietly munching on some crackers that came with her, chicken dumplings. She found the movie hilarious, particularly the man who constantly yelled, inconceivable. When the credits rolled, she closed her eyes, enjoying the rhythmic beating of Azuka's heart. Hey, baby? He glanced down at her. Yes, Mina? Thank you, for everything. At this, Izuku didn't say anything. He did, however, gently lift Mina's chin, making her look up at him with those golden eyes of hers. He then brought his lips to hers, meeting in a tender kiss. They remained on the roof for quite some a while, just enjoying the company. X. Bakugo awoke to dull lights shining in his, the smell of alcohol prevalent in the ambient air. He tried to rub his eyes, before realizing he couldn't move. God damn it, did I lose the other one too? Before he quickly realized he'd merely been restrained. Humph. <laughs> he noticed he was surrounded by individuals that he assumed to be members that had attacked him at the camp. Some he recognized, some he didn't. His attention was focused on the figure looking at him most intently. Welcome to our humble abode, Bakugo. My name's Tamira. We have a proposition for you. A teenager with pale blue hair spoke to him. Dobby, release his restraints. At this, a guy with burnt and discolored skin looked back at Tamira incredulously. You can't be serious. He could attack us. Dobby responded, not seeing the point in reducing leverage. It's fine. Tamira waved off his concerns. We want him seen as an equal. Besides, if he does, there's plenty of us here to hand it. Dobby looked at Bakugo a moment, before scoffing, and turning to a different member. It was a man wearing a white mask a black body suit with a few white lines on the shoulders. The man in question sighed, before moving to Bakugo. I apologize for such forceful methods, but this was not an accidental kidnapping. One of the others spoke, while twice just worked on his binds. Bakugo just listened as the villain spoke, a plan already working in his head. He tuned out a majority of what they were saying. He didn't give a damn about these wannabe villains. Listen, I don't give a damn about your speeches. You prattled on and on, but damn if you don't bore the hell out of me. I lost my arm because of heroes. I may not idolize All Might the way I did before, but why the hell should I join you? Bakugo spat out. He had to make this look good. No one would know what he was doing, and probably never would. He didn't give a damn about redemption or anything, but All Might would use the tools he had to find a way to win, right? Well, for starters, we can give you back your arm. X. Izuka walked out the hospital, knowing what he needed to do. Kid, you sure you want to do this? I don't have a choice, Venom. This guy is no joke, and if I don't stop him, someone else is going to get hurt, or worse. Izuka thought back to his partner, determination setting features. He casually strolled to the nearest alleyway, before he placed two lenses over his eyes, and two bands around his wrists. Then, his form shifted. Black ooze seeped from under his clothes before overtaking his form. The chest plate was the first form, his white spider bleeding into the black frame. From there, his legs and arms shifted, the sleeves and arm guards molded out of the ooze, followed by his clawed fingertips. His leggings formed, before leg guards formed around the bodysuit, with his boots shifting last. 
Lastly, the area around his neck rippled, creeping up around his head, forming the hood and the bottom half of his mask, the grin ever-present. Before he finished, he heard someone moving behind him, causing him to turn around. Shudo Todoroki stared back at his friend, knowing what he was about to do. Do you even know where to begin, Izuku? Came his reasonable question. No. But that's never stopped us from trying before. Izuku's voice was distorted with a second voice overlapping his. Then allow me to make a suggestion. Try heading to UA and tailing Mr. Aizawa. I doubt the teachers, for all their shortcomings, would just leave Bakugo captured. Hmm, it's not much, but it's a lead. He turned his back to Shudo, the rest of his mask forming under his hood. If nothing else, someone at UA probably knows something. Oh, and Izuku? The new look suits you. At this, Venom turned enough to show a partial grin under the hood, before he shot up into the air. Katsuki warped along with Tamura to another unknown location. He then looked at the creepy dude in front of him. He wasn't in the mood for games. He needed to get what he needed and get away from these guys. He may not have aspired to be a hero anymore, but he would show them he didn't need a damn license to save people. Turning from his thoughts, he focused back on the guy in front of him. He had a black cloth mask over his entire face, and tubes sticking out around his neck. The man turned to face them, before speaking in an oddly warm tone. Ah, my dear Tamira. Welcome. How may your humble teacher assist you? He spoke jovially, before he took notice of Bakugo. And you must be young Bakugo. Welcome to you as well. Who the hell are you? Katsuki knew if he acted too cooperative they'd see through him. He needed them to get set up as a vigilante. He'd enjoy coming back here and knocking the smirks off their damn faces. Ah, uh, such boldness. You may call me, all for one. He spoke in that same oddly warm tone, which began to send shivers up Bakudo's spine. I can give you special training that will help your already formidable skills. Would you like that? But first we need to fix your arm. Allow me. As he spoke, he put a hand on Katsuki's forehead, his eyes widened, before they dulled considerably. And now that we have him, we can begin. Place him in the apparatus, while I decide what quirks we should give him. At this, Tamura nodded to his teacher, obeying obediently. Ah, uh, one more thing, my dear boy. Take this. All for one placed a small jump drive in Tamura's hand. Tamura looked confused, before he slipped it in his pocket. When the time comes, you'll know why I gave you that, my pupil. X. Venom stood on a rooftop above the entrance to Yue, the night air crisp and cool. He glanced around for any obvious security measures, but upon seeing there were none on the upper levels, he crossed the border into the school's campus. He didn't hear any alarms go off, so he zipped himself up to a roof, and began looking for Eraserhead. He spotted the man inside one of the school buildings, as Aizawa exited his classroom. He shuffled tiredly down the hall, before he went into the doors marked. Teacher's Lounge Izuka couldn't get a view from this side, so he quickly moved to the building that Aizawa was in, and climbed up the wall, before positioning himself outside the window. He froze a bit, as the window opened, with Aizawa glancing at the various rooftops, before closing it almost completely. He'd left enough of a crack for sound to pass through unimpeded. This allowed Izuka to hear every word spoken. He didn't get a chance to look inside, but he heard several voices. So we're all here then? One spoke. Get on with it. We know why we're here. We just haven't talked why I should be here. Came the annoyed voice of Endeavor. He sounded like it was filtered though. We must rescue young Bakudo and young Tokoemi. This is not negotiable. Venom stiffened at this voice in particular, All Might's voice involuntarily reminding him of his rejection. Kid, he missed out. You're a fine hero. I'm proud to call you my partner. And I know Peter would be proud of you carrying on his legacy. Venom nodded at this, before focusing on his spy graft. We think we have the possible locations for the villain's hideout, but it's not 100%. There's been rumors of a lot of strange activities, so we've been investigating the area for months. There's also been reportings of individuals matching the descriptions of several League members hanging around a bar in these areas. If they were going to take Bakugo anywhere, that's where he'd be. A stern voice spoke through what sounded like a telephone speaker. It's not a bad setup either. A bar doesn't stick out in terms of people coming and going, and they could claim it's just a local hangout. A cool voice spoke out, analyzing the information provided. 
it'd be a rather logical deception. So let's move out. We don't have time to waste. At this, there was shuffling of movement, before things got silent. The window opened again, and the face of Eraserhead poked out and stared at Venom. So I assume you heard all that? Good. Saves time. Listen. I know you by reputation. The way I see it, you haven't done anything illegal besides operate without a license. Anything else you've done was heroic, in a sense. So I'm going to leave it up to you to decide what you do with the information I just let you over here. This conversation? Didn't happen. Before Venom could even say anything, the window closed in his face. So, we should probably follow the heroes then. Since he clearly isn't going to tell us where to go. X. Venom followed the heroes on the rooftops, making sure to stay out of their sight. He didn't want to risk engaging until they would have to choose between him and the villains. His eyes lingered on All Might as he walked with determination at the head of the group. In another life, we would be fighting proudly beside him. Venom mused wistfully, before shaking his head. Now was not the time for such thoughts. He had to take out Muscular. He wasn't sure the pros could handle him, with the exception of All Might and Endeavor. He couldn't chance any of them escaping. With that in mind, he continued on. X. After what seemed like an eternity, the heroes and the police arrived outside the bar in question. Venom watched as All Might nodded to his fellow pros, before walking up to one of the building's walls. He drew his fist back. Despite being hurt by the man, Izuka still could feel the excitement of seeing the number one hero use his signature move. He saw the pro edge shot walk up to the front door with a crowd of armored police officers. He firmly knocked on the door, calling out, Hello? Pizza delivery. Whatever sarcastic remark Venom was going to make to himself, he froze when All Might charged up his fist, before his epic shout of, Detroit smash, right before he busted through the wall, catching the villains unaware. Okay, we should definitely take notes on how to make an entrance like that. Venom didn't reply to his partner. Instead, observing as the pros effortlessly neutralized the entire league in a matter of moments. Between Kamui Wood's binding of the criminals, to the agile old man who knocked out one of them that looked like a burned victim, it was over as quickly as it began. However, the pros quickly became concerned. From his position, Venom could just make out the question from All Might's mouth. Where's young Bakudo and Tokoyami? Venom saw his chance, and jumped into the building, landing in the midst of the heroes. All Might. Venom stated simply. All Might was surprised by sudden appearance of the country's number one vigilante. Why are you here? The symbol of peace spoke firmly, clearly on edge from the variety of factors that made this situation problematic. Welp, after all, we are the friendly neighborhood Venom. He paused a moment. That sounded less stupid in my head. By the way, huge fan. You still didn't answer question. But if you're here to help us, I won't say no to an extra pair of hands. Just don't get in our way. Man, do you not watch the news? We've taken down more criminals than Morningwood over there. This prompted an indignant hey from Kamui. When all this is over with, expect a vista. At this, Venom walked up to All Might. They locked eyes before Venom spoke again. As for why we are here, we have a score to settle with these fine upstanding citizens. As he said this, he gestured sarcastically to the bound villains. But since you seem everything in hand, we'll be going now. As Venom began to move away, before his spider sense went ballistic, more so than it had ever gone before. He clutched his head, before frantically looking around. All the villains were out cold. None of the heroes were moving to stop him. That's when he noticed it. The slight ripple in the air above each villain. Everyone move! Venom shot a sweeping tendril at the villains, the first of which being muscular, in an attempt to stop whatever the hell was happening. However, he was only successful in nabbing only his first target. Whatever the hell that stuff was, it had enveloped the other villains. Well, except Muscular, who'd been blasted out of a wall and out of Kamui's grip. Venom jumped after him, and landed next to his prone form. Suddenly, more ripples formed across the air, and from them, Noma crawled out. As this happened, Venom slammed his fist into the car beside him before screaming at the sky. Why is it always these goddamn creatures? CH-12, fool. You lack depth perception. Venom was getting frustrated. Yet again, he found himself fighting Nomu. 
This commotion caused by the fighting had attracted the media outlets typical for things of this nature. As B punched out yet another one, he muttered to no one in particular. This is half our damn job. We wanted to be a hero slash vigilante. We didn't realize that included fighting B-movie quirk Frankenstein's. Venom paused, punching another Noma. Well, Frankenstein's monster, since was a scientist. A common misconception, really. And that's another thing. How many of these damn things do they plan on making? And how has this not sparked a nationwide panic? Some of the nearby cops were looking on incredulously, as the vigilante kept on fighting as the muttering continued. Two officers overheard his ranting and looked at each other incredulously. Dude, is he muttering to himself? One asked the other. How long is this gonna go on? Especially while doing those acrobatic moves and fighting? They asked back, equally unsure of what they were witnessing. It just seems like the League of Villains' default solution to any situation that arises is huh. Let's throw a bunch of freaky monsters the problem. That's clearly the most logical thing to do. Venom ranted in a snarky tone, while casually throwing a Nomu into a car. It just annoys us is all. Because all their evil plans seem to hinge on these damn things. Venom looked around, realizing that at some point during his musing that All Might was nowhere to be seen. He was about to ask the cops about that when his spider sense went haywire. He leaned to the side just in time for a literal mass of muscle tissue to pass where his head had been moments prior. Oh. You're awake. Joy. Venom commented dryly, regarding muscular with irritation. How was your nap, buddy? Have any nice dreams? Muscular just grinned psychotically, seeming to get more and more excited by Venom handiwork as he glanced around. I know you. You're that Venom guy. I've wanted to kill you for a while. Oh, Mr. Muscles, you make us feel like the prettiest girl at the ball. Venom spoke with mock adoration, before he decked Muscular in the face with a sucker punch, sending him skidding back a few inches away. Nice love tap. But it's gonna take way more to stop me. Muscular commented, bloodlust seeping into his voice. Oh, we know. That was just to say hello. And this? This is how we say goodbye dot. At this, Izuku shot a tendril at the damaged wall behind Muscular, and yanked it down onto the beefy villain. The wall just seemed to break around him pathetically. You realize there's no way that put him down for good, right? Obviously. But it sounded cool though. You got me there, kid. Venom then examined the rubble pile, patiently waiting for Muscular to emerge. The pile began to move, before a huge blob-like form of Muscular stood up his face showing his boredom. Seriously, is that all? You're starting to bore me as much as those two kids a few weeks ago. At this, Venom stiffened, his eyes narrowing at Muscular. Care to repeat what you just said, CrossFit? Muscular laughed, before grinning at Venom. You should have been there, man. This six-year-old tried to fight me because I killed his parents. So I did the merciful thing and reunited them, but then this pink bitch tried to fight me too. So I crushed one of her horns. Would have crushed some limbs too, but some scarred prick stole her away and froze me in the process. Talk about a cold shoulder. The more muscular spoke, the more Venom's form shook with anger. Then after she got away, I just roamed around, toying with the campers. This kangaroo kid put up a decent fight, so I snapped his tail. That was fun. But then this short purple kid stuck himself to my fist. So then I just punched a tree until he came off should heard his screams. They were delightful. Venom stood there a moment, not saying anything. Izuku's anger had finally gotten the better of him, before succumbed to the aggression that the suit invoked. His eyes narrowed, his form shook, and all that Izuku saw before everything went black was Muscular's face before he launched himself at the villain. They continued trading blows, before Muscular used one of his massive arms to batter him away. Now this is a fight. Come on then. Show me what you've got! Muscular yelled, excitement reaching pinnacle levels by this point before he ran to hit Venom again. Venom ignored his spider sense, his mind not even recognizing the sensation through the cloud of rage, and ran to meet Muscular's charge. Venom jumped over a massive fist and lashed a kick at Muscular's head. This dazed him, allowing Venom to to grab an arm and throw him into a car. This barely phased Muscular, who then charged at and rammed a fist into Venom's face. This shook him from his trance, allowing to refocus on the task at hand. Where are Katsuki Bakugo and the other kidnapping victims? 
Venom demanded, barely restraining his righteous fury at this point. The question confused Muscular. Bakugo? Who the hell is Bakugo? I'm just here to kill things. He paused. When they let me. Luckily for me, they aren't here, so I can do whatever the hell I want. As for the kidnapping victims, why the hell would you care? You're a vigilante. Our reasons do not concern you, villain. Now. Where. Is. Bakugo? I don't still don't know who you're talking about, but the League was very interested in the blonde one. That derailed Venom's entire train of thought. Muscular took advantage of this, and grabbed Venom by the throat, before roaring and running towards a wall, using Venom's body as a battering ram to slam through them. The desks, counters, and walls did little to slow Muscular's charge, and with every extreme redecorating attempt that involved his body, the remaining embers of rage fading away, allowing him to calm down enough to think of a plan. As they crashed into an empty office space, he shot webbing into Muscular's face, blinding the giant's charge. Next, he shot a tendril at the wall in front of Muscular at foot level, forcing him to trip mid-charge and falling, releasing Venom in the process. Venom took a moment to gain some distance between themselves, jumping onto the ceiling, and staring down at Muscular, who was pulling himself out of a destroyed desk. He took this momentary lapse in action to analyze the villain in front of him. He increases his strength by forming auxiliary muscle tissue on top of his arms in order to generate more force in his punches. But it seems that the weight of the tissue slows his punches, as well as his mobility. Venom jumped from the ceiling back to the floor, avoiding a desk thrown his way. It stands to reason that he'd have to stop packing on tissue at some point, or else he'd never hit anything. Muscular growled a bit, before he yelled. Boy, you sure do like to stop and think, little man. Stop stalling and fight me. Even those kids fought with more courage than you. Venom bristled at this, and shook with raw anger once more. You son of a bitch dash. Before he could succumb to rage again, Venom stopped himself and shook his head, avoiding muscular bait. No, getting angry takes away the greatest tool we have, our mind. The one weapon you can't hope to beat. Before muscular could say or do anything in response, Venom rushed at him once more, engaging in a dance of death with the oversized villain, waiting for an opening. Muscular swung his arms furiously, trying to bludgeon Venom into a pile of mulch. His attempts remained unsuccessful beyond some glancing blows. Venom looked around the destroyed office, and shot a tendril at a water jug, and yanked it towards Muscular's face. Seriously, your damn tricks are getting on my nerves, you stupid bug! Muscular batted away the container from his face only to realize Venom was now inside his guard. Venom grabbed the bulky man around the waist, before using his own enhanced strength to pick the villain up and throw him out the window. Muscular soared through the air, before crashing into the second floor of the building across the street. I'm not a bug, you meathead. I'm an arachnid. Venom leapt after him, and landed in the hole caused by the impact of his throw. Before he could attack Muscular, he heard an explosion in the background. What the hell? Mina, Shudo, and Momo were gathered in Momo's room, watching the fights unfold on live TV. Mina's body language indicated she was extremely nervous. This is absolutely incredible. We have not one, but two titanic fights happening right now. The symbol of peace is locked in combat with an unnamed villain, who seems to equal him. The news anchor paused to catch his breath, before continuing. And as if that wasn't enough, we have the country's notorious vigilante Venom fighting a member of the League of Villains. Mina bit her lip worriedly as her eyes remained glued to the screen. This is a guy who has killed at least three people, including two pro heroes. She hated feeling this helpless. She knew how good Azuka was at his job. But she still worried that he might not be able to overcome muscular, anxiety building up inside her. Before she could voice her concerns, her attention snapped back to the TV. Oh no! It seems Muscular has grabbed Venom! She threw a hand over her mouth in horror as she watched Muscular rush and slam Azuka through a building wall, disappearing from the camera's view. I hope Venom is okay. He may be unlicensed, but one can at least agree that he's no villain. Suddenly, the form of Muscular shot out of the building's window and into a wall of an adjacent building. The camera showed the form of Venom quickly follow in pursuit. Mina sighed in momentary relief before an explosion sounded through the camera feed. The cameraman panned the view towards the direction of the all-might fight, 
showing a huge smoke cloud in the distance. We now move our feed back to the fight between All Might and the unnamed villain. You know, your quirk is super unimpressive when you really think about it. Venom spoke in a casual tone, trying to get under muscular skin. All it does is add muscle. Which means you can't add too much, or you're too bulky to move. We are literally the worst possible opponent for you. First, we have two eyes, which means our weakness isn't depth perception. Two, you're slower than us and less flexible. Three, we are smarter. To sum this up, you were beaten before the fight even began. At this point, Muscular lost his cool, roaring in anger, before rushing Venom. Sidestepping out harm's way, Venom grabbed Muscular's right arm, before using it as leverage to kick into Muscular's side. From, he shot two tendrils behind Muscular, and attached them to Muscular's shoulder. Using before his position and the tendrils, he then proceeded to dislocate Muscular's right shoulder, causing the villain to yell in pain. And now you're down an arm and eye. Face it, beefcake. You lost. Now you can go quietly, or we can keep kicking the crap out you. Either way, it's our win. You think you're so smart, don't you bastard? Muscular spat, before staggering to his feet. He receded the muscle tissue on the useless arm, before expanding the tissue on his left. What do you say we end it with one punch? Winner take all? Venom tapped his chin for a moment, before he shot a tendril at Muscular's bad arm, and yanked. Muscular screamed, before falling to his knees again. Venom closed the distance and kicked him in the head, knocking him out cold, causing his muscles to recede. Bold of you to assume I'd let you go free. He then hefted Muscular onto his shoulder, to take him to the cops. Venom then glanced around around, and became aware of how much damage their fight had caused. He felt a bead of sweat on his brow. He glanced the unconscious mass on his shoulder. I hope you realize that you're paying for all this, Muscular. X. Mina watched as Venom emerged from the building, with Muscular unconscious on his shoulder. He looked up at the cameraman and gave a thumbs up, before he tossed Muscular's unconscious form down into the street, then jumping down as well. He then shot several tendrils around the villain, effectively tying him up for the cops. He then lifted Muscular's form and walked over to the cops. And there you have it, folks. Venom has emerged victorious. He defeated the villain Muscular on his own. A feat many pros would be hard-pressed to do. He is now walking towards the police. The screen showed Venom handing off the unconscious villain. He turned around to leave, but apparently the police chief called out to him. He turned around, only to see the chief extend a hand to him. Venom regarded him a moment, before shaking the chief's hand. I do not believe my eyes, folks. The chief of the Mustafa police has just shaken hands with Venom. Does this mean Venom is truly a force for good? And what does this mean for his status as a vigilante? Whatever the case, we now return to All Might's battle. Elsewhere. The symbol of peace stood, and pointed at the camera, his triumph over All for One still fresh. Now, it's your turn. Tamira and Kurojiri sat, watching the live feed of the arrest of All for One. The mastermind villain was being led away by the police, and taken into a transport. This made Tamura agitated, but then he remembered something. Kiro Jairi. Tamura spoke in an agitated tone. Bring me a laptop. I have to look at something. Kiro Jairi did as he was asked, and handed Tamura the computer. Tamura then slotted the drive into the computer, which prompted a video to come up. Ah, my dear Tamura. If you are witnessing this, then it means I was defeated by all might. Fret not, for while my time in the spotlight may be over, yours has just begun. In the video, All for One clasped his hands. For such an occasion, I ensured the creation of your last piece would continue unabated regardless of my direct involvement. You wish for it to be your final chess piece, so I look forward to seeing your next move. Remember this, Tamira, that even if you fail, you are still my dear pupil. Remember the lessons that I have given you, and you will be a splendid leader. Tamura smiled at his master's words. He then cast his eyes to the glass case labeled Special Project, and the form that was floating in it, already transitioning into its glorious final form. You see this, Kira girl? It's as teacher said. We've skipped creating a final boss, and went straight for a raid boss. Tamura spoke ominously, eyes alight with madness and rage. It had been two weeks since the final battle between All Might and All for One, ending with All Might's forced retirement and All for One's incarceration. 
With the cork stealing villain behind bars, the only thing the symbol of peace had to worry about was the power vacuum caused by his absence. Tashinori Yagi, formerly known as All Might, had been busy with teacher duties, since Yue was now having certain student groups move into special constructed dorms in order to better protect the students. Today was the move-in day, and he watched as several 1A students moved their belongings into the dorm. He was about to leave when he spotted movement on an adjacent rooftop and saw a figure land. When he realized who it was, he headed to the rooftop to have a chat with them. Then him stood on the UA rooftop. He made himself as visible as possible for anyone in the teacher's lounge, so even if All Might wasn't in there, someone would eventually notice him and come up to demand an explanation. Are we doing the right thing, partner? Izuka thought to his symbiote. I think you're taking a big risk. I need to do this so I can move on with my life, Venom. Izuku explained to his partner. I get it. You aren't holding a grudge per se, but you are definitely not okay with what happened. Izuka sighed, but before he could reply, the door to the roof opened, and the skeletal figure of Tashinori Yagi emerged from the doorway. You know, when you said you'd be by the visit, I thought you meant you'd jump me on my way home or something. The former symbol of peace commented dryly. You know, you are the reason why we act. Venom stated as if he hadn't heard all might. In fact, it was because of your words to us that we had to prove you wrong. Tashinori grew confused. What do you mean by my words? We never met before that night where I lost my powers. At this, Venom sighed. We forget that you did not meet us in this form. Allow us to jog your memory. At this, Venom turned to face the symbol of peace, showing that his mask was gone, and only his hood was in place. Tashinori's eyes widened in shock. You. You're Venom. But how? You were quirkless. At this, Izuka chuckled. We figured you would say that. But we found our own way to be a hero, our own quirk. Kid, I looked for you after the accident. I actually visited your apartment several times to apologize. I wanted you to be my successor. At this, Izuka's face shifted quickly into shock, before settling on anger. So you think because you intended to apologize that we would have jumped at the chance? Perhaps in another life, but you heard us, all might. We were at the lowest we had ever been. We idolized you. And yet you told us we couldn't be a hero. If we hadn't gotten our quirk that day, we might not have made it to this day. All might's eyes widened, not realizing that his words had affected the young man so deeply. Our whole lives, we were looked down on for being quirkless. We were told that we would never be a hero. Even though that was all we'd ever wanted. Our best friend turned into our biggest source of torment. He even told us to jump from a building, in hopes that we might get a quirk in our next life. The more Tashinori heard, the worse he felt. You can't possibly imagine how it feels to be quirkless, and pitted your whole life. I'd know better than you think, kid. Tashinori locked eyes with Izuku, his statement confusing the fluffy-haired boy. I was quirkless too, once upon a time. At Izuka's incredulous expression, he decided to elaborate. My quirk was actually given to me. I can't say too much, but you of all people not all quirks are individual. My teacher gave me one, as her teacher had done for her. She was impressed by my desire to bring peace to the world, despite being quirkless. So, yeah kid, I would know something about being quirkless. However, instead of calming the boy, they had the opposite effect. Izuka was pissed. So that makes what you said all the more contemptible, all might. Your words were hypocritical. If a quirkless boy was able to become the symbol of peace, then why couldn't we? We were no different than you were. And yet you told us we could not. You spoke of your teacher. What would she have said to you if she'd heard what you said to me? If she had told what you told me? Tashinori's looked at the ground, knowing that Venom had a point. I wanted to make it right though, Dash. Out of pity, not belief. That does not show faith in us. If anything, it's an insult. Izuka paused a moment, as if considering what to say. We do not hate you, All Might. But we realize you are flawed as any human is. We found our own way, without you and without your quirk. Kid, I'm sorry. We are not sure if we can forgive you, at least not right now. Having said that, we are not your enemy, nor do we hate you. We never have. Through all our actions, we have tried to be like you. To show you that we too, were capable of heroism. 
We trust that you will keep our secret, All Might. Just as we kept yours. I give you my word, kid. And for the record, I was never more wrong in my life than in that moment. Tashinori hesitated before continuing. Young man, you too can be a hero, no you already are. Venom nodded at this, but was unimpressed. We appreciate the sentiment, but it came thirteen months too late. Despite that, it was difficult to hold back his emotions. And with that, Venom shot off the rooftop, before swinging away into the city. Tashinori sighed, but he didn't have the luxury of regrets now. His successor Mirio needed his guidance, to help him master one for all. Izuka landed in an alleyway, before he leaned against the wall. He tried to stop the tears, but they just kept falling. Kid, that was really brave of you. I know you haven't forgiven him just yet, but know this. Regardless of how you feel, you've become a wonderful hero. Peter would be proud, and kid? I, I am so glad that we became partners. Izuka's tears were in full force, and struck his feelings like a ton of bricks. He cried because despite what he'd said, all he'd ever wanted was for All Might to acknowledge him. But when he actually got that acknowledgement, it just left him feeling hollow. Chin up, kid. Besides, you still have to help Mina move in. And she said if you were late, she'd make you do it shirtless. Izuka rubbed his tears away. The thought of Mina was a great comfort in this moment. You're right, Venom. Let's go. Chapter 13 Where's Waldo? And toward I mean training. Izuka stood shirtless, moving some of Mina's boxes. He was getting some looks that made him uncomfortable. But then Mina grabbed him and wrapped around pressing herself against him for being so sweet to help her. His symbiote coughed something that sounded like marking her territory, but Izuka wasn't sure. He was too busy trying not to drop Mina's box of precious yes, Reed, her box set of the Ridley Scott Aliens movies. He loved her, and she loved him, but he was not sure she loved him more than her favorite movie. He walked into her dorm and set the box down before wiping some sweat from his brow. He looked around her room a moment, before flushing a bit. This was the first time he'd been in a girl's room, he realized with blush. And Mina? Can we turn on your air conditioner? It's super hot in here. Izuka called out to Mina, who was chatting in the hall with one of her friends, who seemed to be an invisible girl. Oh, it's definitely hot in there, Tiger. But I'm pretty sure it's because you're shirtless. Mina's teasing voice rang from the hallway. He then heard heated whispers followed by two simultaneous squeals. Venom? I think I'm scared. Izuka thought to his partner worriedly. Kid, you just have to roll with the punches. You're afraid of your girlfriend, but you'll happily fight an army of Nomu? I wouldn't say happily. Before the internal discussion could go further, Mina waltzed into the room, a sly grin on her face. Izuka could only idly muse how that didn't bode well for him before she crashed into him, sending them both to the floor. Hi! She purred, in a rather cat-like manner, sending shivers up his spine. Her yellow eyes danced in amusement, and excitement? Her face was super close to his, making him super nervous. And Mina? You're really close to me right now. Izuka stammered out, and used to situations like this where Mina pounced on him. Oh, I know. I figured I'd have my wicked way with you a bit to thank you for helping me out. As Mina slammed her lips against his, Izuka could only hope no one stumbled in on their intimate moment. A few hours of unpacking later, and the UA students of 1A had finished their setup. Izuka had spoken with a few of Mina's classmates, along with a few visiting students from their sister class. Izuka had to be honest, the duo of Aijiro Kurishima and Tetsu 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 was hard to differentiate. He had come across them having an argument over who was more manly, the Crimson Riot or Venom. Tetsu Tetsu was in the Venom camp, stating that anyone who does what's right without a guaranteed payday was super manly. Kirishima argued that no one would ever match the manliness of Crimson Riot, and how he had not invited Tetsu Tetsu over to argue. Izuka just observed a few minutes, before he extracted himself from the situation, and continued his search for his girlfriend and Shuto. You have a fan. Please do not do this right now. As he continued looking for Mina and Shuto, he passed a rather odd-shaped mummified boy in a full body cast. He was stuck face down outside the girl's restroom. Izuka raised a brow, but left the strange being alone. He was about walk away, when he spotted a yellow sleeping bag in the middle of the hallway a few feet away. 
he became curious, and moved to examine it closer. He was about to poke the bundle when it spoke to him. Hello, Venom. Or should I say Izuka Midoriya? The bundle spoke muffled, before it wiggled slightly, before exposing the face of a race head sticking out of the sleeping bag, staring up at him with a bored yet intimidating gaze. Izuka frantically looked around for anyone who might have heard, but he didn't see anyone freaking out, so he kneeled down to Aizawa's face. Don't do that! Aizawa raised a brow. Don't go spouting off my identity! Aren't you going to ask how I knew? Izuku knew it couldn't have been from the cameras, as he'd been very careful to ensure his hood covered his face. He looked back at Aizawa. I assume everyone's favorite bald eagle told you, since he specifically promised not to. Izuka frowned then. Aizawa saw this, and tried to placate him. Now now, before you get upset, All Might had good reason for disclosing that information to me. Whatever. It's just another way he's let me down. He didn't even last a day. At this, Aizawa nodded, confirmed Izuka's guess. Izuka couldn't help but muse how funny this situation would be in less serious circumstances. I won't waste time here. I know about your investigation into our issues with leaking pipes around here. I won't interfere. All Might, myself, and the headmaster are aware of your actions as a vigilante. Other than your alleged assault on Bakugo, you haven't done anything besides operate without a license. Given the times we find ourselves in, we have decided to look the other way, at least until the League of Villains is taken care of. Izuka's face grew serious here. This wasn't a friendly chat anymore with someone who knew his secret. Oh, I don't think I need your permission eraser head. After all, I may be heroic but I'm still a vigilante. Izuki gave him a wry grin. However, I won't deny that being able to move around in my search will be easier with your permission. You do realize that, because both All Might and myself know your identity, we could turn you in. Aizawa commented casually, as if discussing the weather. You could. Very easily. However, you won't do that. Because we have the potential for a symbiotic relationship. Oh, very nice. I won't deny that you have your uses. You're a maverick, and I don't agree with your style of operating. That being said, you give results, and we need a fresh angle on this problem. So I'd like to formally request your help with the matter. Aizawa spoke once more, before his tone went deadly serious. I know what you're planning. I won't let you turn my students into vigilantes, though. At this, Izuka scoffed at Aizawa's attempts at intimidation. After all, it's hard to be intimidated by someone wrapped in a sleeping bag cocoon. Look, Eraserhead. I respect you. In fact, you're one of the main influences in how I do things in an operation. But you don't scare me, and I haven't forced anyone to do anything they haven't wanted to. My friends agree with me based on my ideals and merit. I didn't make them disillusioned with the hero system as it stands. You guys did that to yourselves. Aizawa glared a bit, but said nothing. I don't think we'll ever be more than two groups who share enemies. However, you have my word that the spy situation will be settled in a few days at most. I have a sense for these things. Aizawa stared back up at him from his comfortable position as a caterpillar cosplayer, before he nodded, and rolled away down the hall. Izuku was unsure of how to process the image of a top hero rolling down a hallway in a sleeping bag so he just resumed his search. When he actually found them, they were in an argument with some of their classmates. Mina was in a heated argument with a boy wearing glasses. Shido sat back, watching carefully in case he needed to jump in. He seemed disinterested in the whole thing. The kid with the glasses had a burn mark running down the left side of his face, which made the angry expression on his face look more intimidating. Ashido! I cannot believe you would stand up for that villainous venom! The boy with glasses spoke vehemently, the scowl on his face enhancing his already angry features. And I can't believe that you would just insult the guy who saved my life. Mina spoke back equally angry. No one insulted Izuku, not in front of her. Even if they didn't weren't aware they had done so. I would be dead, Tenya. That creature would have snapped my neck. At this, Tenya had the decency to look ashamed a moment, before he shook his head and pressed on. His actions make our class and the pros look bad. He took out a villain that we could not. At this, Mina took on an incredulous expression. Is that why you're bashing the guy? Because he made you look bad? Tenya, this isn't a game or a popularity contest. This is about saving people's lives. 
and use Flash, the only reason our class got hurt as bad as it did? It was because we weren't allowed to fight back. It's a miracle no one died. With that, Mina stormed off, with Shudo following after her. She was angry enough that actually didn't see Izuku running into him. He then wrapped his arms around her, which made her struggle until she realized it was him. I'm sorry, Freckles. That wasn't like me. Mina spoke softly, burying her face in his chest. Izuku was touched by her protectiveness. He tightened his hold on her and buried it in her fluffy pink hair. Thank you, Mina. I'm lucky to have such a proud and protective girlfriend in my life. Izuku spoke honestly, before he coughed a bit. I think we should have a meeting. I already texted Hitoshi about twenty minutes ago, so he's probably almost here. I'd like to discuss that special project I gave Shudo with the team. At this, they both nodded before Shudo headed down to the front door to let in Hitoshi, while Mina and himself headed to her room. When they sat down, Izuku felt something was off, like a slight twinge of his spider sense. He ignored it for the moment, because it wasn't an immediate threat. Mina leaned into him and took his hand in hers, intertwining their fingers as they sat on her bed. After a few minutes of waiting, Shudo walked in with Hitoshi, both having their usual bored expressions on their faces. They shut the door behind them, and took a seat on the floor facing the other two members of the team. Izuku nodded his greetings to his friends, before scratching the side of his face. He flicked his eyes around the room, unable to explain the nagging of his sense. All right, Shudo. Before you give us your findings, let's discuss why we are here. He paused, almost for dramatic effect. Yue clearly has a leak. I was able to figure that out after a few minutes of talking about the events you guys went through. So that leads to the question of whom. After saying his piece, Izuka nodded to Shudo, who then pulled up a list on his phone. All right, so based on the criteria that Izuka gave me, I have compiled a list of prospective spies. To recap, the criteria was involvement in both league incidents involving 1A, while remaining unscathed. He paused to regain his breath. So based on that, I have a list of suspects. The first, Yuga Oyama. He came out relatively unscathed in both incidents, and he acts, odd, at times. Shido was about to continue, before Shinso cut him off. What about Mina? Izuku was surprised, as were Shuto and Mina. Think about it. She wasn't there for the USJ attack, which could hint at prior knowledge. Izuku shook his head. Doesn't work. Mina was with me the night before, and she was coughing a lot. She missed school because she was sick. I actually with her the day of as well, and she was definitely not faking it. Hitoshi nodded before smiling apologetically to Mina. Sorry, Mina. I didn't actually suspect you, I just wanted to ensure we were thorough, and wanted to confirm Izuku wouldn't let his feelings affect our investigation. Mina waved off his concern, clearly not bothered by his action. Don't worry about it, dude. I may not be as smart as you guys, but I know it never hurts to consider all the angles. With that out of the way, Izuku nodded to Shudo, motioning to continue. Shudo coughed, before resuming his presentation. Okay, the next... I was actually going to subsect Mizo Shoji based off quirk usage for remote spying and lack of involvement in the first attack. However, he was seriously injured in the camp incident, so I think that we can eliminate him. Izuka hummed in thought, eyes still subtly glancing around the room. His sense had spiked a bit when the topic of spies came up, but it still remained passive. For now. He then addressed the group. I don't know these people, but unless he was really committed to selling his cover— I don't think it's Shoji. The others agreed with his assessment, before they all looked back to Shudo. He began to look uncomfortable, taking a few glances at Mina. I only have one more candidate. It simultaneously makes the most and least sense. This got everyone's attention. There was tension in the room, which was almost as prevalent as the anticipation of the name. Izuka shut his eyes and focused on his enhanced hearing. Toru Hagakure is the most likely candidate. Izuka counted five sharp inhales at that statement, and his spider sense spiked for a second, which confirmed his suspicions. Izuka then began to smirk, before adjusting his non-existent glasses. He stood up, as if to stretch, before he rapidly shot his arm at the door, webbing it entirely and preventing anyone from getting out. It seems in our search for the mole, our mole found us O.W. Izuka spoke in a cool manner, at least until Mina hit him in the shoulder. 
Why the hell did you get your goop on my new door? Mina was not happy with his decision. H. Hold on, babe, I'll explain, and so will Toru. Isn't that right? Izuka then looked at an empty space in the corner of the room, before an eep was heard, followed by awkward shuffling. Toru? Mina began, clearly upset by the revelation that her closest female friend was a spy. I, it's a mistake, right? Izuku just made a mistake for once. She wrapped her arms around herself and fell to her knees. As much as Izuka wanted to comfort Mina, he knew this wasn't the time. Just so you know, I can hear your breathing and your footsteps. In case you're thinking about escaping, you won't get far. Izuku spoke, his voice distorting at the end, before he continued. So here is how it's going to go down. I can either web you up and do my whole interrogation thing, or... You can willing cooperate, and then we go from there. Your call. He heard a sigh from the invisible girl. F fine, okay, I'll talk. Just please don't hurt me. She spoke in a quiet, frightened voice. Izuku wanted to feel bad for her, but he also knew it could be an act. Even if she wasn't the spy, she was still spying on them. How did you figure it out? It was actually Shudo who responded. There were inconsistencies in your whereabouts during the attacks. For instance, you said you were near Bakugo during the USJ incident, but I only remember you being there for a few minutes before you had disappeared. I didn't think much of it at the time, but when I watched your exam with Ojiro, that struck me as odd. You knew how he fought, even though he was in a completely different area of the USJ staging area. You also sustained no injuries in either incident. I became convinced when I asked around about your specific whereabouts during the camp incident. Some of our classmates said you were with them, but there were large periods of time when you were missing, throughout the whole trip actually. Izuku nodded at Shuto's analytical work, clearly impressed with his deduction. He'd been expecting refutations by the invisible girl, or even hostility, yet she'd hadn't done either. She just sat there, sullenly, he assumed. Izuku decided it was time to cut to the chase. Okay. Since you haven't denied anything, is it safe to assume we're correct? If so then tell us, Toru. Why did you become a traitor? Why did you deliberately feed the League of Villains information? You'd better tell the truth, Toru. You got several of your classmates, including your best friend, seriously injured. And you got a little boy killed. So start. Talking. Now. Izuku was trying to remain calm, but the fact this girl could be a willing agent of evil grated at him. I'm sorry. She wailed, now in tears. I never meant for any of this to happen. The group shared a look, save Mina, who was staring numbly at her friend with a numb expression on her face. I, I just wanted to be seen. To be normal. She sobbed, wet spots appeared on the floor below Toru. Do you have any idea what it's like to go through life without ever being seen? To not know whether you look good enough to impress the boy you like? To not be able to smile with your friends when you have a good time? To not even remember what you look like? Because all you see is a blank space where you're supposed to be? She sniffled, venting out her years of self-loathing. It's so easy to be ignored when no one can see you. So yes, when I was told I could have my quirk removed, so I could be visible again, I jumped at the chance. Who wouldn't? At this though, her voice became sullen. I didn't know what my actions would cause though. She paused again, trying to find the words. All they said was they wanted me to give some information here and there. They never said anything about hurting people. Otherwise, I'd have never agreed. But I was so desperate to be rid of my quirk, so I could finally be Toru Hagakure the teenage girl, instead of Toru Hagakure the invisible girl. I never though you guys would care about me like you did. Would treat me like I'm normal. But by the time I wanted out, they refused to let me go. They threatened my family. What was I supposed to do? Izuku was torn. Toru was just another victim of the League of Villains. She had been used, and in the process of her actions, had hurt the people she'd come to care about so deeply. Her actions had indirectly scarred several of them, and had killed a child. She would have to live with that guilt for the rest of her life. He looked to his friends for guidance. Mina had scooted over to Toru, and embraced the girl, the two sobbing together. Hitoshi looked deep in thought, examining her words for any sign of deception. Shuto looked uncomfortable, clearly not sure how to deal with a crying girl. As he scratched the back of his head, he could only muse over what a mess this had turned out to be. X. 
In the end, they had decided not to turn Toru in. The girl was just as much of a victim as the other members of her class. As such, they let Toru go, on the condition if she kept spying, she had at least to be transparent with the information she gave. As for her friendship with Mina, Izuka wasn't sure if Mina would ever trust Tora fully again, but he had encouraged her to remain friends with the invisible girl. They had gone off to talk somewhere, to try to clear the air between themselves. Izuka shook his head. He needed to focus on the task at hand. Shirto? We need to discuss a code name for you. You can't immediately out yourself as a vigilante. We need that revelation for later. Izuka stated candidly, to which Shuto nodded. I really don't even want a name, but clearly it's necessary. Shuto stated dryly, not especially happy he had to finally think up a name for himself. How about dry ice? Hitoshi suggested casually. It did fit to a degree, but Izuka shook his head. It only really incorporates half his quirk. Admittedly, he only uses half of it most of the time, but still. We need a name that will eventually incorporate his fire quirk. Izuka tapped his chin as he thought, when he suddenly became aware of how hot it was in the room. Hey guys? Is it just me, or is it really hot in here? This prompted Hitoshi to check the temp on his phone. Huh. It says it's about 30 degrees Celsius outside right now. Izuka's train of thought derailed. What did you just say? Izuka asked Hitoshi, which confused the boy. What do you mean? I said it was 30 degrees Celsius. As if a chorus of angels had now begun singing in his head, his answer had fallen into his lap. I know what to call you Shito. A statement which caused the teen in question to arch an eyebrow. Your code name is Celsius, the vigilante who control both boiling heat and absolute zero. X. It had been a few days since the move and slash spy confrontation. Mina was less gloomy than before, which Izuka was glad for. He was mildly annoyed that his repertoire of skills couldn't help his girlfriend solve her issues with her friend, but he made sure she knew he was there for her. She had hugged him for that, and expressed that she loved him. Now the outsiders found themselves in LeBlanc, waiting for May to show up. Shuto was sitting closely beside Momo, and Izuka was pretty sure they were holding hands under the table, given their arms' proximity to one another. Mina sat beside him, currently wrapped around his right arm and resting her head on his shoulder. She was lightly snoring, which was cute. He was about to ask Shudo to take a picture of them, when the cafe's door chimed, and in walked Hitoshi and Mei, who was walking rather close to his side. They pulled up two chairs to the table, with Hitoshi pulling out Mei's for her in a gentlemanly gesture that went completely over her head, as usual. So, Mei began with a grin. I've had your costumes for a while but I hear you guys have been busy. Momo coughed a bit. Yes, I am curious to see what my funds helped you create, May. I want my friends to be safe during their activities. The concern she felt for her friends was evident, showing that despite being filthy rich, she was a kind girl who would do anything for those she cared about. May looked at her curiously, before remembering how she was able to splurge on high-end materials. Oh yeah? Thanks again, Momo. The others chimed in with thanks as well causing the living printer to blush at the attention. It was no trouble. I merely wished to help in my own way. Anyways, so yeah? For Todoroki, I have this thing that will rearrange your face so no one will recognize you or that nasty scar. Shuto's jaw dropped, unsure of whether to thank or strangle the girl. Ah, uh, I was hoping for something like a helmet that monitors my body temperature. Shuto stated through grit teeth, trying to remain polite. Oh. Yeah, sure. I made helmet for you in case you decided to be lame with my babies. She handed him a blue helmet that had a gold full-face visor. He tried it on, and it immediately gave him tactical data, angles for sliding to maximize speed, and a rough estimate of his body temperature. All in all, Shudo was pleased. Thank you, May. No problem. And here's that body suit that you asked for. It'll help maintain your body heat when using your ice quirk, while also being fireproof. She handed him a black bodysuit, which had yellow accent marks on it. These marks will change to red if your internal temperature is reaching danger levels. The helmet links up to the suit, and by using the voice command reset, it'll use an internal cooling and heating system to force your body back to its normal temp. She then looked to Mina. So for Mina, I have the bodysuit as requested, which has built-in magnetics which essentially nullified ballistic damage. 
I didn't test it for sustained punishment though, so be careful with testing it. She handed Mina a skin-tight bodysuit, which had circles around the torso area. Then I have your helmet, which has a built-in telemetry monitors to give out information on your body, and has a built-in communications array with the team. May then handed the pink girl a science fiction-looking helmet, which resembled a ballistic face mask with two big glowing yellow eyes, and two antennae on the top. Finally, I made you a gauntlet and an acid gun. Both items which can store up acid ahead of time to reduce your cork strain. The acid gun has 100 cartridges that you can fill up with your acid at your leisure. The gauntlet had padded knuckles, and what looked like a storage tube on the outside. The acid gun simply looked like a high-tech water gun. She paused a bit, before glancing at Hitoshi. For you, Toshi, I made some rather unique babies. I made you some shock gauntlets, which shock outlets on the knuckles, and the index fingers fire darts of various uses. Hitoshi's eyebrows shot up, surprised at his new gear's versatility. I made you a chest plate similar to Mina's. It uses magnetic polarity to haul bullets and other projectiles. I also built you some combat boots that have hover jets, allowing you to keep up with the team at full speed. At this, he smiled at her, which prompted a slight blush from the resident gearhead. He was about to vocalize his thanks when she spoke again. Aya and I built you a box lunch. Everyone at the table was confused. Did she mean she made him a box lunch? She rummaged through her bag, before depositing a medium-sized box on the table. She pressed a button on the side, before laughing maniacally as four metal arms shot out of the sides and began making sandwiches and small pastries. I'm kind of upset. May spoke annoyed. I was trying to build a machine that made bread spontaneously. But all I could do was build one that made sandwiches. Everyone at the table gaped at the girl. She built a machine that created food from nothing. She had accidentally solved a huge world issue without even meaning to. Hitoshi was speechless, though, and definitely blushing, touched by her thought. Um, thanks, May. Said girl blushed and scratched her cheek bashfully. Anytime, Toshi. Izuka coughed to get everyone's attention. As they all looked to him, he thought about what he now had to say. Okay, guys. Listen. You guys saw how much you need training during the camp incident. Well, I figure since you have the provisional license exams coming up, then that means you need to train. At this he paused, gauging their responses. They all had determined looks in their eyes, which made him smile. This was his team. By the time our week of training is up, you guys will be fully-fledged heroes. We will accomplish this via some mild memory sharing via my suit and a grueling training regimen for the week itself. May Momo, you are both welcome to come along. If nothing else, you can observe your contributions in action. Izuka checked his watch, before realizing how late it was. He looked back at the group to address them once more. Our training starts in two days, on Monday morning. I expect you to meet me outside the dorms at 7 a.m., with your gear packed and ready to transport. He received nods from everyone. Oh, they have no idea what they're in for. No. No, they do not. Izuka thought excitedly. He planned to be harsh and thorough, because he didn't want his friends to die because he was a lax instructor. I mean, if they happen to die in the process, well... Venom. Chapter 14. Meet the Parents, and Groly, the legendary supervillain. Mina had decided that, because their training was going to be so intense, Izuku and his mom should come over for dinner the day before they started. So it was with much nervousness that Izuku and his mother found themselves outside Mina's house. He noted it was rather nice. Nothing extravagant, but it clearly showed they were well off. He shuffled nervously. His mother was sniffling and mumbling something about how her baby was growing up too fast. He shook his head before ringing the doorbell. A few moments passed before a rather tall pink man opened the door. He had circular two beers, and much like Mina, his eyes were black and yellow. He had an antenna. Looking thing on the top of his hairless head, and he wore giant thick-rimmed glasses. He was dressed in a blue button-down shirt with a weird-looking tie. His pants had suspenders. His eyes lit up when he realized who was at the door. Greetings, Midoriya units. We are delighted you could join us for probing I mean dinner. My family unit is in the kitchen preparing the tools I mean meal. I forget you I mean us humans enjoy meals in non-liquid form. The more the man spoke in his odd, alien-like voice, the more Izuka was worried Mina might actually be an alien. 
He was about to ask if the man was feeling all right when a beautiful, non-alien-looking woman walked up behind him and bonked him on the head with her fist. She had no discernible alien features, so that sort of eliminated Mina's potential heritage as a full alien. The woman had a kind face, with her eyes taking the appearance of being perpetually closed. Her hair was pink and flowed in wavy tresses down to her shoulders. She was, however, radiating a rather scary aura. Now, Maji, what did I say about acting like an alien to scare guests? The woman had a smile, but it had a rather sinister aura about it. Be but wife unit dash. The smile became more murderous, if possible. Maji sighed. You're no fun, Nia. I have to get my kicks somehow. He then picked up a pen from his pocket, before he looked at it, and after a pink glow, it was suddenly a stick of licorice. Of course, dear. That's why you torment your employees with your antics and demands for candy. Maji seemed to brighten at this, and his eyes glazed over a moment as if remembering something pleasant. Asterisk earlier asterisk. A timid-looking office worker sat before Maji, who was sitting in his office, which was large. He was vice president, after all. He sat at his desk, fingers linked in front of him, doing a rather effective Jendo Ikari impression. His eyes glinted somehow despite the lack of bright light in the office. Yes, sir, I can't bring you the report. The timid man stuttered out, terrified of his boss. Maji slammed his hand on the desk. And why not? Because, sir, I already gave it to you. The man was freaking out. You turned it into candy, sir. And it was fruit roll UPS. I hate fruit roll UPS. I wanted licorice. Everyone outside the office was torn between amusement and terror, unsure of how their candy-addicted boss would handle being told no. Asterisk back in the present asterisk. Ah. So I can, my lovely wife. So I can. He then rubbed his hands together and began chuckling sinisterly, at least until she bonked him on the head again. You'll have to forgive, Maji. He likes to mess with people. The fact he's smart enough to usually get away with it has done nothing to curb his habits. She spoke warmly to the Midoriyas. Please take a seat in our living room. It's down the hall to your left. As Izuku and his mom entered the house, they took note of how normal it looked. The furniture was nice, but not gaudy. There were several pictures of Mina and her family on a nearby table. They showed Mina, both her parents, and tall boy with was spiky pink hair and wild grin on his face. The hallway they were currently in had some nice paintings on the wall and a large framed picture of Maji and his two children doing evil poses while they laughed. Izuka wasn't sure how to process that one. Soon, they found themselves in the living room, where Mina and the pink-haired boy from the picture were sitting, arguing over something. Look, Naji, I'm going to tell you this once. You cannot, and I emphasize that, cannot do anything stupid in front of Midoriya. Naji just pouted. IT was one time okay. That torch swallower was a scrub. Plus he said my cat was stupid for being blue. Also, what's up with that? Mina just gave him an unamused look. Naji, I tolerate you. Your girlfriend somehow loves you. But I need you to not be an idiot. Or I'll tell Lucy you were rough your fur child. At this, Naji's face paled. You wouldn't. I would, if it helped get my brother off the self-destructive path he was on. Dude, she's queen of the nerds and cats. Even though you're lying, she would still murder me. You can't tell her that. Of course I won't. Now admit it. Naji opened his mouth several times to speak, as if the act physically pained him. I'll be good, okay? Naji then took notice of Izuku and his mom. Who's the awkward-looking guy? This prompted Nia to poke her head at, aura once again terrifying. Now, Naji, you wouldn't happen to be insulting our guests, would you? No. No. I'll be good. Mina shook her head, used to her family's antics. She then rushed Izuku and squeezed him like stress ball. Oh, Izuku! I miss you! Said stress ball turned crimson, and his mother began crying over how cute they were. X. The Ashidos and the Midoriyas found themselves sitting down to a lovely dinner of rice balls, katsudan, and miso soup served with side helpings of fish. While Inko spoke with both Nia and Maji, Izuku was having an internal discussion with his partner and friend. Okay. Hear us out. We want chocolate. And tater tots. What? 
Izuka responded in a confused manner. We need chocolate and tater tots. We crave them. And Peter would always give us our cravings. Otherwise, we crave organs. And people. But Peter wasn't too fond of that idea. Okay, first off, now I want them too, so thanks for that. Second, I don't even know where to get tater tots here. Third, you eat people? You should still get us some. And we feel like you are latching onto the wrong things. We want chocolate and tater tots. I cannot just make tater tots right now. Ah, uh, Mizuku? You okay? Mina's worried voice brought him out of his internal conversation and made him very much aware of the odd looks of the table's occupants. Ah, uh, yeah, we're fine. Izuka stammered out hurriedly. We're? Maji questioned, wondering about the pluralism. Dude, you eat like a horse. Where the hell do you put it all? At this, Mina's mother bonked her son on the head with an admonishment over his language. His mother looked a mixture of concern and nervousness, as she too had noticed his tendency to gorge himself on food. Izuka dear, are you okay? You are eating quite a bit lately. Mina's father simply brushed off her concerns. Clearly, the Midoriya unit requires largest amounts of food to function. This will be useful information in controlling this species OW. Mina's mother bonked her husband on the head, clearly unamused with her husband's antics. Babe, seriously. I haven't said anything, but you eat a lot. You might actually get fat. Mina teased Izuku, who was now blushing from all the attention. I'm a growing boy. Mom, Mina, you two don't need to worry. I just like eating enough for two people. Also, Mr. Ishido, do you have a chocolate? At this, Maji grinned like a maniac and held up a fork before turning it into chocolate. Not the good silverware, Maji! came Mia Ishido's enraged voice. The dinner had gone the usual route. Embarrassing questions, teasing remarks, Mina's dad threatening to turn him into candy if her hurt his precious alien spawn. The usual things though the highlight was Mina's mom showcasing her quirk. She apparently had a quirk called Komodo, which allows her to spit acid. It also gave her a lizard tongue. They realized how late it was, and bid their farewells. Izuka quietly reminded Mina to meet up outside UA for the training tomorrow, because he knew she might have forgotten. Judging from her sheepish expression, she had. X. Elsewhere. A sinister and unusually skinny fellow worked over a notebook, chuckling, before speaking in an intelligent and evil British accent. Soon. Soon I will unleash my evil genius upon the city. Mwahaha. His form then shifted into a gigantic muscular monstrosity, its face rather stupid and blank. Growly. Six days later. The training had gone swimmingly. The outsiders had worked their asses off to show Izuka they were ready. Between the memory-melding strategy tapes and drills that Izuka put them through, they were more than prepared to make their debut. However, they had decided to end practice early, and go out to have some fun. Hitoshi, Shudo, and Mina all had their costumes in their bags, since they didn't want to make a trip back to the dorms. Izuka was carrying Mina's bag for her, like a gentleman. Mina suddenly stopped, before her eyes lit up with mischief. Hey, Hitoshi, Shuto? said boys turned to look at her unsure of what to make of her sudden address. Why don't you guys invite Momo and May? If we're taking the rest of the day off as a team, why don't we bring them too? They're still involved with the team, after all. Both boys looked at each other and shrugged, not able to think of a reason not to call their other friends. Despite their calm demeanor, you could spot the faintest of blushes on their cheeks. We now find our favorite vigilante team in a movie theater, watching a documentary on heroism. Mina was snuggled into Izuku. Mei was leaning onto a sweating Hitoshi, their hands locked together by some sort of high-tech handcuffs. Momo had placed her head on Shuto's shoulder, and placed a hand on his chest, feeling his heartbeat. Yes, love was clearly in the air, despite Valentine's Day being over eight months away. This blatant display of the author's ships continued for the remainder of the movie, before they calmly made their way out of the theater. Mina then sequestered Momo and Mei, and they were speaking in excited whispers. Each of the girls were giving each other high fives, and looking over at the guys conspiratorially. Both Shuto and Hitoshi looked at Izuku expectantly. What? Is there something on my face? Izuku asked in a confused manner. No, but is your danger sense not going off? 
Yeah, man. The girls are looking at us like they have evil plans for us. Well, now that you mention it, there is a slight tingling dash. Izuku was cut off by an explosion a few blocks away. Did, did the girls somehow cause that? I'm at least, 60% sure Mei didn't cause that explosion. Despite that percentage, the group all turned to look at Mei. What are you guys looking at me for? I don't blow things up, intentionally. Well, kid, you heard her. She's not to blame this time. Guess that means villain attack. I think you should use this as the first test of the team. I agree. Izuka thought back, before refocusing on the team. Guys, this is it. It's time for the Outsiders to debut. Keep what I've taught you in mind, and you'll be fine. Izuka said, before addressing Momo and Mei. You two need to find someplace safe to hide. We can handle this. Both girls nodded. Before they left, they hugged Shuto and Hitoshi, before running off. Let's gear up in the alley over there, then head out. A skeletal figure stood laughing maniacally as he exited the bank he just robbed. As expected, my master plan worked perfectly. And given my calculations, no heroes will respond in time to stop my abrupt exit. His showboating and bragging was halted by the arrival of four figures. One was that infernal venom. He didn't recognize the others. He didn't realize he would be the first to fight the vigilante team known as the Outsiders. Who the devil are you? His British accent spoke in irritation. You weren't supposed to be here. Venom tilted his head to the side, feigning confusion. You see, we are a traveling group of magicians. We are currently looking people to showcase our talent for the mysterious. How'd you like to be the volunteer for our act? It involves making you vanish and reappear behind bars. Venom spoke in an amused tone of voice, grating at the skeletal figure. You know, you remind me of someone. Have we met? And saying we're not supposed to be here? That's a pretty odd statement coming from a guy who just robbed a bank. His bored drawl grated at the villain's nerves. They did not realize they were in the presence of the great Dr. Smalley. How dare you! I am the most evil scientist ever! Dr. Smalley! The fact the guy had a British accent confused the group, as the guy was clearly Japanese. Venom was the first to voice this observation. Why are you talking with a British accent? We're in the dead center of Japan, which you clearly are from. And are you really a doctor? Or are you like that TV hack from a few centuries ago and that you just claim to be one? Don't you know, Venom? Every evil genius villain is British. It's practically a trope. Also, I'm very smart. The eagle maniacal skeleton blathered on, clearly not caring who heard his explanation. For you see, I am both master and henchman. Thanks to my quirk, knowledge is power. I can both scheme and execute. By sacrificing my genius-level intelligence, I can change my intelligence into immense physical strength, and vice versa. And as you know, I'm very smart. So I have a lot to work with. At this, the villain's form began to ripple and change. Before you die, however, I would like your names. You know, so I can laugh about it later. The group sighed in annoyance before speaking. We are Venom. Alien Queen, was the enthusiastic response from the female of the group. Hive mind, came the bored voice from the guy wearing a bandit mask. Celsius, the figure in black and blue spoke simply. At this, Venom threw his arms out dramatically. And we are the outsiders. Momo and May looked at the news report on the television in a nearby window. They were watching the live broadcast of the new vigilante team called the Outsiders. Obviously they were aware that it was really their friends, but they weren't about to shout H-E-Y that's our friend group. The broadcaster was losing his mind, clearly unsure of how to take the debut of a new vigilante team. Folks, I don't believe what I am seeing. It seems Venom has recruited allies for his unsanctioned yet altruistic crusade. In this humble reporter's opinion, go Venom! May and Momo sweat dropped at the anchor's declaration, before looking back at the showdown that was about to happen. The outsiders watched, the villainous Dr. Smalley rippling like he was made of water. I do apologize. My other form is rather stupid. He jotted something down in a notebook and closed it. Beware the might of the unstoppable juggernaut, for I am Groly. His form grew to over eight feet tall, his skeletal form replaced by gargantuan muscles. The sinister expression on the man's face replaced by a rather stupid one, looking innocent and unintimidating. 
His Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sequence was complete. The questionably intimidating figure spoke only one word, before opening the notebook. Growly. Venom looked on in apprehension. This was the end result? Sure the guy was massive. But did he look dangerous? My notebook says smash you and must steal money from banking a stab espelside dash. His face shrunk a bit, implying he'd reverted a bit, before yelling. Establishment. You'd think with how smart I am that I would remember not to use big words. He said before his face resumed its vacant expression. Growly! The hulking form had suddenly appeared in front of Venom, causing his spider sense to go crazy. Before Venom could react, Growly punched him, sending him flying into a building. Venom! The female voice sounded frantic and concerned. She drew a tool from her belt and fired it at Growly. She began to slide around him in a circle as she fired. The substance landed on him and began to burn the massive man. Hi, mind, you want to help out? Oh right. That thing I do. Hey big guy. You like turtles? High mind asked boredly, figuring the fight was over when the big lug answered his question. I like turtles. Groly then threw a punch at High Mind. That shocked the hell out of High Mind, because he never failed to brainwash someone before. What the hell? This guy is unaffected by my quirk. Part of Groly's face shrunk, the voice of Dr. Smalley rang out of the gargantuan form. You know, it's as they say. Sometimes less is more. After speaking he resumed the dumb-looking expression. Growly! It spoke in childlike joy. Holy crap. He's too stupid to be affected by my quirk. I don't know how to take this, guys. Hivemind spoke out in no small wonder. The figure of Celsius sighed, before entering the fray as well. Cold vapor was seeping off his body, forming rings around his body. I guess I'll deal with you. He froze the air around Groly, entrapping the giant in ice. Groly semed to struggle against the bonds, while marveling at their sparkles. You make pretty shinies! Celsius just looked confused, and when the structure he made began to shake, he became shocked when Groly broke out as if it was made of glass. Groly then threw a piece of the ice at Celsius, which slammed him into a car. Venom was now climbing out of rubble, feeling really annoyed. We swear. Is it every villain's goal to make us into a human wrecking ball? Seriously, we should break into the demolition business. He dropped down onto the street. Okay, you know what? Screw it. We're gonna see just how hard we can hit this idiot. He rushed at Groly, before swinging his fist into the large dummy, sending him flying. The group looked at him in awe. Alien Queen was the first to speak. Dude, since when are you that strong? She spoke excitedly. We have super strength, remember? We can lift twenty tons. That means we can lift five SUVs at the same time with ease. Alien Queen looked a bit sheepish at this. She had forgotten how strong Venom could be. He tried not to rely on his strength so he wouldn't hurt people he fought. But this guy? He's too stupid to feel pain. That, and he seems to be made of freaking mithril. So we do not have to hold back. Leave this to us. It's a bad matchup for you guys anyways. The others nodded at his request and moved away. They were within distance to step and should help be needed, but far enough away that they wouldn't get hurt. No longer having to worry about his team, Venom turned his attention back towards the direction of the villain, who was currently climbing out of a minivan he'd crashed into. You sure that's a smart play, kid? This guy may be an idiot right now, but he's both henchman and mastermind in one. That makes him unpredictable, and that's dangerous. Nodding to his partner's advice, Venom was about to reply when he noticed Groly pulling himself out of the car. He tensed, but Groly just smiled at him stupidly. Notebook says I must smash you. Before Venom could utter a witty retort or insult, Groly was suddenly in front of him, fist drawn back. As he swung his fist, Venom was able to get his guard up in time to block the strike. However, Groly began pushing forward, with Venom stuck on his fist due to the sheer velocity of the hit. They moved several feet away before Venom planted his feet in the ground firmly, and used both his body and Groly's own momentum to force the crazy giant into tumbling over the vigilante, rolling across the ground before coming to a halt. Venom glanced at his surroundings to ensure no civilians were in harm's way before he held looked at his arm. It was rippling, which made Izuka frown under the mask. Venom, what's going on? Oh. Oh. I sort of forgot about one of our abilities. 
Just hold your arm out in front towards the lug head, and think of a bat for a second. Even more confused than before, Izuku did as his partner asked. His arm morphed into a blunt surface before shooting towards and slamming into Groly, sending the not-so-gentle giant into storefront. What the hell, Venom? Since when can we do that? Oh, you know, since nineteen always. Then why didn't you say something sooner? We assumed you knew. We said that we had limited shape shifting. An offhand comment is not an instruction. Well, sorry. Are you actively aware that you can't shape shift? No. So excuse us for forgetting about it. Not like you'd use it often anyway. Venom was interrupted from further internal argument when a countertop flew out of the store and directly towards his face. He caught it, using his form to disperse the inertia from Groly's throw. As Groly walked out of the now destroyed store window, he began to crack his knuckles. Venom set the countertop down, before addressing the villain. You know, Lenny, I could get you a rabbit if you stop fighting now. Groly looked as thoughtful as Guy with a walnut-sized brain could be for a moment, before shaking his head. Nah. Smalley said I could have ten bunnies if I beat you up and take the bagsies away. Venom just sort of twitched a minute. If only more minions were motivated by rabbits instead of money. Before he could make a counter-offer, Groly picked up a nearby car and threw it at him. Venom quickly dodged and shot a web to catch the vehicle before it did real damage. Before he could refocus on Groly, the villain grabbed him by the neck and began slamming him into the ground. The other members of the Outsiders looked on in worry as Groly kept slamming their leader into the ground over and over again. Mina looked especially terrified. However, before they could jump in, they were caught off guard by a new arrival. The metallic form of Tetsu 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 landed in front of them, before he struck a gallant pose. So you guys are Venom's team right? Well, watch me help save the day. Before anyone could stop him, he rushed over to the quarreling duo. Venom was not happy. He was pretty sure he had a concussion, and possibly a fractured skull at this point. He was about to blast the giant villain off of himself with his tendrils, when obnoxious yet manly voice range out over the noise of the fighting. Venom! I'm here to help man! Venom looked at the unfamiliar guy made of steel, clearly not sure of who he was. What do you need me to do? Venom was about to make a sarcastic remark buns of steel, when a thought occurred. Say, new guy! You think you can make this guy laugh into submission? It wasn't a serious request by any stretch of the imagination. But Venom figured it would make an opening at the very least. He would not let the newcomer get harmed, but if he happened to be useful, then why complain? Tetsu took on a thinking expression, before he looked at the villain, clearly taking the request from his idol seriously. Hey you big lug! Are you familiar with the hero Bill Fades? Groly took on a stupid expression trying to use his limited thought capabilities to ponder the question. Bow fades? Tetsu inhaled deeply a moment, before yelling triumphantly. Bow fades nuts! God em! Silence reigned. Everyone watching was utterly speechless. No one knew quite what the hell to say. It was the dumbest thing ever, and yet, the giant was shaking. Venom was starting to sweat. Oh shit, we might have just made him angry. However, before the fatalistic thoughts could continue, laughter began to erupt from the giant villain. Great peals of stupid and juvenile laughter. He started laughing so hard that he actually began to shrink, losing his inhuman strength enough for Venom to break free. Venom jumped back, about to figure out a plan of action when he noticed the villain was now an average-sized man who looked extremely confused. Where am I? What was I doing? Venom's sweat dropped clearly not expecting a third personality out of the same individual today. Regardless, Venom knocked the guy out just to be safe. As he signaled for the cops to cuff the guy, Venom couldn't help but think how glad he was that today was over. Chapter 15 You had one job. Izuka was currently annoyed. First, his girlfriend and Shuto were now taking their provisional license exams, meaning he had no source of hugs. Next, he along with Itoshi, had been forced to deal with the shiny metal fanboy, who was currently following them around begging to join the team. At first, they made him do a bunch of silly things using Hitoshi's quirk, but they started to feel bad after they made him shout his undying love for waffles in a crowded intersection. They had at least had the foresight to make him wear a mask to hide his dignity. They were really just trying to make him go away, so he wouldn't get hurt. Currently, they found themselves sitting on a roof, 
hanging out and eating some hamburgers they'd bought from a local fast food place. Dude, I think he might actually be serious about joining us. Circumstances of his contribution aside, he was helpful. Hitoshi drawled in his usual manner, decked in his gear. He had his balaclava partially drawn up so he could eat one of the burgers he and Izuku had just purchased. Between the two of them, they had purchased about fourteen between them. I know. It's sort of inspiring. Although, he probably doesn't remember the fact we just made him dance like a pop star on the roof for twenty minutes. Wonder how he'd take that? Izuku asked, his own mask retracted so he could also indulge in the burgers. Hitoshi shrugged, but before he could speak, Tetsu climbed up to the roof they were on. So assuming we let you join, what's your quirk? I get hard. Tetsu blurted out excitedly. Excuse me? I mean I harden my skin into steel. Oh, that makes more sense. Before Izuka could ask for specifics, Tetsu bowed in an exaggerated manner, prostrating himself in front of them. Please, you have to let me join. At the lack of response from either vigilante, Tetsu pressed on. I look up to you. Even more than the Crimson Riot. You do what's right regardless of whether it's legal or not. At his genuine words, Izuka was suddenly reminded of the way he used to look at All Might. His hero worship aside, he had looked up to All Might for many of the same reasons that Tetsu had listed, and to hear them spoken back to himself was a very warm experience. The idea that anyone could look up to him, despite all he'd done as a vigilante, was a surreal experience. Kid, that's just your lingering insecurities speaking. You're not the same helpless kid you were before. You're a bona fide hero now. Don't forget that. Tetsu. Thank you. But I just do what needs to be done. I didn't want to wait to start trying to help people. Half the time my body just moves on its own. So when you rushed out to help us just because you were on the news, that impressed the hell out of me, Tetsu. I mean, do you think I can be a great hero too? Tetsu asked, his usual bravado missing. In its place was a teenager who didn't have a super flashy quirk, who doubted himself. Izuka saw this, and clapped a hand on Tetsu's shoulder. Yes, buddy. I do think you can be a hero. Venom smiled, or at least the exposed part of his face did. Now come on, and have a burger on us. X. Young Mirio, are you sure you want to do this? The voice of All Might spoke to his apprentice. Mirio Togato was a lot like All Might's other form. Blonde, muscular, and cheerful. His face held a rather carefree and goofy smile and he was giving his mentor a thumbs up. Uh Uh-huh. I need to meet the guy who almost got your quirk instead of me. I've watched him in action, but I want to know what kind of person he is under the mask. Mirio responded casually, his eyes lit with determination. Very well. Let's go. X. The two vigilantes and their sidekick were now sitting in a circle in an alleyway. Izuka had Hitoshi take some action shots with his phone, which Izuka would then use to get some cash from the local news outlets. Hitoshi was happy to help, as he knew Izuka was a little skim in the cash department. It was actually the symbiote's idea, as Peter had actually done the same when he first debuted. Izuka dusted off his hands before looking at Tetsu. All right. I want you to hit me in the face as hard as you can using your quirk. Izuka spoke calmly, voice steady and smooth. Dude, are you sure? Tetsu spoke hesitantly unsure of how to handle his idol asking to get hit in the face. Izuka just looked at him funny. Tetsu, I get slammed through enough buildings and vehicles that insurance companies are considering adding a venom clause to natural disaster insurance. Just give me your best swing. Tetsu shrugged, and then encased his arm in steel, before he swung and caught him in the jaw, knocking him back a bit. Izuka looked at him appreciatively. Not bad, rookie. Not bad at all. Izuka was about to throw away the wrap of their last hamburger when he noticed a face staring at him from the wall. Hi. Holy shit. Izuka backflipped away, before settling on a wall opposite of the mysterious face in the wall. Hitoshi and Tetsu looked at him like he was crazy, until they saw the cheerful smiling face sticking out of the wall. You have a danger sense that is all-knowing. Why are you still such a spaz? Less Izuka criticizing, more dealing with the damn face in the wall. Izuka screamed mentally. Are, are you a newer cape? Izuka asked hesitantly. And newer cape are demon walls in Japanese folklore. 
They are also annoying as F asterisk 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 to kill in Nile. The face in the wall then became confused. Why would I be a Nurikabe? Are you an Enigimo? And Demon Spider. Again, an annoying dick of a boss in Nile. I'm not on trial here. You jumped me. Izuka shot back. Well, that's fine. I'm Mirio Togata. Successor to All Might and you are Izuku Midoriya, better known as Venom. Izuku was about to get angry when the skeletal form of All Might climbed onto the roof from the fire escape. Jesus Christ, All Might. I'm glad I didn't give you my social security. Otherwise, I'm sure everyone would know it by now. At Izuku's sarcastic remarks, All Might had the decency to look sheepish. I promise he was the only other person, young Midadash. Whatever platitudes Yagi was going to state were cut off by Tetsu rushing up to Izuku. Holy Krapam Jorne Masai Izuku wait like the Gadating Kirishima's friend Dash. Came the word vomit from Tetsu, full fandom mode engaged. Izuku didn't really know how to handle this, so he just sort of webbed Tetsu's mouth shut. I don't really know what you just said, so I'm gonna leave you like that until you calm down. Izuku shifted focus to All Might. So to what do I owe the pleasure, symbol of peace, and Mirio? Tashinori coughed awkwardly, unsure of how to proceed. However, it was Mirio who spoke excitedly in response to the question. I wanted to meet the guy who almost beat me out as successor to All Might. Izuka raised a brow under his mask, but said nothing. That, and despite our differing methods, we both want to help people. You just didn't let bureaucracy stop you. Mirio then stepped out of the ground naked as the day he was born. Izuka was shocked by the exposed stranger before Mirio was handed pants from All Might. Glossing over the nudity, Mirio was an hulking guy. He was very muscular and tall, around six feet tall. He had friendly, but odd-looking eyes, and his hair was up in a pompadour. Ah, uh, thanks, I think. Izuku was unsure of how to interact with Mirio. He was everything All Might seemed to be. Odd question. You ever played Fallout? Ah, uh, no. Why? No reason. Izuka turned to Shinso. I mind, take our friends somewhere else. I need to speak to them alone. Hitoshi nodded, before leading Tetsu down the fire escape to give them some privacy. X. Izuka stood observing Mirio and All Might, who were whispering to each other, while waiting for the other party to speak. Now that Hitoshi and Tetsu were gone, they could speak freely. All right, All Might. I thought I made it clear I didn't really want to see you around last time we met. So I'm assuming you have a good reason beyond wanting to remind me of every negative interaction we've had. Izuku spoke nonchalantly, although there was definitely a hint of bitterness in his voice. He was still unsure of how to take the offhand comment of you were almost All Might's successor. Tashinori sighed, rubbing his head sheepishly as he thought of the words he wanted to say. Mirio wanted to meet you. I didn't really want to come, but he was insistent that I did as a mediator. He didn't believe me when I said you didn't exactly like me. Hey, I just thought it'd be easier if I had a familiar face to introduce us. Mirio interjected, not happy with his mentor's explanation. Look, Tintin, I don't know what he told you, but he and I are not friends. He hurt me in a big way, so kindly tell me what you want so I can leave. Izuku was full on annoyed at this point. The suit was making him a little less reserved in displaying that, and he definitely hadn't worked all his issues with all might out of his system. Mirio seemed to get disheartened at that but he pressed on. I wanted to suggest an alliance. It'll help you get legitimacy as a hero sooner and allow us to team up. In case you didn't notice, I already have a team. And that's arrogant of you to assume that I want or need your help. What's important is that I help people. Whether society accepts or rejects that isn't my problem. Don't misunderstand, I have nothing against you. I'm just a little irritated right now. Izuka glanced at All Might briefly before cutting his gaze back to Mirio. I'm not opposed to helping you out if the situation demands, but neither is that something I just want to openly commit to. Mirio seemed saddened, but he ultimately nodded his head. That's fine, I guess. For now. Izuka shrugged, before turning to All Might. So the UA students get back tomorrow, right? Tashinori nodded in confirmation. He'd been hearing bits and pieces about what was happening at the provisional license exams. The students that Izuka had trained were outshining the others by a wide margin, which led to faculty concerns about them being flight risks. That's correct. 
In case you're curious, it seems every student you trained is on course to pass. But I'm sure you assumed as much. Izuka said nothing, but his venom outfit shifting into full form. As fun as this is, I don't really feel like being around you guys any longer. You got what you wanted, so now I'm going to go be a hero. Enjoy the retirement all might. With a subtle barb thrown all might's way, Venom shot up into the sky, before using his earpiece to dial high mind. As the phone rang, Venom had moved several city blocks, and observed the hustle and bustle of city life in its natural flow. On the sixth ring, Hive Mind answered. Yo, Izuku. Came Hitoshi's usual board drawl, with a few sirens going off in the background. Where are you? And what the hell is that racket in the background? Oh, that? Some bald hero fought a crab monster. Beat the thing in one punch, and now he's screaming to himself and smacking the ground. It's pretty weird. I see. How's Tetsu? Izuka wasn't sure how to react to that so he just pressed on with his point. Hitoshi sighed, but answered nonetheless. He's got a good heart, and he's not stupid. Just super inexperienced. I'd say you need to give him a training camp experience before letting him tag along. He did, however, shield a couple from harm when that pro was fighting the creature. He jumped without prodding, shielding them with his quirk from some collateral debris chunks that were flying around. I say we keep him around. Agreed. We'll talk more tomorrow. I'm tired, and I'm about to crash on my feet. We'll meet up at UA to greet the others tomorrow morning, yeah? Sounds good to me. Later, Izuku. Elsewhere. Tamura Shigaraki was sipping on a soda can as he watched the news. His fingers twitched every time someone mentioned Venom, and he was getting more irritated the longer the news spoke about the vigilante. He began mumbling incoherently, only to be interrupted by Kuro Jairi walking over to him suddenly. Master Tamira, we have a problem. The containment unit has failed. Your experimental, raid boss, is about to get out. The Black Mist villain spoke calmly, before using the nearby remote to flick the channel to a security camera feed. The feed was unstable, and flickering. However, a large silhouette was visible in the smoke. It was hulkingly massive, both muscular and tall, sitting around seven feet tall. Its hair appeared spiky through smoke and its left arm writhing as it it has a mind of its own. The face wasn't visible but a beak-like projection jutted out from the creature's face. No, Kuro Jairi. Don't you see? This is perfect. Get whoever is around ready. We're about to initiate our raid. The boss is now in place, right? So let's go, Venom. It's your turn. Roll for initiative. As they looked back at the camera feed, the figure raised its hand at the camera explosions resonating on its right hand. The camera feed cut, but the audio was working long enough to pick up one single word. Kill. Chapter 16 Revelations and Birth of the Second Symbol Izuka woke up with a dull tug at his spider sense. He groaned before looking at his clock, which read half past eight in the morning. He didn't have to meet up with Mina and the others for another hour, and given his method of travel, he could be there in five minutes. As the fog of drowsiness faded, he realized that the tug hadn't faded. He wasn't sure why, but there was an ominous note in the air. It hung like a cloud of foreboding, but without the telltale signs of ongoing crisis, there wasn't much he could do about it. So he shrugged and got out of bed, readying himself to meet up with his friends at UA and maybe make some breakfast. He sent a mental greeting to his partner, who more or less gave the non-corporeal beings equivalent of I am not ready to function yet. Izuka noticed his mother sitting in the living room, drinking coffee while she watched the news. Morning, Mom, Izuka greeted, catching his mother's attention. She smiled at him and set her coffee cup down before she replied. Izuku, good morning. What's got you up so early? You usually like to sleep in on your days off. Izuka chuckled. Mina gets back from her licensure trip today. I wanted to greet her when she arrived back at her dorms. Inko's eyes welled up with her trademark tears before she wailed out. Oh, Izuku, my baby boy is a romantic gentleman. I'm so proud. Izuku just patted his mom on the shoulder, unsure of what else to do. He was about to reply when his eyes caught something on the news. He grabbed the remote and unmuted the TV. The warehouse was completely destroyed. While it was on the outskirts of Mustafa, authorities are advising caution as it could be the work of a villain. 
We will update this story as details come in. The screen shifted between an overlay of the anchor and field reporters into an overhead view of a decimated warehouse. It wasn't in a very populated location, but the level of destruction was immense. Rubble was everywhere, with burn marks discoloring the walls that were still standing. Some rocks were charred black and there were small indentions scattered throughout the ruins. There weren't any bodies yet, but they could just be hidden under the piles of debris. Given what Izuka could see, it could have resulted from a gas line rupturing and combusting. Only issue with that theory is the small claw marks that were interspersed across the rubble. Granted, it could be nothing, but the scene made him feel even more uneasy than before. He was tempted to try to investigate, but he didn't want to upset the uneasy peace he currently had with pros and law enforcement officials. Shaking his head, he checked his watch. He still had about ten minutes before he needed to leave. Izuku? His mother's voice jarred him from his thoughts. He looked at her, noticing the look of worry on her face. Yes, Mom? What's wrong? He replied evenly, not wanting to upset her or cause more tears this early in the morning. I know things are going well in school for you, as you're currently ranked second in your class. I know things are going well for you with Mina as well, but we never talked about you wanting to be a hero again after you graduated. I wanted to bring it up sooner, but you're always so busy. Are you okay, honey? I know that was your dream, and I don't want you to be disappointed. Izuku was surprised. Had he really never spoken to his mom after getting his powers? That would explain why she always seemed so uneasy whenever the topic of futures came up when Mina visited, he mused. He realized he hadn't replied to her, and he smiled reassuringly. Mom, don't worry. I know what I want to do, and believe it or not, being a pro hero doesn't totally have the same appeal to me that it did before. I'm happy, though. I promise. He gave her a hug, before he shrugged on his green hoodie and moved to the door. Love you, Mom. I'll try to be home early tonight, so we can watch movies or something, okay? Inko looked much more relieved at hearing her son's answer, and she gave a nod before smiling. Sounds good, Izuku. Be safe, okay? You know me, Mom. I'm always careful. X. Elsewhere. A bulking figure stumbled through the forest, walking with no real aim or reason. Explosions danced on its right arm, while the left wriggled wildly of its own volition. It lumbered towards the sounds of the city, longing to fulfill its purpose, the one it was given in the Taken. To kill and destroy. These words also filled it with unease at the same time, for reasons it could not remember. The creature shook its head, before turning towards the pair of hikers that had come across its journey. It watched them waiting for them to attack and try to defeat him. They stood shaking in fear, and turned to run away. The creature clicked its beak at the show of weakness, raised a hand, and uttered one of the few words it knew. Die. Explosions ripped out through the clearing, before an eerie silence settled in their place. The creature continued onward, looking towards Musatafa town. X. Izuku was decked in his partial suit, jumping from roof to roof towards Yue, hoping to be the first to arrive. Call him old-fashioned, but the leader should be the first and last to leave a meeting. Leading by example, and such. He passed several heroes on duty in the streets, but as he'd discovered in his times as a vigilante, many heroes simply do not think to look up when they patrol. Odd, but he wasn't about to complain about something that worked to his advantage. The feeling of dread that lingered in the air didn't seem to affect anyone but him, as the people were carrying on about their day as normal. No sirens, no screams. Izuka shook his head. Now wasn't the time to get lost in thoughts. He had to go greet his team, and more importantly, his wonderful girlfriend who passed her license exam. But should he bring her a gift as a congratulatory reward? Yes. The sudden input by his partner startled Izuku, and he came an inch from smacking his face into a wall. Only between his reflexes and experience with his movements prevented him from looking rather lame. Smooth, kid. Real smooth and to offer my awesome advice, yes, you should get her a gift. Peter did that a lot for Felicia. Conversely, her reactions usually left deep scars on me. She was freaky. Izuka paused at that. Freaky, he silently asked his partner, his poor, sweet, innocent mind not realizing the implication in his symbiote's words. You don't want to know. But trust me, Mina will be glad. Small, but spontaneous gestures that show you care often go over the best. Take it from someone who coached a guy even more awkward than you. 
Izuka's sweat dropped. His partner never was one for modesty. Shaking his head, he changed direction to swing by a retro video outlet. With any luck, they'd have aliens merchandise. Mina Ashido was tired. Very, very tired. She slugged her way off the bus. She cast her tired gaze at Todoroki, who looked no worse for wear than he had before they'd left for the exams. Momo looked flawless as always, and she was holding Shuto's hand rather firmly. Their seemingly unaffectedness irked Mina a bit. While Mina found the practical portion of the exam to be a breeze, given the level of Izuka's torture, read, training, she and the rest of the outsiders had very little trouble with the other applicants. Some students from Shiketsu High School were really the only people who gave them issues. Mina never got their names, but they weren't able to overcome the combined teamwork of her, Shuto, and Momo. No, Mina Ashido was tired for one very simple reason, the written exam. It made her brain hurt, and she hated that stupid paper. She'd scored enough to pass given her impeccable score on the practical, but she was still burned out from taking the stupid thing. All she knew is that Izuka owed her some cuddles and smooches. She chuckled darkly at her plans for her little cinnamon roll. Izuka, who was sitting on a nearby rooftop, felt a dark, yet exciting chill go up his spine for reasons he could not explain. Mina glanced around for Izuku and Hitoshi, but didn't immediately see either of them. She sighed in disappointment. Who are you looking for? Izuka's teasing voice rang out behind her, causing her to screech and jump a few feet in the air. This got some concerned looks from the surrounding students, but when they realized there was no immediate threat, they went back to their own conversations. She turned around and glared at him, while he smiled softly at her. However, the smile faded a bit when she swatted him on the head. Izuku! You mean me! You scared me! Mina paused a moment, realizing who she was talking to. Izuku! This was a much less angry exclamation, and it was punctuated by Mina launching herself at her curly-headed boyfriend. He laughed, before returning the hug. I wanted to mess with you a bit. I couldn't help it. Plus, I had to make a small detour. He held up a small stuffed alien plushie, which Mina had not noticed in his hand. Congratulations on passing Mina! Mina didn't say anything for a moment, before she slammed her lips against his and did her best to suffocate him with her lips. Izuku waved his arms frantically in the air, before she pulled away, allowing him to reunite with oxygen. Mina noted the goofy grin on his face. Thank you, tiger. I love him. She beamed at him, causing him to go beat red in the face. Izuku scratched his cheek nervously as he replied. Oh, of course, Mina! I know how much you like xenomorphs, so I tried to find one for you. I also was going to take you to a dinner and a movie as part of the congratulations as well. I got us reservations at a cool restaurant that I crashed into. At this, Mina looked amused. The owner wouldn't happen to owe Venom a favor, would they? At Izuku's silence, she took pity on him and laughed. Relax, Izuku. I'm just kidding. If the food is great, then that's all that matters to me. It was this point that Hitoshi and Shudo joined them and brought them back to their surroundings. So now that the gang is back together, what's the plan? Hitoshi asked in his usual bored drawl. Shudo merely nodded his head, showing he too was curious. Izuka was about to answer when a huge explosion ripped in the distance, roughly on the outskirts of Mustafa. The shockwave was big enough that it made them stumble, which was not exactly a promising sign for anyone who was closer to the blast. Izuka got to his feet, before he looked at his team. The plan? We go see what the hell caused that, and if needed, stop it. X. Elsewhere. Mirio Togata climbed out of the rubble the creature had blasted him into. He glanced around himself, noting that what had previously been a city block was now a crater. He had stumbled onto the creature during his patrol for his practical hours he needed for graduation. He recognized it as a Nomu from the League of Villains, but this one was different than the others he'd read about. It was roughly six and a half feet tall and possessed a muscular frame. Its eyes were red and crazed, and its face had a beak over the mouth, which was lined with razor-sharp teeth. Spiky blonde hair was visible on top of its head, and explosions rippled on its right arm. Speaking of the creature's arms, the right arm was very different from the left. The right looked like it was made of tough, yet rubbery sinew, and was a mixture of maroon and black in color. Running along the back of that arm appeared to be a tube that had a hole above the back of its wrist. The left arm was just a riding mass of what looked like a shadow. 
It was formed into a claw like appendage currently, but there were two yellow eyes in between the knuckles surround the middle claw, as well as a mouth in the palm of the hand. The creature's body was milky white, with black lines running down the chest and sides. It was every bit as muscular as the arm was, and also seemed to be made of rubbery flesh. It wore green shorts which were currently ripped, probably due to how massive the beast was. Its legs were no different, and were proportional to the rest of its body. All in all, it was a monster, and Mirio wasn't sure that even with his progress into 50% of one for all would be enough to stop it. But he also knew that there was only one or two other heroes he felt could fight this thing to the degree he could. The other pros weren't equipped to handle a creature like this. Mirio shook his head. He couldn't think in such fatalistic terms. He was Lemillion, successor to All Might. He would stop this beast and prove he was worthy. He was about to make his move when psychotic laughter rang out through the now quiet area. Oh man, Kirojiri. This thing is even more deadly than I thought. X. Izuku stood on the roof overlooking the scene in his venom suit. He examined and analyzed the scene below him. There was some sort of creature, probably a Nomu, that Mirio guy, and a group of people that were probably villains. At the helm of the villains was a guy with shaggy light blue hair, who wore a bunch of glove-looking things on his body. The guy was clearly the leader of the villains, if his posture and psychotic laughter was any indication. All around the crater, there were bystanders and a news chopper circled overhead. This was it. After this, they would either be true heroes or outlaws. Venom turned his head enough to glance back at his team. They nodded, and Shudo removed his helmet. They all moved to the ledge. They had to make an entrance. After all, everyone loved shock and all. The silence was oppressive, and the tension was thick in the air. Lemillion was starting to get worried. He was sure he could handle the group of villains and the creature individually, but together? The odds weren't so great. However, before he could do anything, a huge fireball shot through the sky, and several figures landed between him and the villains. As the dust cleared, the slim figure of Venom rose up and looked to the bystanders and the news chopper. In his dark, distorted voice, one sentence rang out for everyone to hear. Fear not, citizens, for we are here. And with that, Venom raised an arm and a thumbs up to those around him. Cheers broke out among the crowd, and Venom turned his gaze to the league. We don't know your name, but give your attire. You're clearly the crazy-ass leader. We will give you one chance to end this peacefully, villain. It was then that Venom felt the ground next to him shift, before the muscular figure of Mirio rose up beside him, a heroic grin on his face and his arms crossed. Indeed, villain, for how could you stand against the might of Venom and Lemillion, let alone the outsiders as well? The TV displayed a frantic news anchor, who was in the process of losing his mind over the entrance of Venom and the outsiders. Despite the optimism of the reporter, All Might watched the TV with worry. This was it. He couldn't save the day anymore. This time, he was the powerless observer. He could only hope that Mirio's prodigal talent with one for all combined with his own quirk would be enough. He knew that Venom would be a help, but he didn't think that the kid would be much use to Mirio. He knew Venom was tough, and was better than a lot of pros out there. But this was all for one's final move. The contingency he planned in the event he was removed from the chessboard. A supernomu, with abilities they were not totally aware of. Throw in the entirety of the remaining League of Villains members, and this was a fight on par with his own with All for One. Tashinori bit his lip with worry. The other big name pros were busy handling other supervillains in the city. The League's movement brought both big and small time independent villains out of the woodwork, so it was an all hands on deck situation. So for now, Venom and Lemillion know, Izuku and Mirio were on their own. Silence. The villain stared at them, before his shoulders began to shake, subtle at first with chuckles soft until it grew into full peals of psychotic cackling. I don't think you have a grasp of the situation at all. I have as much control over this thing as you do. It vaguely recognizes me as someone not to kill. That's about it. Other than that, everything is a target to that hulking monstrosity. It's wonderful, right? The villain smiled widely in a manic fashion, peals of crazed laughter escaping him, all while spreading his arms out in that grandiose way villains typically do. This made both Venom and Lemillion share a glance and frown. This guy was clearly unhinged and had a lust for destruction. That made him more unpredictable and dangerous than your run-of-the-mill villain. 
not to mention they had no idea what the hell his quirk was. All in all, this was a far from an ideal scenario. Hey, Venom. Lemillion's voice brought Venom out of his tactical analysis. I say we rush the guy, take him out, and let the rest of your team handle to small timers. They can handle that, right? Venom racked his brain at the suggestion, and failed to find an issue with it. Yes, while they don't have the experience we have fighting actual villains, but they're more than capable of handling the average villain. Venom spoke calmly, for some reason, looking at the bulking beast filled him with a sense of familiarity, and dread. We will relay the plan to our team. If they make a move, can you run interference for us until we finish? Lamilia nodded before subtly shifting to a reactionary stance. Venom tapped his earpiece under his mask. Guys, we along with Lemillion are going to handle Handjob and Monstro over there. You guys are going to have to handle the generic villain brigade. Think you can handle a team? His tone was joking but there was a hint of worry in voice. He wouldn't be able to pull them out of the fire if they got in over their heads, if the big baddies were even half as powerful as he thought they would be. Alien Queen blew a raspberry at him, Hive Mind grunted, and Celsius just raised a brow skeptically, like he just asked the dumbest question in the world. I mean if we aren't then I guess you're just a shitty teacher. Hive mind remarked dryly. Alien Queen laughed, and Celsius snorted in amusement. Venom's eye twitched under his mask, but he realized the banter helped calm the nerves. It was a strategy he himself employed when he had first started out, and it had just stuck with him. All right, outsiders, Geo! The outsider leapt into action towards the villains, while Lamillion and Venom rushed the leader and the monster. The fight between the Outsiders and the League of Villains had just started. To be Conti just kidding. High Mind stood with Alien Queen and Celsius at his side, staring at the villains with a bored expression. So out of curiosity, how many of you actually like working for Handjob? At this, about a third of them voiced some complaints. High Mind grinned like a kid in a candy store when they did. All right, go beat the shit out of the rest. At the command, the horde of villains were now split three ways, the brainwashed, and conditioned, heh, the ones fighting the brains washed, and the ones that would be fighting the outsiders. All in all, this left about twenty villains they would have to between the three of them. Celsius looked at the remaining twenty analytically, the gears in his head spinning rapidly. He nodded to himself, plan in mind. I say we fight in tandem. High Mind needs to maintain concentration, so he won't be able to fight too much. Hive Mind nodded, an alien queen pouted clearly wanting to show off how much she'd grown to the world at large. That means you handle two of them, Hive, while Queen and I can handle the remaining eighteen villains. Both nodded their agreement, before they activated their HUDs in their helmets. Celsius tapped a few buttons on the side of his helmet, which tapped them into the broadcast frequency the news chopper that was nearby was utilizing, and he began to address both the nation and the villains. Attention, citizens of Japan and the villains before us. My name is Celsius, and I'm a member of the hero group known as the Outsiders. However, you may know me better as the son of the number one hero endeavor. As such, I would recommend you surrender, given that a third of you are currently under our control and fighting another third. We are heroes, and we are here to help. We may not be licensed, but we will fight tooth and nail to defend you. X. The chief of police stood watching the broadcast with both the mayor of Mustafa and Principal Nizu of Yue. He looked at his fellow onlookers, before sighing. We cannot ignore this any longer. We must either formally arrest Venom and his accomplices Dash. He ceased speaking when he caught the visage of one of the vigilantes speaking on the TV. My name is Celsius, and I'm a member of the hero group known as the Outsiders. However, you may know me better as the son of the number one hero endeavor. All three men slash sentient beings jumped to their feet at this information. The winner of the school festival and son of the new number one hero was a vigilante? This completely derailed any thoughts of arrest. There would be riots if they moved to arrest people who rose to action in a crisis, particularly when one was the child of a prolific hero-like endeavor, while the other was a man of the people like Venom was. And that's without taking into consideration that they are currently fighting off one of the largest organized villain attacks in recent history. No, this took arresting them off the table leaving only one option that didn't lead to people losing faith in authority figures' sense of justice. As the chief looked at both the mayor and Nizu, it appeared they too had come to the same conclusion. Nizu was the next to speak. So here is what me must do. 
Lemillion was rocketed backwards by an explosion, while Venom leaped to the side and clung to a pile of rubble. Hansi seemed to be less interested in a fight he viewed as futile, so he was more focused on the fight between the other members of the Outsiders and his forces. He laughed derisively as he saw them begin fighting among themselves. Man, you guys have some interesting members. It's a shame I couldn't get my hands on them before you. Come on, tall, pale, and crazy. You don't really think they'd join your creepy-looking self, do you? Seriously, Dio called. He wants his obnoxious Sunday outfit back. You talk a lot. I don't like that very much. So I'm going to shut you up now. At this, the guy rushed Venom, grabbing the rubble Venom was sticking to. What the hell is he doing? As if answering his question, in typical villain style, the blue-haired creep made the fatal flaw of any credible villain, explaining his powers. Impressive, huh? I break down anything I touch with all five fingers on a cellular level dash. So that leads us to the obvious question. Did you find this out when you tried to choke the chicken for the first time? We bet that was a rude surprise. This lead to another angry swipe and attempt at grabbing Venom's throat, which was easily dodged. Hold still you damn nuisance! Tamura growled in anger, starting to lose his cool from the taunts. We suppose that's better than some recurring gag of being called an insect and being forced to explain that arachnids are not insects. That would be annoying. Venom punched Tamura, before following up with a back flip kick to the blue haired teen's chin. This sent him flying backwards, skidding across the dirt. Tamura growled, clearly pissed by this point. He looked over at the Nomu, before he barked out a command. NOMU! Release inhibitors. Blast this city to pieces! The hulking Nomu, which had previously been fighting Lemillion to a standstill, froze a moment before it roared out. Kill! With the left arm began writing uncontrollable and large explosions rippled out from its body, which then decimated the surrounding area. The blast threw everyone back, and took out a good chunk of the infighting villains who were too close to survive the blast. The shockwaves from the blast even rocked the news helicopter that was circling overhead. Dust settled in and around the crater with Lemillion emerging and scathed from the ground in front of the monster. The creature was breathing heavily, red eyes crazed and wild darting around the crater. The fights with the fodder villains had mostly subsided, with many either killed or too injured by the blast, or incapacitated by the outsiders, who had dispatched quite a few before they'd been interrupted by the Nomu going nuclear. They shook their heads before tying up any remaining villains, and then moving their attention to the crater, unsure of what to do next. Venom climbed out of some rubble, with a bloody Tamura in tow. Wow, you really did not think that through, did you? Or maybe you are that crazy? Serious question, did you take villain lessons from Heath Ledger's Joker? Because if so, you may want to pick a more successful villain to idolize. Despite his quips, Venom was not as unscathed as he appeared to be. He definitely had some cracked ribs, and Mr. Handy there had grabbed his left arm in the confusion and seared through his suit down to his muscle tissue. His symbiote had regenerated, but he'd probably need to see a doctor after this. This prompted a groan. Hospitals were expensive, which meant he'd have to get a lot more pictures of himself to sell to the paper to cover those bills. Looking back at Tamura, who hadn't responded verbally to his jabs, only choosing to spit at him. This annoyed Venom, so he threw the injured villain to his team. Jeez, you save a guy's life and his response is attempted maiming as well as spit on you. What's the world coming to? Venom shook his head, before he looked to hive mind. Deal with him. He's hurt, and you're the best equipped to handle him. Lemillion's going to nade my help. I have a feeling this creature was going easy before. Having said his piece, Venom jumped back down into the crater for the biggest fight of his life. High mind and the others just looked at Tamura, who stared back. High mind shrugged and asked, So what do you do for fun besides orchestrate cosplay conventions? Tamura shook in anger at being mocked. How dare you insult Dash? He stopped mid-sentence before shifted into a robotic stance. Okay, first thing first, how does your quirk work? Can't have you using it to get away from us, can we? I disintegrate anything I touch with all five of my fingertips. Oh. Well, that's an easy fix. He turned his attention to Celsius, before removing his gloves and handing them to the half-and-half -half hero. Here, burn the pinky finger off of these, then give them back to me. Realizing what he was getting at, Celsius quickly did as he was asked. Taking the gloves back from his teammate, 
I mind walked back over to Tamura and handed him the gloves, along with some medical tape, some finger splints, and handcuffs. Okay, put these gloves on first, and then wrap your pinkies up with the splints to keep the fingers straight. When you're done, put the handcuffs on behind your back. Tightly. Nice job, Hypnotoad. Alien Queen cheered happily. No problem, and never call me that again. High Mind replied in an annoyed manner. Having effectively neutralized the leader with minimal effort, they turned their attention back to what would be the monstrous fight that lay ahead. Lemillion didn't turn to face his contemporary as Venom landed beside him. No, he kept his eyes locked on the creature before him. To look away for a second would be to invite disaster. So I'm assuming you've come to the same conclusion I did. This thing has two main quirks for offense, and a litany of others to amplify and mitigate negative effects of the others. Venom nodded in response. Any ideas as to what they might be? Venom was quiet a moment. So far, it looks like combustion and shadow manipulation. Think you can fight him for a few minutes while I analyze him? I know it's risky, but so is trying to learn on the fly. I promise I only need two minutes to get enough information we need. Lemillion grimaced, but nodded. Holding out against the creature for that long wasn't an issue. It was more a matter of how much collateral damage would there be as a result of that engagement. Okay, here goes nothing. Lemillion rushed the creature, drawing back a punch with his right arm and charging it up with energy, before crying out. Blinder touch eyeball crush! The attack sounded rather brutal, so Venom was very confused when the punch went right through the creature's head. However, he then saw Lemillion slam his left fist directly into the creature's gut sending the creature flying like it had just been punched by All Might himself. It slammed into the far wall of the crater, sinking into it slightly. However, it didn't seem very worse for wear, as it climbed out of the impact hole rather quickly, though Venom noted an odd shiver that ran through the creature's body from its abdomen as it did so. Any idea what that was? It seemed like it was shock absorption, but that seems too obvious. He asked his symbiote, since he needed as much help as he could get in this fight. As far as I can tell, it seems like it has shock absorption to an extent but take a look at its arms and chest. They're a little different than they were before the huge blast. Venom used his lens zoom feature to closer examine the creature's body. Sure enough, the skin was more calloused and darker in color than it had been before, particularly around the blast generation zones. Rapid regeneration? No, or else the skin would be more or less the same, without the addition of calluses. Izuka stopped cold. A chilling thought, one he prayed was wrong, ran through his head. Shaking his head, he then zoomed in on the creature's hands, specifically on its palm on the. I hope I'm wrong but. Zooming in, he saw that the right hand was the most calloused in its palm, which was the epicenter of the bigger blasts. Before Venom could stop himself, two words slipped out of his mouth. Kakin? Bakugo? X. Mitsuki Bakugo had not been having a good year. She was volatile at the best of times, and the disappearance of her son had only exacerbated that to the point her marriage was falling apart around her. She had tuned into the news broadcast when she'd heard that the self-proclaimed League of Villains, the ones who had taken her son, were enacting a grand finale. She had rushed home to watch the TV broadcast, hoping for some hint of her son's fate, where he was now a villain, or dead, or just anything that would help her finally start the process of moving on. So when the broadcast picked up Venom's words, she came to two very world-shattering realizations, which caused the normally fiery woman into tears. She doubted the first word would mean much to most people, but to her it was damning. The first conclusion? Her son's childhood friend was the country's number one vigilante. But that wasn't why she was sobbing. No, the reason she was sobbing was because it meant her son was now a monster. X. Those words rang out through the crater. The creature, which had been readying to launch itself at Lemillion, stopped and cocked its head to the side. It seemed to be confused by Venom's words, so much so that it had stopped growling, explosions halted, and the shadowy left arm seemed to dull in its writhing. Kill? The simple response would normally be menacing, but in this case, it just seemed confused by something. Like the vaguest hint of a memory that tugs at your mind before slipping through into the foggy forest of forgetfulness. The cessation of its hostility was enough to confirm Venom's suspicions. And that? That was the most horrifying part of the entire ordeal. Do you know the person that was the basis for this Nomu? 
Lemillion's words shattered Venom's tunnel vision, bringing him back to the here and now. This is not the best time, but I know you have experience with fighting these things. You probably realize there is not a way to bring back anyone who is turned into one of these things. Shut up. Don't you think I know that? X. That, that thing is Bakugo? Alien Queen's voice was trembling. It was a terrifying notion that a human being could be distorted into a monster like that. I'd always figured he'd just show up one day, battered and bruised, at the gates of the school. Just to say, I escaped. No thanks to you losers. Does that mean that Tokoyami was made into one of those things too? Celsius kept looking at the creature, specifically its left arm. He shook his head. No, I don't think so. Look at its left arm. That thing is clearly dark shadow. This tells us three important things. One, Tokoyami is most likely dead. Two, they used his quirk to make Bakugo a new arm before they made him into this creature. Lastly, it means its arm has the same weaknesses as Tokoyami's quirk did. Namely, bright lights. Hive Mind nodded at this, taking Celsius at his word. He wasn't familiar with either of the students that had gone missing, but he knew that Venom would need this information. He quickly typed up a message that would show up on Venom's suit lenses, informing him of the left arm's weaknesses. All right, so Celsius, at some point, you need make the biggest and brightest fire you possible can. Kid, break time is over. That thing is ready to attack again. You can mourn your friend later. Right now, you have to stop that thing. That thing was my friend, Venom. And there's no way to save him. You don't know that for sure. I don't, but Mirio does. He has access to files pertaining to All for One and his creations, since he is the successor to All Might. We don't. If he says Bakugo can't be saved, then he can't be saved. Venom shook his head. Now wasn't the time to argue with both sides of himself. He had to stop this creature. His eyes caught a text sent by Hive Mind. Left arm is a shadow manipulation quirk, weak to bright lights, stronger and dark. Have something planned to stop that quirk, just need time. He looked to Lemillion, who was shaking his fist out after the punch. We're pretty sure we have figured out what we need to know to stop this creature. The left arm is a shadow manipulation quirk, stronger in darkness and weaker in bright light. Lemillion frowned a bit. There was a student with a quirk like that in the freshman year, but he went missing. Be that as it may, that's not important right now. We have to stop this thing before it hurts anyone else. Lemillion sighed, but nodded. All right, while it wasn't a two-minute fight like I expected, we did get some information. What have you got? Adaptive resistance combined with shock absorption. The absorption was the reason it shook after the punch. We are sure it has adaptive resistance because the skin on the body where explosions occur is calloused up to prevent self-damage. The explosions are bigger than what Bakugo could generate on his own, so we think they added a passive ability to control oxygen levels in the vicinity of his body. Then you have the shape-shifting shadow control of the left arm that seems autonomous. Fucking hell. You said adaptive resistance? That's arguably the most problematic. Meaning the longer we drag this out, the less likely we are to win. We know. We must fight together. What are your skills, Lemillion? Lemillion sighed, but nodded. You know All Might basically made me his successor. That basically means he gave me his quirk in conjunction with my own. My quirk was originally just permeation, which I had mastered to the point of being able to become intangible at will. Now I can use the abilities of All Might along with my own. It's a rather symbiotic partnership. Venom twitched at the word symbiotic, but said nothing. I'm not at All Might's level. I can't go into specifics, but basically, I'm only able to use 60% of his quirk right now. He says I have a rather prodigious grasp for it, but that's not the point. Okay, intangible and All Might power. Okay, I can work with that. I'm sure you know enough about me to know I'm essentially the second coming of Spider-Man. So you know what I can do. So I'm thinking I do hit and runs, while you catch him with devastating blows. Sound good? Lemillion nodded. All right. Let's go. They leapt into action. Well, Venom did. Lemillion just sank into the ground. Using the various pipes that were sticking out of the ground in the crater, Venom swung around Bakunamu, propelling himself forward at rapid pace. As he swung around the creature, he shot webbing at its body in order to render it immobile. The malleability of the shadow arm made that difficult to do, 
as it was able to circumvent the webbing without much effort. Even still, the left the other 75% of its body immobile long enough for Lemillion to shoot out of the ground beneath it. Phantom! Menace! He shouted as planted a massive fist into Bakunama's face, sending it skyward. Venom, however, wasn't one to rest on his laurels, so he leaped towards Lemillion. Lemillion! Up! Venom cried, causing Lemillion to grip his fists and charge them, before grasping them together. Venom then placed his foot on the clasped hands, and jumped just as Lemillion shot his fists up to the sky, sending Venom flying rapidly towards Bakunamu. All right, this is so overused, big guy, but you know what they say. Venom shot as much webbing as he could before, he began to swing Bakunamu around and around in the air, before flinging him back to Lemillion, who was spinning with an arm drew back, energy crackling around the bit of his forearm. Back to you, Lemillion! Phase shift, Lariat! Lemillion's form phased through the creature, before his right forearm caught Bakunamu in the neck, and then transferred the momentum into creature's body, and slammed it into ground. It twitched for a few seconds before it stopped moving altogether. Venom landed on the ground in front of a crowd, unintentionally. They rushed for him, and Lemillion soon joined him, having checked the creature, and found no pulse. Regrettable, but necessary. Lemillion thought to himself. He glanced at Venom, who was kneeling down to talk to a kid. Whoa! Mr. Venom, you and that blonde guy made such a cool team! Venom and Lemillion chuckled, but didn't say anything. Do, do you think I can be a hero someday too? My mom worries because my quirk isn't anything super special. This caused Venom and Lemillion to glance at each other. They both kneeled down to look the child in the eyes, and each put a hand on his shoulder. You may find this difficult to believe, kid, but can you keep a secret for us? The child nodded rapidly. This caused Venom to chuckle again, before he leaned in conspiratorially, and whispered, We are actually quirkless. Or we were. This made the child's eyes grow large. Lemillion nodded as well. My mother also thought my quirk wasn't suited to hero work. But I told myself that I would surpass all might and save one million people. To do that, I mastered my quirk to the point I could use it offensively. Another shared look between the two heroes. Young man, you too can be a hero. Venom and Lemillion spoke in unison, causing the young boy's eyes to well with tears. It takes a lot of hard work and a firm sense of justice. And you can't lose faith in yourself when you make mistakes. If you can do this, then you will be a true hero like us one day. The child hugged their legs, and was crying his eyes out. Venom opened his mouth to speak, but his blood froze at a scream that sounded from the crowd and his spider sense going haywire. Look out! Venom had enough time to turn around to see Bakunama holding its right arm, and the tube that ran along it in its mouth. It screamed, Kill! Me! And it unleashed a huge blast that ripped towards the crowd in him. He shielded the boy and has used as much of his symbiote to form a shield behind his back, leaving his left arm with minimal protection. He heard a second boom, and what sounded like two trains crashing before he lost consciousness. As you can see, the creature was not yet defeated by the two brightest rising stars of the hero world. However, they were able to quickly react though we do not have a picture of where they are now. Currently, the other members of the vigilante group of the Outsiders is engaged with the creature, and are working to contain it while the civilians are evacuated. The TV that Momo and May were watching spoke calmly. How the hell the reporter was speaking so calmly while talking about the death of potential heroes was horrifying. The image showed Venom forming a shield of sorts with his suit to protect the boy, while Lemillion had slammed his fist into the ground to cause a plate of earth to lurch in front of the blast. It didn't completely stop it, but it probably saved the civilians from being killed. This is crazy. I need to make more babies to help them. May's wording was funny but her demeanor was not. She was speaking hysterically. Momo did the only thing she could and hugged her friend. Venom groaned as he returned to the realm of consciousness. He got up to move, but was forced to stop when a sharp pain shot through his left arm. He couldn't move it, and there was a piece of metal sticking out of his bicep. So he was down to one arm, which was rather ironic. Your shoulder is dislocated, and I don't really know what else to do to stop this creature. Lemillion's voice sounded beside him. Venom shook his head, before climbing to his feet. Go help them. They're not experienced enough to fight this thing yet. I'll think of something. We just need time. Venom spoke through gritted teeth, 
the pain really messing with his head. Lemillion just nodded and leapt back into the fray. Kid, I don't know how you're going to stop it. I can only really think of one way. You're going to have to cannibalize its internal organs. How can you even suggest that? That is not something a hero would do. That is not what Peter would do. Izuka growled through his teeth, before his shot back a retort to his partner. I don't know why you keep failing to notice this, but I am not Peter Parker. I am Izuka Midoriya, and I am Venom. Not Peter. His partner went quiet. I don't like it any more than you do, but my arm is completely disabled right now. We have civilians that are injured. We don't have time to deliberate, partner. I need you on my side. These people need you on my side. Will you do it? Its adaptive resistance and shock absorption have taken out all other options for the time frame we have. Please, Venom. Fine. But know this is something I will never do again. And I expect lots of chocolate for my troubles. Izuka grinned a bit and chuckled before the pain in his side reminded him of his broken ribs. You got it, partner. Let's go save the city, shall we? X. High Mind was having mixed success using his quirk on the creature. For some reason, he was able to affect it enough to make it docile every few seconds. Kill. Me. The creature would say this every time it was under his control. It was, concerning to say the least. He glanced at the others. Most of Celsius' suit was shredded and burnt. Alien Queen was at her limit for acid production. Lemillion's left eye was swollen shut, and he had a cut over it that bleed profusely. All in all they could use a miracle. Lemillion! Venom called as if on K. We need you to pry its mouth open. Quickly! They all turned to see Izuka without the majority of his outfit on. Only the black face mask and the tech lenses shielded his identity. What stood out was the giant riding mass of black that was formed around his right arm. It had teeth, spread in that same manic grin Izuka usually had on in costume. Without another word, he charged down the side of the crater, rushing towards Bakunamu. Lemillion grabbed the beast, prying open its mouth, while High Mind made it as docile as he could with his own quirk. Venom leapt up in the air, before shoving his writhing right arm down the creature's mouth, with a roar of triumph. With only minor resistance from Bakunama's left arm, the creature did not struggle as much as it should have. It slowed down as the symbiote cannibalized it, until Bakunama stopped moving, this time for good. The left arm dissipated entirely, it stopped breathing. Its eyes shut. He drew his arm out of what was left of his first friend. He felt a lot of things. Regret being the most prevalent. However, he stumbled back a bit, and almost fell, but Lemillion caught him. He didn't say anything, he turned them to face the crowd that had returned, as well as the news helicopter. He shared a look with the blonde hero, and in a single motion, they both raised their arms, Venom's right and Lemillion's left, and struck the pose of victory the former symbol of peace had after his own triumphant victory. As the cheers began, they smiled and laughed. The other outsiders moved up beside them, and they knew they had done it. They had stopped the monster. And they were finally the heroes they'd wanted to be. Epilogue Izuka was running very, very late. Why was he running late, you may be wondering. Well, that's because he was running late to a lone meeting he was supposed to be at with May about starting their own support company. The idea was to pull a Wayne Enterprises and manufacture a lot of high-end technology while also writing off their own gear as internal R&D. Midoriya Industries would be a new frontrunner for the hero tech industry, along with other support company roles. Venom had actually suggested the idea, as Peter had started his own company because Felicia had convinced him that he was wasting his brilliance as photographer, not that she minded. So when Venom mentioned the idea to Izuku, he jumped on board, if only as a way to help the community with philanthropy and help increase his mother's standard of living. However, Mina had kept him up late via watching terrible movies and other things. Izuku blushed at that thought, and almost smacked into a building. Only his quick reflexes save him from becoming a laughingstock. So hence, he was late. His thought process was cut off when his calms lit up, and he saw his caller ID read May. Oh boy. This is going to be bad. He pressed the answer button, but to his surprise it was Hitoshi's voice. You know she's going to blast you with a sound cannon the second you walk in the door for being late, right? Hitoshi's voice was aboard as ever, 
but you could detect a tone of fondness when speaking of his girlfriend of the past four years. I know, I know. I'm almost there. Just stall them. You have the right tools for that. Hitoshi sighed at this, but as the phone line went dead, he began to speak. So if I said Mass Effect 3 had a good ending dash, followed by roars of outrage. The last four years had been good to them. Following the capture of the League of Villains, the mayor of Mustafa Town had personally walked into the crater, shook his hand, and handed both him and his team each honorary licenses. Four actions of bravery in the field. He had said. So he had essentially achieved his dream. He'd become a pro hero. However, he had also experienced some bad times, like when a kid had asked him why he had such a scary smile on his mask. Naturally, the only coherent response Izuku had managed was, What do you mean my smile is scary? Or the fact he'd been consistently nominated the number one hero who looks like a villain for years running. No, he wouldn't be petty or upset. Because that would be bad. As for Mei and Hitoshi, they were still in their bizarre yet strangely adorable relationship. While this usually ended up with Hitoshi testing a lot of wacky devices to neutralize his quirk, he still loved her dearly. Shuto and Momo had turned into a superhero and ultra-elite power couple, though the later was through no fault of their own. Mostly, Momo's parents had found out they were dating and had paraded them at one of their parties as the single most adorable couple ever. Things just spiraled from there. So Momo was both a designer for hero outfits and a hero herself, while Shudo remained at member of the Outsiders out of respect for the man who'd shaped him into the hero he'd eventually become. Momo had actually agreed to be their primary backer for Izuku and May's company, Midoriya Industries. She was always happy to support her friends, and while she would have given them the money outright, Izuku talked her down to a partial loan in conjunction with a bank loan. He and May were more than confident her insane genius would more than pay off. They all still met up once every two weeks at LeBlanc for dinner, despite now being in college or busy with hero work. Tetsu Tetsu was actually considered a member of the Outsiders now, along with his girlfriend Ken Duitsuka. They were recent additions, as they'd officially joined when both had graduated from UA about two years ago. When not on working with the team, they were known as the duo of Iron Fist. They handled street-level crime, mostly. What surprised him the most was how well his mother had handled him being a hero. She didn't agree with some of the things he'd done or the fact he was basically a criminal for a while. But when he explained all the things he'd done and people he'd helped as Venom, she told him how proud she was of him. That, and wailed while squeezing him to near death. She didn't ask how he got a quirk, though she was very happy he'd been able to achieve his dream. Izuku was again brought out of memory lane by his suit's comms, which lit up again, though this time, it read Mrs. Bakugo. Again. His thumb hovered over the button to answer. Things were still awkward, given what had happened between himself and Bakugo, but Mitsuki Bakugo had reached out to him to apologize for not stopping her son's behavior, and her sadness that they drifted apart. So about once a month, Mitsuki would join up with Izuku and Mina at LeBlanc to talk about life, and reminisce of simpler times. He struggled to forgive Bakugo, and he knew Mina was still pissed after he'd been forced to explain why Bakugo's mom was apologizing to him back when she'd first reached out. He was surprised she hadn't melted her entire dorm in anger. Mina was a very fungoing and easy person to love, but Christ was she was terrifying when angry. Man, how you survived giant villains, that weird guy with four octopus tentacles and copycat, and yet your girlfriend of four years still scares you when she's angry? Oh, hey partner. I don't get why this still confuses you. You said Peter was terrified of Felicia when she was angry. You literally said he went to China for a business expo. To hide out when he ate her last tub of Ben and Jerry's American dream. Izuka felt a shudder from his partner. First off, we don't speak of that incident. Ever. Peter spent two hours dodging claws, and then another two chained to his bed after he bought her 20% ownership of Ben and Jerry's as an apology. I don't even have a gender or sexual preference, and I still have nightmares about that. Okay, okay, sorry. Yes, Izuku and Venom had only gotten closer following the final battle. Venom apologized for constantly comparing him to Peter, which Izuku accepted. Venom didn't talk as much as he used to, mostly just making snide remarks about lame-ass villains that look like C-listers from the Justice Friends or demanding specific snacks as payment for being the most awesome superpower-giving alien ever. Izuku shook his head, 
before he answered timidly. Hello? Izuku, how the hell are you? Her sudden loud voice actually did make him graze a lamp post. Hello, Mrs. Bakugo. What can I do for you? Izuku spoke after doing his best to recover from nearly smacking into the post like a cartoon character or something. Bah, I keep telling you to call me Mitsuki. You know I hate formalities. Anyway, I was thinking we could have dinner with your mom this week, since it's been a while since we've all sat down and done dinner together. I think that's a great idea, Mrs. Dash. At her growl through the phone, he pivoted. Mitsuki! But I actually have plans with Mina on our usual night. It's, uh, very important. He heard her whistle through the phone. So you finally got the stones to buy the ring? It wasn't a question, more like one talking about the intrinsic properties of fire being hot, or something similar. Naturally, this caused Izuku to get distracted and smack into a bald hero who was walking with a robot-looking guy. Izuku muttered his apologizes, which the guy just waved off. Hello? Mitsuki's voice brought him out of her dazed state. Yes, I did. It's nothing super fancy, but I wanted to show her that she's my everything, and that I want to spend my life with her. Damn brat. If I was a few years younger, and you kept talking like that, I'd probably take a crack at you myself. His face went nuclear, and he started coughing awkwardly, which caused Mitsuki to roar with laughter. I'm kidding, brat. Don't sweat it. We can just reschedule for next week. Have fun, and don't make me any grand nieces too soon. With the click of the phone, the call was ended. That woman was fifty shades of inappropriate and crass, but she was kind and while she had taken Bakugo's death hard, she didn't hold Izuku responsible for it. She thanked him for freeing her son, which was probably the most shocking thing about that first phone call she'd given him. Even more so when she admitted she knew he was Venom. It was small comfort, but knowing his former friend's family did not resent him helped him to make peace with what he'd had to do to protect the city. He still was haunted by it, of course, or at least his perceived inability to save Bakugo. But that would usually prompt Mina to flick him on the nose for being broody instead of a cinnamon roll. Whatever the hell that meant. He'd stopped trying to interpret some of Mina's, Mina-isms a while ago. He shook his head and patted the engagement ring he'd bought. He'd taken to wearing it on a chain as a necklace for good luck during his solo patrols. Tomorrow was the big night. Tomorrow, Izuka Midoriya would propose to Mina Ashido. X. The next day. So let me get this straight. Yeah. You made Hitoshi brainwash Mei and your lone board. Correct. Just because you were running late. Yep. And you were late because... There was a cat in a tree. Mina Ashido burst into laughter in the crowded restaurant. They weren't eating at LeBlanc for once, and instead were at a place so Gyro himself had suggested, if you could call graphic threats a suggestion. Flashback. You are not proposing in my restaurant. What? Why not? Because, moron, you're going to take her to this place. And you're going to, asterisk collaborative whispering intensifies star. Got it? Flashback over. And so, Izuku had gotten a table at one of the nicer places in Mustafa. He knew Mina wasn't super into high-end places, but he told her it was important that honor Sojiro's recommendations so he wouldn't break Izuku's legs. And since Mina happened to find the whole situation hilarious, she naturally agreed. The restaurant itself was reasonably lit, but just dim enough to appear mysterious and ostentatious. Mina was looking stunning. She'd worn a sleek black dress, which Venom had suggested, after forming a mouth while Izuka slept, and her hair was now down to her shoulders, tied to one side in a ponytail that was draped listlessly over her left shoulder. She wore some dark blue lipstick, and she had some golden earring in. All in all, she made Izuka stutter more than he had when they first met. When she had noticed this, she'd given him a teasing grin and remarked, Careful, tiger. Keep staring and I may get some funny ideas. Anyways, our favorite couple were here, at a restaurant, enjoying dinner. They just finished their entrees and paid the bill. Now, Izuku had taken them to a very familiar place. A rooftop overlooking the city lights. He'd had to partially use his power to get them there, and while she teased him about using it as an excuse to press her against him, they were now cuddled up on a picnic blanket he'd placed ahead of time, and watched the stars. So do you recognize this place, Mina? She pretended to think a moment. 
Well, this is either where you beat the crap out of some scumbag mugger. Izuka's head fell a bit, which made her laugh and kiss his cheek. Or it's where we first kissed after you saved my life. His eyes shot up to meet hers, though they briefly paused on the warm and caring smile on her face. That's right, Mina. This was where you became my queen. It's funny how things turned out. You ended up with a stuttering awkward guy who doesn't talk much. Why me? He asked curiously. She laughed a bit and flicked his nose. I think the question you should be asking is why wouldn't it be you? At his confused expression, she continued. Izuku, you saved my life. If that isn't some cheesy Hollywood moment to kiss the girl, then I don't know what is. Even if you take that out of consideration, your kind and your sense of justice motivates me every day. You say I'm your inspiration these days, but I could say the same thing about you. Even if you are a CEO snob now. Izuku face bombed at her sweet speech that turned teasing. Of course she'd rib him about successfully getting his business loan approved. But I gotta ask Izuku, why do you bring me up here? I know you're kind of sappy but your gestures are usual small and everyday ways of showing you love me. Why this? At this, Izuku pulled away a bit and reached into his pocket before he shifted onto one knee and took her hand. Mina Ishido, I could go on another speech about how you complete me and how you're my partner in pretty much everything. But I think I'll skip right to the question, will you marry me? Her expression was stunned before her cheeks turned lilac, before delicately taking the ring and putting on her finger. She brought a hand to her mouth before she launched at him, tackling him to the ground squealing, yes 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 yes, yes over and over again into his chest. Izuka POV. Asterisk record scratch asterisk. So let's do this to recap from the beginning. I'm Izuka Midoriya. You know me as Venom, but I wasn't always. I was a bit of a scrawny brat until I met my alien bestie. After that, became a hero, saved the girl, fell in love the girl, formed an awesome hero team, became recognized as a hero, and started an awesome company that female Frankenstein uses to push her crazy but awesome inventions onto heroes. You've heard my story, but who knows? There could be more to tell later. But for now, I'll see you around. And, And that's a wrap, symbiote enthusiasts. Huge thanks for riding along with us on this mind-blowing, what-if, adventure. If you haven't already, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and join our growing league of heroes. Before you go swinging away, drop a comment down below with your thoughts on Deku with Venom. I'm dying to hear your wild theories. And of course, special thanks to Raisin1125 for being the real MVP. Until next time, stay symbiotic, stay heroic, and remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Catch you in the next one, my awesome symbiote squad. Appreciate the continuous support, and as always, stay epic.